Let's smash the competition. All right. Where's chat at? There you are. A lot of good theories in there, definitely. But, um... I would say that, uh... Destroying my enemies and making it so that I'm the only analyst and then proceeding to uh, stop uploading analysis videos. That's my end goal is uh, the complete and utter destruction of the analysis genre on YouTube. It's a bit shocking that there's so little substantive analysis of this 10 year old game. Yeah. Yeah, it is kind of shocking. Not only that, but that everybody seems to be making the assumption that everybody else was the one who did it already. Alright, I'm going to share this comment with you. Big Stevo says, uh, Okay, Groomer, I'm not sticking around to be part of the intended audience. You're cultivating with that thing. See ya. Uh, I, I guess that means he'll show up for a future stream or something. But, uh... No, I've got bad news for you. We're still kicking. <laughs> It was a very weird kind of, um, like, comments and sentiments. Like, there's some people out there who are really hyper-sensitive to, like, the VTuber thing. Because, like, I think the assumption is that, like, oh, no, I'm going to drop everything tomorrow and, like, start putting on a girl voice and, like, pretending to be a girl VTuber, a girl gamer, basically. And it's like, well, no... I'm still doing my thing. This is like the cheapest joke I've ever done. That I actually ever paid money for, at least. I guess there's some stuff that I did for free. Explain myself. How can David Thier's clone daughter be Dragonborn? I was told anybody can. I was just um, using old names for my characters, so uh, my stealth character was named Maglir, but he looks like Fargoth, and then my uh, my warrior character was Shorin Hardheart, and he's a Nord. I feel small, like I'm smaller than normal. Eh. What happened to the house dress Hawaiian shirt? Uh, this is this is a dress. If that if that counts, I can't really. I don't know if I can show off like if we can go below the waist or not. I don't think we. I don't think I can. Not with this. Yeah, it's like 6 in the evening, so I'm not drinking yet. No, I'm not an Anglo. Don't worry about it. What is the lore? Well, the lore is that names really don't matter in Elder Scrolls. Especially in Skyrim. Is there a way I can show you a picture? I mean, this is like the closest we can get to you seeing the full outfit. So, I'm a big fan. Thoughts on the shit show regarding the GTA Trilogy Definitive Edition? I mean, it's basically what my thoughts on all remasters are. 
you know, I don't think there's any developers who actually want to go back and update all their old, old hard work to be more modern and definitive. It being called a definitive edition is definitely like a, like icing on the cake. Who did the VTube model? Me in like an hour. It, it's uh, here's I think that's the issue with the VTuber stuff is that um, it's just like really, really, really easy to get into. And so you're seeing like a retro wave thing of like because it's so accessible to get into it, it sort of dilutes all its value. And so it's just sort of like everybody can be a generic anime girl now. Where was the notification? I added everybody. That's the best I can do. I can't control if YouTube actually uh, sends notifications out to you. Why'd you decide to continue with this particular video you and chat did not like? I said that day that I was going to finish it at a later point. And that was my intention, was to finish it. Um, the Never Knows Best video is not what caused the day off. It was like, it was more like the, uh, the final kind of jab. Will I be adding mommy milkers to the avatar? I actually reduced the chest size. I, I, I went through with it. I got a mastectomy. Um... They're still above average, but they should be, there should be a lot less, um, noticeable vibration. <laughs> nope, nope, it still happens. I know, I know it's, it's a controversial procedure, um, but... You know, my this little anime girl was having uh, was having back issues, and um, you know they, she was carrying around a lot of extra weight that she really wasn't using. I couldn't physically get through the Harry Partridge video. Um, well, that's sort of the thing is uh, that stream got a copyright claim from his company, and. I was just going to cut it because the best way to, to dispute copyright claims is not at all. Um, but YouTube won't allow me to actually trim or mute that audio from the, from the VOD. So if I want to get rid of it, I have to download the VOD, cut the part out, and then put it back up. Which is something that YouTube apparently just can't do in this circumstance. Back issues are a result of bad posture, not breast weight. Well, I, all I'll say is I have a lot of family members who have enormous breasts and all of those family members complain of back issues. So, um, I, st I need to update this because it's like. We already watched DJ Peach Cobbler of RT Arlo. Um, and there might be like some, might might be some dates changing. But the the this is the big thing is yes, your fucking your, your the Skyrim video, whatever you're bringing up, probably on the schedule. I don't know about the smaller guys though. And what's a smaller guy? Well, at this point, it seems to be like fifty thousand views as a smaller guy.
Is you playing dress up and changing your avatar's outfit going to be a recurring thing now? Probably not me changing the outfits as much as me just changing the avatars because um, I can do that. The issue is the software I'm using because I'm not like I'm not going to go to the effort of making new kind of clothing options. And so it's like it's got to be something that's baked into the software, otherwise. Uh, I'm not going to go to the effort of actually making it. But we have multiple anime girls now. <laughs> I feel like I'm watching the transition from ironic VTubing into unironic. Well... It definitely started ironic, and I'm kind of into it in in the sense of, like, I don't know. What makes an unironic VTuber? I, I would think that, like, being full into, like, oh, no, I'm not a human being. I'm actually a real-life anime girl, and I'm just... Th this isn't software. This is me. Uh, This is a camera into my home, and I look like it. No, 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 no. I'm never going to pretend to be a little anime girl. Um... Do I have a Todd VTuber? No. And okay, so the issue is the male VTuber models look terrible. I've been told, oh no, there are good looking male VTuber models. They're just like, you know, wolf boys. And I'm like, do I look like I would want to be a wolf boy? Okay, me being an anime girl is sending mixed signals, but I think it's absurd enough that people understand that like I'm still a man, right? If I start playing, like, a cute little twink wolf boy, then that's definitely going to be sending mixed signals. That's the real pipeline hour. So, like, to me, if I'm going to play an anime man, it's going to be a goddamn anime man. Like, uh... This one. Oh, this is this is uh this is un undistinguishably masculine. A bald man. A bald imperial man. This isn't me, this is the uh this is the Morrowind character. I, again, I have to work in the confines of, like, free software. If there's anything that involves effort, I'm probably not going to do it. Alright, so we're almost to 15 after. Uh, most everybody should be getting in here by now. Where's the Dwimmer Science Nerd Waifu? Give me one second, I'll get her out. She takes a little bit, she's she's a little bit more effort to run, but uh, I think it's worth it. So this was the other model that I came up with. I'm a ghost girl. <laughs> I'm a Dwimmer waifu. So the thing is... They don't really have, um, they don't really have, like, a lot of good reference material for making dwarves. So it's like, there's this weird conception that goes around that, oh yeah, no, the hair sucks. That's This is why I don't do the long hair. It, it's not because of I have a thing for it, it just looks terrible. So there's not, like, a consensus as to, like, what the actual phenotypical aspects of the dwarves are. Because 
we the one we saw had like a horrifying debilitating condition and then like the other ones that we've seen were all ghosts so it's hard to tell like what was their skin color what was their eye color so it's like there's a lot of people who think that like the dwarves had like blue skin or some shit which was always weird to me they always struck me as like an off gold color because like their armor's gold Everything about them's gold. Then they became a gold-skinned god. So. Do I have the Total Biscuit WTF Skyrim video on the list? If, Yeah, that's more... Um, that series was like first impressions kind of... Um, like PC... Uh, like settings testing, wasn't it? Like it wasn't really... They weren't really like game reviews in the sense... Why bother with the squishy Dunmer when you need a strong Nord woman? Well, I'm getting through all the... So I'm getting through, like, all the elves right now. And then, um... Once I'm done with that, then we can start the harem of human women. I don't know if I'm going to do the beast folk. If only because that takes more effort. Like, the Khajiit might just be, like, an anime girl with cat ears. Because I think that's actually, um... I think that's actually, like, one of the Khajiit phenotypes. is just a person with cat ears. Because, you know, there's somebody at Bethesda who's a big furry. What happened with getting your actual moral and character model imported into the software? Okay, so. That's kind of mixing two stories up. I was wanting to get an original model made that was based on that character. That wasn't necessarily just a game rip. Well, someone was working on a game rip of it, and they sent me the model, but they couldn't ever figure out how to get it textured. Now, I don't know if I could put that thing in the software. I'd have to find some way to... Because it has, like, a special format that it wants the models to be in. But it's like, we have the model, although it's the wrong head. But, because they used the Breton head that I used in-game and not the Imperial head that I used that's actually... Uh, what the character is. So, who knows. And before you start streaming yourself reading that one Skyrim fan comic where Shea Gorath basically invents a Rule 63 curse. Someone was saying that you can Rule 63 people, like, in, in Skyrim. You can just turn people, you can switch their genders. I don't think Septimus Cygnus is uh, really worth importing. So yeah, it's like a whole thing to really kind of get it working. It has its issues, to be sure. Much, much, much easier, much simpler. I understand. Maybe not as quote-unquote funny as having a Morrowind character model on stream, but uh, also a lot less effort. Because at the end of the day, the anime girls are are superfluous sort of uh, additions. Alright. We're going to go back to being the work girl. Well, that's sort of the benefit is, like, I have a very limited expression set that I can show, but I can still show it. And I think that's, uh, that's a bonus. So, let's see what's going on. Before we jump into watching the video, I'm thinking the best place to start is with an article. Because I'm thinking that the Never Knows Best fans were a little saltier than the Salt fans, surprisingly. Oh, we watched it. Hold that. Okay. No, we have to read. No. Plus, I have like a 30,000 word limit. 
I don't want to run into it. All right, what's this article? I just have the title in my spreadsheet, Development Hurdle. All right, so reading browser on, YouTube off, make sure it points at the right browser. Oh, the notes are like somewhere else. You see how long this is? I did a word count um, after the last stream and um, After the last stream, we were at like 5,000 words in the note document. Just the notes. Uh, Skyrim dev hurdle in gadget. What's going on with this fitness exercise equipment? I'm I'm uh, confused with the advertisement that's in the archive. Oh yeah, let's make sure. This is Todd Howard on Skyrim's biggest development hurdle, fan-made mods, and what happens next? Wow, they walked off the stage. Oh no, it was with top owners. At the GDC Awards in 2012. So like, hang on. Like, is it, they were called Game of the Year in as little as a couple months. I mean, I do remember it being a thing, but does anybody find it weird that, um, like, people were calling Skyrim the, uh, people were going for the Skyrim Game of the Year thing, um, like, before Skyrim even came out and was, like, there was no way people had come to, like, full opinions of Skyrim that quickly. One of those things, I guess. Yeah, so, like, this orc girl was, like, the first foray into um, messing with the expressions. So, it's, like, uh, the Dunmer girl is, like, a more kind of chipper expression. And then this is, like, much more kind of orcish pissed off. Topics of discussion merged into one frame of thought. What happens next? Elder Scrolls sit now. Didn't happen. Although maybe if they were being told from the start, it would have happened sooner. Everyone wants to know when the first piece of downloadable content will launch. Do we? Who runs the banks in Tamriel? Who mints all this money in Tamriel? They went to the effort of showing us where, like, a newspaper exists in Cyrodiil, but they didn't actually show us where all the fucking money gets made. <clears throat> Is it just whoever wants to do it that day? Seems like blacksmiths would, like, be massively inflating the economy. Howard being used... To be oh Howard being used to sidestepping media inquires inquiry oh my god Howard being used to sidestepping media inquiries they spelled inquiries wrong I think I think that there should be an I after the R because otherwise it's just media inquires oh wait yeah it's, it's this this line about unannounced items as he is working with a talented team quickly shot those questions down.
It's the pure gold standard. So long as there's no debasement of currency, they can't create inflation by standard definition. Okay, but Skyrim's only gold mine was lost to the Forsworn, and the Empire didn't really seem that interested in getting... Not only did the Empire seem uninterested in getting it back, the Stormcloaks weren't particularly interested in trying to get it either. Won't the Transmute Ore spell be, like, the worst for the economy? So the Transmute Ore spell definitely feels like a rogue development idea. Because nobody addresses it. You can't buy it from the College of Winterhold. You just find some bandit who has somehow found a spellbook for Transmute Ore. And, like, nobody ever questions it. So I have to assume that that's, like, just, um... That's like one of those weird partial canon things. Because, yeah, otherwise the obvious would happen and uh, Skyrim's economy would be flooded with money. Our focus was different. With a game as large as Skyrim, we wondered what complications arose during development. What is the hardest part about crafting a world meant to live on its own away from the player's eyes? Percentage sign gallery-139026 percentage sign. For us... Uh <laughs> Something happened here. Wouldn't Transmute be in line with the Telvanni? Probably, but I mean, I don't think the Telvanni would care that much about gold as much as they would care about like mag items of magical import. But one thing I've noticed about it is, so all the money is called Septums because it has the Septum lineage on it, right? So they don't, they're not called Meads. Does that imply that the Meads have not been, like, minting new coins? Like, so we're... Everybody in Skyrim is using, like, centuries-old coins? For us, it's probably the amount of processing power we keep to rendering on the screen. So we have a game that can put all this stuff on a screen, but we have a ton of processing we're doing that isn't on the screen. Oh, the world before multi-threading. The coins have the current era on them. Wait, why would they have septums on them then? That makes no sense. You can't tell. But I tried to do like um, lower fangs, like how orcs have, but I could not for the life of me get them to like actually be, um, be like tusks or anything like that. Well, it was lame. You can have the stupid vampire lip thing, which I always think looks dumb as hell. Uh, the, f the flesh fang. My current Nords, it is the current era. Exactly. It is fourth era, 201, and there are still people out there who believe in Talos as a divine entity. Most games, all your processing you see on the screen, but we're calculating a thousand NPCs. Not impressed. I feel like the eye tracking on this model is way better. Do you want to travel from one city to another? Is there a dragon coming? Technically, we want to be pushing the game and have it look new and look exciting while also processing all the stuff you can't see in case something happens. So I had a thought with the dragon thing, right? So, after watching Nez Smith's kind of thing on Radiant Story, the, the, the main takeaway I had was that um, they can do things that's responsive to actions that the player has committed, right? But the bulk of random dragon encounters that you have in Skyrim are dictated by the player fast traveling. Which is weird to me, because um, if you're not running a lot of Nordic burial dungeons then you're getting a lot of dragon shouts that you don't really have a use for. So it seems to me like the thing to do would be to make it so that the dragons will only show up randomly anyways. You can still have the, um, the encounters where they get resurrected and you can still have the dragon peaks. But the only time that the player gets attacked by a dragon in the world randomly would be radiantly based on if the player had done a, like a word wall and actually needed a, um, a dragon soul to buy a shout.
According to Howard, the balancing act between processing situations around players as well as off, far off in the distance is the biggest technical hurdle the team at Bethesda faces. It's easy to make a video of new Skyrim content. Wait, are you inserting the new Skyrim thing into it? So what he said was, it's easy to make a video of content, but taking those ideas and forming them to completion so they fit into a game is a different story. Dice 2012, which we'll watch at some point, Howard revealed an internal video featuring content that those employees created for Skyrim as part of a game jam, blah, blah, blah. Uh, okay, never mind. It's easy to make a video of that content, but taking those ideas and forming them to completion so they fit into a game is a different story. Yeah, you're telling me. They did this game jam where they, like, the Bethesda devs could, like, do whatever they wanted. Um, now, why am I bringing this up? Eh, just no reason. No reason at all. Not some version of Skyrim you shouldn't buy. But, um, like, the main reason they didn't want to put the, like, the game jam mod content that Bethesda had created out was that it lacked cohesion with the world of Skyrim. Now, that's oddly relevant these days. There was very little of it that was meh, he said, but that video only showed about 60% of it. The rest we didn't have video for. I was impressed by the amount of stuff everybody created and how great it was as a totality for that week. It blew me away. The pride seems to be focused on his team. As for creation kit content, Howard hasn't personally used any of the mods, but notes some of the team have added fan-made content and or enhancements to their games. Huh. Weird. Yeah, if you missed the context, there's um three anime girls and one anime boy we can be now. At any time. I think okay, what I'll do is like like the image thing, we can we can uh switch them up every time someone donates. How about that? That way it's just a constant constant never ending roulette of uh anime waifus. He didn't want to call it any mod specifically for fear of leaving people out, I'm sure. But Howard didn't, did say that the community is very, very good about picking their favorite mods, and they're usually right. Now that Bethesda has two established franchises in its pocket with Fallout and Elder Scrolls, the question becomes whether or not the Maryland-based development house alternates between the two franchises or does something new. People think we plan further ahead than we actually do. The games are a big undertaking, and we kind of take it as it comes. Right now, we're focusing on supporting Skyrim and DLC. Skyrim still excites us, and there are so many people playing it, we want to support them. There is no time frame on when additional content will come to Skyrim, we are told. And they have no comment section. Lame. Lame. That was kind of lame. But... That's one more article of the uh, list. I always see that as a good thing. All right. So the main show. We're all here for this. Let me scroll up a bit. I gotta find this part of the notes. So, uh, DJ private sessions. Never knows best. We stopped at 3938. 
Now there's two ways that we can um There's two ways that we can proceed with this. Either we started the game loop session over so that we understand kind of the full context or we continue from where we left off. The game loop thing is, I think, here, so 26 minutes. We should have tried to get Todd to answer his question on Lover Labs mod during the AMA. Well, the only reason we got answered in the AMA was because we asked a, a genuine question. Which got featured on, like, gaming news channels since it was about, like, cyberpunk, so they could put cyberpunk in the title. So that was neat. What the hell was that? What the hell? Do I have an upper bound? Never hit that before. Oh, I need to... Now it doesn't show up anymore. Okay. All right, so I'm not a goblin, goddammit. I am a proud orc woman. I was raised in the mine. Okay, well, I'm a modern orc woman, so I didn't wasn't really raised in the mines, but um, we're still into like the Malakath thing, you know. We, we celebrated in the holidays. You're forever enshrined in UESP, Pat. Am I? Where am I on the UESP? One of their people thanked, like, thanked me for their stuff. And, but that was the extent of what I know. No one really answered my question either. So, I'm just going to assume... We're just going to start over with the... With the gameplay loop stuff. Let me see. What was the... What was everything leading up to this? Opening combat mysticism. Mechanical absences would be excused if the combat was good. Kill cams. Level scaled items were removed. Asterisks. What the fuck was I talking about? Character creation. Boring is worse than quote-unquote bad in reference to efficient leveling because he thinks that efficient leveling is a bad thing I, I always think that's weird i'm not sure why people dislike efficient le okay i guess i do get it because in theory you should only either be getting like three plus threes or two plus fives so it's like to get the full plus 15 you have to do some extra grinding and leveling and shit so I can see why that's annoying, but there's a lot of people who like overstate that how like that you need to efficient level in Morrowind, which you don't. Like by level 20, no matter what you do, you're probably going to be pretty strong in Morrowind. Um, you do need to efficient level in Oblivion, at least when it comes to your endurance and your um, like weapon damage attribute. But even then. It's more necessary, but like as as plebs like to point out, like, oh yeah, well I was able to beat Oblivion when I was twelve without thinking about any of the stuff that you brought up, so clearly you're just a fucking ingrate. Yeah, the those those types of comments. And it's like, yeah, you can anybody can beat fucking Oblivion. My whole point was that it was like it was hell for... Oblivion is hell for a certain type of player who has just as legitimate a claim to Oblivion as anybody else. So, what else? Balance. Six minutes of lockpicking. Oh yeah, he spent six minutes talking about... Uh, break like breaking down why the lock picking like the why the lock picking perk tree is so bad, and he said that like every perk is basically worthless, which is 
Mostly true, but I would disagree with points. The full mage needs some efficient leveling for more magicka, but not much. But that's the thing, is you can eventually just max out your intelligence and have your max potential magicka anyways. It's not like uh, it's not like health, where if you don't get endurance as fast as possible, you have less health. And even then, that's not really that big a deal in Morrowind. Yeah, but why complain for 30 minutes on the behalf of a niche player base? It wasn't 30 minutes of min-maxing, though. Like, I talked about the four different ways that people kind of level up in Oblivion. And I talked about the inherent issues that... Like, I would say the min-maxing was probably like 10 minutes of that. Uh, 2030 is the infamous, I can do a better perk system in my sleep, but I can't propose one in this 90-minute video. Um, 2258 just says racism. I gotta get context. Beliefs. There are other conflicts to this region as well, though. Markef has the Forsworn Rebellions, Riften has crime and corruption, Windhelm has immigration and racism, Winterhold the city- Yeah, it counts. And then, what was the other stuff? Um... Okay, so the, my last note is like part two, and then I have a note at 2713, which is not very far into this section, that's just, what the fuck. I was playing Oblivion as a sperm. I can't believe you had to, like, wait until you were in the womb to play Oblivion, you fucking pleb. Alright. Well, I guess we just gotta... Gotta rip the band-aid off. Really just gotta start. Um... This is the bar for all other RPGs, and that's why... The final verdict for The Elder Scrolls Skyrim is a full, highest rating that I can issue, 10 out of 10, and it easily earns the badass seal of approval. I cannot wait to see all the DLC and expansions coming. Now, if you'll excuse me, I gotta play through. All right. I think that, that really kind of... Why does that guy look like he just jumped out of a time machine from 2002? Um, because he, I, I don't know. That's a lot of like psychology. Feels like Never Knows Best should have made a separate video for the G word instead of appending it to the beginning of a Skyrim video. Well, okay, so he does this big thing about breaking down the concept of using game loops, and then he uses that to kind of explain what Skyrim's game loop is. But he does it ironically. We all know how irony goes. But it's like, yeah, it probably should have been like its own kind of thing. Like, I don't like game loops. It's a personal hangup of mine. Okay, that's fine. I disagree, but... I've Okay, but here's the thing. I have been told about all of these videos that they all eventually pick up and start being better. Not good, but better. But we've only had like, we've only had a couple good Skyrim videos and the best one is G-Man. I want you to think about that. I was told on good authority that G-Man made a bad Skyrim video. That's how low the hurdle is right now. I'm hyped for Saturday. Oh yeah, um... Saturday we are watching... Oh, no, I can't check it. Uh, Saturday we are watching Mr. Caption's video on Skyrim. 
It's uh, actually uploaded on my second channel. If you want to watch it ahead of time. I'm making that the exception kind of of like telling people to watch stuff ahead of time because um, that's the one that's like a re-upload. So. There is no charm in being bad. Just FYI. Oh god, I forgot. It starts with the video essay piano. Is it ironic then? Like, was the big hint that it was supposed to be ironic that it started with, like, the video essay piano? Over the last five or ten years, I've noticed a particular term rise to ascendancy amongst video game critics that's used to describe what you do in games. That term is gameplay loop, and I don't like this term. Maybe this is because in my formative game playing years, I cared little for loops, and nor did anyone else, and so I never understood why years later we all needed to start seeing games through loop-shaped lenses to better understand what you do in them, when you can already understand what you do in them by just doing it. I don't understand why do we have like we don't we, why we have a a rule of thirds in cinematography. When I grew up watching films, there was no rule of thirds, so I don't understand what all these fucking college people are doing, dividing films into thirds. Okay, you know what you're doing with the B roll? It's called composition, where you're putting stuff in the frames, where like the river's the bottom third, the land in the immediate front is the middle third, and then the sky's the top third. You probably didn't even think about the fact that ju that there's a fucking academic term for that shit. Sorry, got full tilted there. <laughs> Wait, are we rewatching the first part? Uh, we're, we're picking up off of the gameplay loop part. Uh, so fart face shitlord says, "Oh fuck off with this VTuber shit! You just infected the chat with a bunch of horny ass weebs. That's why I do it to bother you." Isn't his argument that he was enjoying the games more when he wasn't viewing them through loop lenses? Yeah, I think sort of the it's like I enjoyed games more when I didn't think about them. Or maybe it's because terms like gameplay loop remind me of my time in university, where I spent several years being taught to wield certain academically approved terms to describe normal things in abnormal ways in order to gain greater grades. This is what happened. This is why I don't respect like English universities, because pretty much everybody I talked to who went to college in the UK is like this where it's like they're really kind of like they're into deconstructionism but they don't understand that they're into deconstructionism so they think that like they think that they are like tearing back the uh tearing back like the mold of sort of analysis when in reality they are just participating in a different philosophy of analysis which is deconstructionism and it's not very well respected because it's like uh it's like going back to an anarchy society kind of deal and an overinflated sense of self-importance that stemmed not from anything of actual substance but instead like working at the amazon fulfillment warehouse yes yes we get it colleges are for making jobs not for any kind of intellectual pursuit just from the fact that we used words other people don't. Or maybe it's because it taps into my insecurities as a game critic. Why do you give a shit? You have a like, okay, in this picture, he has 108,000 subscribers, which is already more than what I have. 
And what I have is already more than what a lot of people have. And it's like, what I have is a shit ton and he's got more than me by a bit. So why do you give a fuck? You're, you, you're set. You're set. You're golden. You've made it. Congratulations. Oh yeah, we do have to speed it up because that that's definitely gonna be part of the issue. Is we're gonna be doing this for a long time if we don't speed it up. Guys, I'm just like you. I have anxiety too. After all, I don't use terms like gameplay loop or game feel or systemic design, and I've never even used the term ludo narrative dissonance to complain about a game. Not even once. Good for you. Mm, I'm trying to remember if I've ever used the term Ludo narrative dissonance. Well, yeah, it's like, so I have like 63,000 or something. I have a big following. I know that like in the context of like million subscriber YouTube channels, if that's what you're used to, that's nothing. Yeah, it's sure. But it's still a pretty big community. Maybe that means I'm not a real game critic. What is a real game critic? I don't know, but... You're really cutting to the core of things here with this. I've never shit in a bucket, not even once. Well, you should try it sometime. You're not a real gamer until you've pooped in a sock. Didn't Ludo Narrative whatever show up in Bioshock review? Eh, probably for after the Andrew Ryan stuff with the way that the levels are designed. Yeah, okay. Like I said, I don't recall doing it, but I probably did because it seems like something I would do. But I'm not sure I meet whatever the criteria is, and maybe that's a... You just do it on YouTube. Congratulations. You've made it in the community. <laughs> it's not that complicated. Most of those terms are, th are just there. Do academics can cut down on word count? Yeah, that's kind of why terms are coined because having to spend a paragraph explaining the concept of ludonarrative dissonance uh, wastes a lot of time compared to there being just like a generally agree agreed upon term to refer to that general concept. A real game critic gives things badass seals of approval. You know what? You're right. Oh no, I never got the poop sock thing. Because, well, I guess I, I've never tried to do it, but I would imagine that it would take a decent amount of effort to pull off. The problem. So, thanks, Gameplay Loop. Still, I would argue the reason I dislike Gameplay Loop so much is because it's reductive. It asks us to view game- Whoa, 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 I thought we were using college terms that were just designed to make people sound smarter than they are for grades. Get back to the Amazon Fulfillment Warehouse, Wagey. Formalism as to formalize language in scientific context removes the uncertainty of natural language. Well, yeah, it all serves a purpose. You need terms that refer to specific concepts. Like I said. Deconstructionism is reductive. Well, yeah, it's like... You've reduced what the value of the term gameplay loops is... By saying that, like... you, It shouldn't be used, it shouldn't be, like, designed around. We shouldn't think about it. That, that seems kind of... I guess reductive.
systems in a way that I don't think they should be viewed as products of their most frequently reoccurring parts, as if playing a game is all about mechanical repetition instead of, say, the feelings a game evokes. The feelings that Skyrim evokes, like annoyance and frustration and disappointment and maybe occasionally Ball busting. No, heroism. I don't know. Don't forget boredom. Oh, yeah. Boredom. That's a feeling. Right. Fuck him for working at Amazon. Well, that's the thing. He has a big YouTube channel. He doesn't have to work at Amazon. My point isn't um, to shit on people who work on Amazon fulfillment centers. My point is to shit on the industrialist mindset that education is just for prepping people to work at the Amazon fulfillment center. That's my point. There's a certain philosophy in education that um, it exists purely to prep people to be drones working in the factory, if you will. It would be the typical expression. Now we just have the Amazon Fulfillment Center. I don't have to shit on Amazon workers. They piss in bottles to survive. They allow themselves to be manipulated. Apparently Amazon uses, like, racial tension to stop their workers from unionizing. I heard that. Worst part is... If I did tell anyone I hate their fucking circle jerk, I would probably be dismissed as not intelligent enough because of the way I phrase myself or the dog whistles in my language. Well, yeah, it's, uh, I'm hip and down with you, yo, but until it isn't. Are you deliberately missing the point? Like, is this a bit? Okay, Will Game Dev, what's the point? I'll tell you what his point is, okay? This is the second time we've watched this. Like, you, you can't catch me up like this, okay? His point is that gameplay loops are reductive. They're a way of thinking that isn't really conducive to the natural way that video games are. He dislikes the term gameplay loops because he doesn't want games to be designed around the idea of a central loop being used. And then he clarifies that said somebody at bethesda seems to really like the concept of a gameplay loop and then he goes on like a 10 minute deconstruction of a very very cynical black pill deconstruction of skyrim's central gameplay loop so uh yeah congratulations you just tried to call me out for something that we already watched <laughs> Like, wait until we're, like, uh, like, 40 or 50 minutes into the video, and then you can try to pull the let him finish bit. Gameplay loop asks us to view games as games, but maybe games are. And we talked. Okay, so we talked about this last time. The um. The fact that like the gameplay loop, yes, it is a pair of glasses that you can wear to look at things. But the thing about glasses that is that you can take them off and you can change the prescription, and so, it's not as much, like a pair of contacts that are just glued to your eyes as much as it is just an alternate lens that you can switch out when looking at things. They're best when we do the opposite, when we stop seeing them as games and instead see them as challenges to overcome, or stories to uncover, or what- Or games? Like, come on. I think he okay so I think a lot of this comes down to like a level of insecurity because there was sort of the um for a long time there was sort of a feeling that like video games are like children's toys right and so if you're an adult who's into children's toys then you feel some insecurity about it now who gives a shit well some people do 
And so, like, he's sort of trying to rationalize it. Like, no, it's not a game. It's a story. No, it's not a game. It's it's uh it's a feeling. It's a system. Like every kind of way to rationalize it, not just being you know a game, but it's like part of the main appeal of video games to me is the central mechanics. So it feels like you're just kind of stepping on my balls here by going, oh well. Nobody plays games for those pesky mechanics. It's all about the stories. It's all about the feelings. Gameplay Loop asks us to view games as games, but maybe games are at their best when we do the opposite. When we stop... Games are at their best when we, do when we don't look at them as games, but when we look at them as the opposite of a game. So, basically, what you're saying is there's a lens that you would like to view video games through. Seeing them as games and instead see them as challenges to overcome. Oh, they're not games. They're challenges. We're not gamers. We're players. If we see these words as lenses, gameplay loop are the most worn out lens ever. Sure. Yeah, you can say that, but something being popular or well used is not a basis for it being bad. Skyrim isn't bad because it's popular. The basis of Skyrim being bad has a lot to do with its gameplay and its story. Well, no, he, he likes games of stories, but that's sort of my point. His whole point is his subjective opinion about gameplay loops and that every single game has to be a feely fun time with gut-wrenching emotional arcs. Well, here's the thing. I don't give a shit about your subjective opinions about stuff, and I don't think that su su having a subjective opinion is not a shield that you can just hide behind. We're not gamers. We're just socially challenged. I added the social part, but I think it's... um. Is he on two times speed? I think he's on one five. No, one two five. Why is Skyrim the only game to have to have this focus on the story in so heavy handed? Um. I'm not sure what you ask. You need to, need to translate that to English. Yeah, we could probably we could probably still understand him pretty easily at like 175. I think designing games around gameplay loops makes them repetitive and ruins pacing. So absolutely, if you only view things through the lens of gameplay loops, then what you're going to make is Candy Crush. So, yes. But that's the, again, that's the sort of metaphor of like a microscope lens is um, you look at things through the gameplay loop and then you take that lens out and you replace it with a different lens that allows you to focus on the other elements. Like it's just a way of looking at things. It's not like... It's not some dogmatic philosophy. The believers of the gameplay loop are not going to come to your house and beat the shit out of you for, like, wanting to tell a story in your video game. They might just complain if the story is just you being exposited to. Or stories to uncover, or worlds to lose ourselves within. And through defining a loop, we turn our backs on everything outside the loop that supports the loop, as if these loops are neatly defined and easily extracted, instead of being intimately related to all the non-loop parts of the game. What I'm saying is, I don't think gameplay loop is a good term. I, don't I think, um, what, what I'm saying is you should go to the hospital if somebody glued the glasses to the side of your head. I'm not, you're not disagreeing with his argument in premise? Well, I mean... No, his issue is the way he's presented it is that 
this is the only way that people view things and that there is no acceptable sort of situation where you can look at things from a gameplay loop perspective. Because it's reductive, so it's bad. Kind of mentality. Do you like that Skyrim does remove the force filling the pro prophecy and allows you to roleplay if you don't go to the Jarl? Sure. Congratulations on doing the basics. But, um, the game does, like, does it, like, you're saying that, like, the game doesn't didn't shove you over the edge. It just pushed you towards the railing. And your momentum carried you over the edge. Like, I don't buy this. Oh, yeah, no, I just went off and, like, I just went off in a random direction after the Skyrim introduction. You're, you're in the middle of nowhere. The only civilization you can go to is Riverwood. And then um, there's, like, multiple ways that... Skyrim's main quest tries to drag you into it. Even just like going to Riverwood, you get reminded, oh yeah, I should probably be warning the Jarl about the dragons. And then like, you go up to Dragon's Reach, you just want to use the Enchanter, Aerolith comes up to you, what are you doing here? And your character's like, I'm here to report that the dragon burned down Helgen. And Aerolith should at that point be like, dude, that was like six months ago. So then like, you finally, like, and then... You want to do like the Ebony Blade quest. So you like you hear a rumor that Yarrow Balgrith has some problematic children. So you go up to Whiterun or to Dragon's Reach to deal with his problematic children. You go to talk to Yarrow and of Whiterun and he's like, Who is this? Ah, I see. You're one of the prisoners from Helgen. Can you tell me about what happened at Helgen? And it's like, dude, I just wanted to ask you like why one of your sons is kind of like dark and demented. Like I just really want this giant Daikatana. Can I have it? And he's like, Well, I'm gonna need you to go to talk to my court wizard Faringar to get the dragon stone. And then you're like, Yes, honey. <laughs> so you're not forced to do the main quest. I don't like its connotations, and that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with people who use it. Well, I didn't think you were saying there was anything wrong with people. And if you were, I was going to have issues. But just, just you having a subjective preference of I don't like the term, I mean, as fine as that is, if the basis for your subjective premise, premise is faulty, which yours is, it sounds like academic highfalutins. And I don't like academic highfalutins. I prefer my games to be simple, god damn it. I like to look at games from the perspective of what they make me feel, then yeah, of course. It's weird that the Yarrow would let a stranger see to his troubled child. Well, the, the Ebony Blade quest makes sense to me. There's a lot of quests in Skyrim that make sense to do at like certain points in a playthrough. So it's like the Ebony Blade is definitely something that the Thane of White Run would be doing. It's definitely not like something a stranger would do. But I, again, you could come up with a situation like I'm a witch hunter and I heard that you got some troubled children and you're out the Yarrow's like, "Yes, honey, I got some troubled children. I got some troubled children and they're like my son's really edgy and I don't know why." Definitely has nothing to do with him having a different mother. If Never Knows Best cares so much about game feel, why did he talk about lockpick perks for 20 minutes? Yeah, exactly. Okay? There's some people who enjoy the game feel of the lockpicking system of Skyrim. No, I, I don't think that's a necessarily accurate assessment. Maybe this is a me thing. Maybe there are just certain things I have to work through on my own. I don't know, but... No, you definitely gotta work through this one. What I do know is that Skyrim seems like a game that was designed... Oh, wait. The dislikes are gone. Wait, this is bullshit. That's bullshit. I still have dislikes on my stream. How come he gets his dislikes removed? 
by people who love the term gameplay loop. Yeah, so this is kind of his point. The whole reason he brought, he made that stupid gameplay loop argument is that um, he feels that Bethesda was designed by people who like gameplay loops. Only you can see your dislikes. Oh no. Oh no! I think that YouTube started adding ads randomly. I was watching your Oblivion video again and got a ton of weirdly timed ad breaks. Uh, you could always send me a picture of when the ad breaks are and we can kind of cross-reference when the... Like, all the, all the mid-rolls in the Oblivion video are manually added. See, only you can see if you're getting disliked bombed. Isn't that better? Yeah, that was the weird thing is like, okay, so let's say the point is to protect people's feelings so that like dislike bombs don't happen. The creators can still see if they're getting a lot of dislikes. And I guess the idea is, okay, nobody's going to dogpile on top. It's like, you see that a video has 30,000 dislikes. I'm going to add a dislike as well. No, that's not how fucking people think. I don't, I don't think there's a single person out there who goes, well, this video has a lot of dislikes, so I'm going to add to it, unless it's, like, YouTube Rewind. But even then, that's like, no, you, your rewinds just suck. So it's like, that's not it. So, of course, we all really know the reality of it. I still see dislikes. Well, I mean, I'm not saying it. I can literally scroll down and show you that I can no longer see the number of dislikes on the video. Dislike bombing is a thing, though. No, and there's, um... If people get mad enough, they'll, like, do... They'll hire a service that will, like, dis... That will do, like, dislike campaigns on a channel. Like, I get that it's a thing, but it's not a... Like, dislike bombing is not... Um, oh, I randomly showed up to this, uh, Salt Factory video and it had, like, 10,000 dislikes or something. Something crazy like that. Oh, no! It's hidden, too. Okay, you'll have to take my word for it. It was on stream a couple days ago. But, like, this stream had, like, um, like, 10,000 or something dislikes on it. So it's not like I see the, um... I see that this video has like 10,000 dislikes and I go, I'm going to add to that. No, it's um, entirely based on like what I choose to dislike. That kind of peer pressure is exactly how it works. Really, you're such a weak fucking sister. I like that insult from Relinar. You're such a weak fucking sister that if you saw this, this video had a bunch of dislikes on it, you would add to it. You would never base it on your own opinion. You're being incredulous to a pretty well-researched phenomenon. Okay, so... Well, okay, let me get this straight. Again, pretend this is a Salt Factory video. You see 60,000 likes, 10,000 dislikes. Uh, uh, uh... It, okay, if this is a well-researched phenomenon that happens to everybody, wouldn't, like, the second that there was even a, a tilt in the dislikes, it would just be... Shouldn't there be 60,000 dislikes and 10,000 likes then? I'm going to tell you right now, if somebody dislikes your video, it's not because the dislike number was big. It's because your video sucked. Or because they don't like it, but yeah.
This just sounds like massive cope. Like you're regurgitating shit you've heard that's being used to justify why we are getting rid of dislikes. When the real reason is that the White House was really unhappy that their videos kept getting dislikes. Why wouldn't a bunch of likes on a video sway your opinions? If this is a documented phenomenon, wouldn't the same thing be true of reviews? Oh no, I didn't get a bunch of bad reviews on Steam because my game was bad or because I did something that was incredibly controversial. I got a bunch of bad reviews on Steam because there were people who saw that they were also giving bad reviews. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? There's infinitely more people who like videos than dislike people videos. So if the basis was just, oh, I see a lot of people are doing this, I'm going to do it as well then shouldn't every video just have 99% likes unless it's somehow managed to be so bad that it pushed to 50% and then it would just have 99% dislikes? This, this is some of the dumbest shit I've heard. All right, doctor, trust me on this one. I'll trust you here, okay? There is a documented phenomenon of people dislike campaigning stuff. It's definitely not people's personal opinions that they dislike stuff it's definitely definitely a documented phenomenon mass dislikes happen because of bandwagons jesus christ A dislike bomb is a is a concerted effort that's put in put on by a bunch of people who intentionally go to the effort of disliking something. They don't go like it's not fucking ten people who go. We're gonna dislike something. Oh no, the video has ten dislikes. It's time for us to all jump on board. Bandwagoning is a studied phenomenon. People don't have unique opinions. Every time something I do dislike gets disliked, it's because of one troll in spot leading the charge. He's so charismatic that he just inspired those 10,000 people to dislike the Salt Factory video. I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to time you out. You're just embarrassing yourself. Five minute timeout. I'm gonna give you a second to really think about what you're saying. And then you can get back to us. A creator can tell when they're being disliked bomb by looking at the retention rate. Well, yeah, that's the thing, is... You know I keep up with other content creators, right? Like, I know somebody who is dealing with an issue where they had a Russian bots hired to, like, mass dislike their videos. And to, like, leave, like... So they would leave, like, uh, the thumbs down comments on all these bot accounts. And YouTube was doing, like, absolutely nothing to help this guy. Like, that that's a thing that happens. But there's not a fucking social phenomenon of, oh, I saw that there were 10,000 dislikes on the Salt Factory video, and so that means that I'm going to dislike. I'm sorry. That's just not the case. It's called cope. Stop coping, okay? There's legitimately people who don't like the Salt Factory video. Yeah, I am referring to uh, Nicholas Diorio. Because I, I was following him on Twitter and he's been having this issue for a while. Because he, like, pisses off um, really petty people.
Oh god, it's this part too. It only gets worse from here. You could be influenced to more likely dis to dislike the video. Sure. Yeah. I didn't deny that. I denied the thing of like, oh, I scroll down, I see that there's 10,000 dislikes. Ah! I can't control what I'm doing! Ah! My, my hand is acting on its own! Oh, wait, I'm not signed in. Fuck. Which is what that guy was claiming. Step one is acquiring the quest. As this is the start of the loop, it's therefore the most important step, and so no chances were taken to allow the player to ever miss this step and find themselves outside the loop. Oh, there's plenty of opportunities to uh, not have quests. Like, yeah, there's lots of quests that like auto accept for you, but there's also lots of quests that you can just say no to. Or, um, another one is like, what was it? I thought it was really smart. Oh, um, Nermina's, Namira's quest. When you do Namira's quest, it starts with just, like, it starts as a miscellaneous quest. Because it would really stand out if, like, um, oh yeah, you, you ask to help with the Hall of the Dead, and then suddenly it's just big quest text up on top. Uh, and then, like, it's got, like, the Daedric markings on it. It's like, oh, this is gonna be a Daedric quest. But, like, if it starts as just, like, a minor thing, and then develops into a full quest, it's actually kind of, um... Kind of clever, in my opinion. Yeah, and then you have the opposite side of the spectrum. A new hand touches the beacon. Where it's like, uh... I see that fucking thing and I just close the chest. You have to actively avoid NPCs, though. Even random guards saying stuff on the street without you listening gives you quests. No, it does have it happens a lot, but saying that every single quest in Skyrim is absolutely unavoidable is definitely um is definitely like disingenuous to say the least. And especially because like okay, so the example he's giving us right now is not an unavoidable quest. It's literally he literally has an option on screen to decline the quest. And you know, we, we've talked about it before. The options on screen are, yes, I'll accept the quest, and no, but I'll accept the quest later. So it's like, yeah, you don't have the option to say no, and I'll never do it, but... Why do we hate all other long-form video guys again? I forget. Because I'm killing the competition, okay? I'm trying to make it so that I'm the only video analysis channel, and then I'm going to stop making content and officially kill the genre. That's the goal. God, we talk about this like every 15 minutes. <laughs> I saw... Listen. I saw that there were a bunch of dislikes... And that immediately informed my opinion that I must dislike it as well. To this end, Skyrim offers up a constant barrage of new things to do at a steady pace throughout the experience that is mathematically designed to ensure players always have just slightly more to do than they're ever capable of actually doing. If only there was a presentation from, like, January of 2012 we could watch where the guy that was responsible for the system talked about it and then you could refer to it. I'm not saying that it's not, like, mathematical in the rate you get quests, but I'm just saying that there's, like, sources for this stuff. Well, that's why the dislike thing is not fair, okay? Look at these big institutional YouTube channels, okay? I'm just a small, I'm a small guppy in a big pond. I'm just a minuscule 63,000 subscriber YouTube channel. This guy's like, you know, he's got at least a Lamborghini, right? He has dislikes hidden 
for him, but I still have dislikes on my stream. And that's because this guy is definitely collaborating with YouTube to hold down the revolution that is our YouTube streams. In most games, players find quests themselves. In Sky... In most games, players find the quests. You know, like, there's a big meme of World of Warcraft where, um... The NPCs have, like, literal quest markers that tell you where to go to start them. And I mean, yeah, yeah, you find the quests, but you don't find it because you were, like, talking to NPCs and it dynamically happened. You know, I'm pretty sure if um, World of Warcraft had come out, like, around the time of Skyrim, then it definitely would have been a situation of you walk into, qu you walk into Crossroads, 15 quests get added to your quest. That's exactly how Guild Wars 2 works. So never mind. That's exactly my point. They would have done it if they could have. But it's like, again, I'm pretty sure... Hang on. Let's look this quest up. Simba White Arms. This is the bear quest. I think you have to ask about it to get it. You know, the UESP is not specific if if you talk to her and she immediately confronts you about the bear quest or if you actually have to ask her about the bear problem and then offer the offers payment which implies that you have a, the choice to say no I have just slightly more to do than they're ever capable of actually doing in most games players find quests themselves yeah he asked about the bear problem so again you overheard that there's a bear problem, and then you sought out the person who's having the issue so that you could solve it for them. You went and found the quest. So it's like, again, there are examples in Skyrim where quests are just thrust at you. A new hand touches the beacon, as an example. Uh, but, like, you're choosing not to use those examples and are instead... Choosing to use examples where you had the choice. Because that's sort of the thing, right? Let's say you're like a like you're an exterminator and you're looking for work and you're talking to somebody and you overhear their neighbor is like complaining like, these goddamn raccoons keep getting into my goddamn addict. Well, congratulations. You know, you, you go over there and you ask them about the raccoon problem, and now you have a, a pest extermination quest. And it's like, what's the difference? You still have to seek it out. Just because you overhear it doesn't mean that the quest is being thrust upon you. My favorite psychology experiment is the one where um, they put a, they put some bananas on top of a ladder, and anytime the monkeys would try to climb up to get the bananas, they would like hose them all with cold water, and then so they were like they were all taught and knew that trying to get the bananas at the top would be a bad thing, and so every time new monkeys would enter, they would try to get the bananas at the top of the ladder, and the other monkeys would, like, try to stop them. Well, eventually, they actually just stopped spraying the monkeys with the cold water, but the monkeys would still, like, physically assault any of the new monkeys that tried to get the bananas, um, just based off of that, um, that initial training. So, like, that's sort of my favorite thing, is, like, the negative, the negative stimulus can go away, but animals will still kind of, like, teach each other to not do something um, based on it. I also like the Utopia Mouse Experiment, and if I ever got, like, a big sponsor, I would recreate it using that money. You can also find Meridia's Quest by visiting the Shrine, which can easily happen. Yeah, but don't you need the beacon to start it?
In Skyrim, we reverse this, so the quests instead find you. Literally, NPCs like couriers are programmed to periodically appear to force feed the player new quests in the form of letters from Jarls they've never heard of, but who have heard of them, and want them to come solve their problems. And you know what? The player will, because they don't know how to say no to quests. I mean, I would hate to be the person to make this argument. You could just say no. Well, yeah, that's the thing. I want to recreate the experiments because I don't, I don't think anybody's ever actually done like a full recreate or like a recreation of that study. So that's why it interested me. Yes, the couriers bringing you stuff is annoying, especially with Anniversary Edition, which you shouldn't buy. But again, you got Meridius Quest. Um, what's another great example of this? Uh, for me personally, I was at the White Run Market and I was talking to the, like the stall people because I was wanting to like check out what they were selling. And so I talked to the old lady that was part of the Grey Mains and she was like, Oh, you look like an adventurer. Could you help me with my missing son? And I was like, Jesus Christ, woman, I just want the trinkets that you're offering for sale. I don't want to help you with your missing son. But th that was too late. The quest was thrust, thrust upon me. Literally, we gave them no option to say no. The quests just appear in their journal whether they like it or not, so the only way to get rid of them is by capitulating to their every demand. And that's what the player does. With the quest acquired and its accompanying exposition explained, players will then have their objective. This leads us to step two. The objective is represented in the form of a little arrow, a now iconic icon displayed on map and compass alike which players can use to find the objective, which they do by simply pressing the move button while facing the direction the arrow tells them to, ensuring that sooner or later even the dumbest of players will end up in the place we want them to be. Again, this is that cynicism that kind of... This was, this was the final blow. What's stopping you from from ignoring them? Well, my issue is... I don't like having the big quest log that's full of stuff to do, and... I feel like... The player kind of gets pressured into taking on a lot more quests than what would reasonably be expected of them. What's worse is that she's an actual merchant before that point, so you can just be trying to sell stuff and she screams about her missing son instead. I thought that was like... I, I don't know about that. My first interaction with her was getting mobbed for the quest. During this journey, players are encouraged to enjoy the scenic scenery of the overworld. It does look rather nice, and there are a number of attractions for players to witness on their way from one location to another. Maybe there'll be a giant with his pet. And then you have DJ Peach Cobbler who's like, I was walking to solitude to join the Imperial Legion, and I just kept running into dungeons to do, and it's fucking awesome. Or you like, you have the Arlo of, of like, yeah, I'm like addicted to this game. You should pick this up because it's fucking addictive. Weird contrast. Would y'all consider eating monkey? Uh, you shouldn't eat. Monkeys are like, I guess they're scavengers, but like they're in the middle of like prey and uh, predator. You definitely shouldn't eat them. Like, from that perspective. And then you get into, like, the... They kind of look like us, so really you shouldn't do that. Mammoth. Cute. Maybe there'll be a randomly generated NPC interruption. How unexpected. Maybe there'll be a dragon. Exciting. These events were created to make the world seem more alive, without actually doing anything to make it more alive. For those more impatient, they can also open their map and fast travel to the nearest discovered location for a shorter journey. This ensures that even the busiest of players don't feel like their time is being wasted. Even if it is. Once the player arrives at their objective, they'll discover what it is. Surprise, it's a dungeon. Actually, it's always a dungeon. This is Skyrim after all, and this is for good reason. It's in these dungeons that the magic happens. 
Anyway, time for the player to head inside and see what adventure awaits them. Wow, it's Draugr's. Oh, Skyrim, you and your Draugr's. I love crack. I'm addicted to it. Seven out of seven go buy it. Yeah, that was the weird thing about Arlo was that he gave the game a full rating and he said you should buy it and he disingenuously presented some stuff about it. But like his main argument for why you should play it is that it's addictive. I feel like in 20 years, um, addiction is definitely going to be something that like we don't recommend games for. Like, there's going to be reviewers who specialize in, should you play this game? And they take the perspective of, like, will you get addicted to it? Is their whole kind of shtick. Because I think that's the thing with game addiction, is that we just don't um, fully understand it yet. And so, it's such, like, a jarring thing to have somebody who's, like, that's why they're, um, that's like why they're selling the game. Because the thing is, like, it is very easy to create an addictive game. There are so many of them now that were created expressly for that purpose. Um, so you need, like, the Ross Scott approach of, like, if you've ever seen his game list of, like, stuff he wants to play, where it's like, I think he admitted that, like, if you have a game addiction problem, you not, might not want the list because everything that's on his list is, like, supposed to be stuff that he can just get lost in, which is the point, but. Orgas, they never get old. Literally, they're undead. They don't age. Well, not to worry. Now the player is inside the dungeon, they are safely in the hands of the Skyrim mini loop of walk, kill, loot, repeat, walk, kill, loot, repeat, walk, kill, loot, repeat, until the dungeon is complete. To ensure. You know what would really sell this point? Something, anything that the developers said that would uh, back up this idea that they were using gameplay loops. You already covered this section of the video. Yeah, that was the deal. Was we, we're going to start back with the gameplay loop stuff and then kind of get a roll on. Sure, combat doesn't feel pointless, despite the vast amount of it against the exact same enemies, the player is fed a constant drip feed of skill increases and level ups that now have a much more impactful sound effect and on-screen message to titillate players' shriveled up dopamine receptors by making them think they've accomplished something of value. Oh, wow, you've increased your one-handed skill. Good job. That's sure to impress members of the opposite sex. To go alongside this, loot has been placed periodically throughout the dungeon. Continue. In evenly spaced containers, whose content has been scientifically formulated to always contain just enough of value to make sure players always feel like they should search each one, and yet not enough of value to make players ever feel like they have enough random stuff that they... How come when people try to call me a virgin, they don't ever say, like, members of the same sex? Don't need to keep searching them. Hey, maybe there's a Daedric Sword in that next chest. You better not be thinking of skipping it. Oh, it's not a Daedric Sword this time. Well, you better take the stuff anyway to sell later. There's no such thing as too much gold, after all. Of course, this isn't strictly true. Well, yes, gold has no weight, and so the player, in theory, can never have too much of it. In practice, they'll have too much gold after only a few hours, because there's nothing to spend it on. I mean, what are you gonna- How do you get to 170,000? I think you have a problem at that point. I'm at, like, 70,000, and I'm level 51, and I make, like, potions that are just insane. Exactly, this is bisexual erasure. They're trying to get rid of me. I say we get rid of them first. Get rid of the straights, get rid of the gays. But yeah, like it's... There's typically a point in the Skyrim review where I'm confident in the, in the amount of money I have because the main thing I use money for is trainers, so I need a bit because when you get to 75, 75 to 90, that's where you're going to start sinking like tens of thousands of gold into the um, into your training. Um, 
of course you could always just like opt to switch to something that's easier but this is sort of my, my point is that like once you get to about 50,000 gold you can just stop picking stuff up or like only pick to like only stick to like picking up like anything worth over a certain threshold of money like 500 or a thousand gold because typically like I'm, I'm still looking for like all the enchantments i'm still looking for jewelry that kind of stuff Why bother to train the world's leveled anyway? Sure, but training is a great way of not fucking grinding stuff like smithing, speech, enchanting, alchemy. It, it, skills that are super repetitive to level are best left to training. So, like, my rule for my current character is to train five times every level. And, um, it's going well so far, actually. gonna do buy a daedric sword i don't think so buddy even after 100 hours the best of these vendors can do is glass and even that will only be when you're lucky you see we made sure there's nothing of value to spend your money on in skyrim because players can't run out of things to spend money on if there's never anything to spend it on in the first okay this is like the smoothest brain of logic so his argument is there's somebody at bethesda who expressly went out of their way to say that there should be nothing that you should you can spend your money on in skyrim because then Players will have nothing to spend money on. And I mean, never mind the fact that, like, you could buy crafting stuff. Let me make sure that I'm, I'm clear on this. of value to spend your money on in Skyrim because these vendors have nothing to spend it on. I mean, what are you going to do? Buy a Daedric sword? I don't think so, buddy. Even after 100 hours, the best these vendors can do is glass, and even that will only be when you're lucky. You see, we made sure there's nothing of value to spend your money on in Skyrim because players can't run out of things to spend money on if there's never anything to spend it on in the first place. Okay, so his argument is, Bethesda's goal was that the player should... Fuck. It is like slipping out of my... It's so smooth-brained that I can't even remember what the fuck he actually said. ...to spend your money on in Skyrim because players can't run out of things to spend money on if... Players can't run out of things to spend money on... There's never anything to spend it on in the first place. ...if there's never anything to spend it on. I mean, like... It should be pretty obvious how circular that kind of logic is. And like again, you're you're ascribing malice to what is probably just incompetence. No, there's absolutely a lack of worthwhile things worth buying. That's why you end up with such an excess of money in Skyrim. But it's like, again, why would you assume that Bethesda was doing it intentionally and not that this is just like an unfortunate byproduct of some other system? Like you're intentionally assuming that there is nothing to spend your money on because Bethesda is worried that the player might run out of money. This is a joke about his perception. Yeah, okay, so I get... Because, again, we saw the video before. He's gonna, he's gonna go... Oh, guys, remember, the last five minutes where I was giving an example of how Skyrim is, I was just exaggerating. I was doing it for a bit. And it's like, wow, okay. So, then what actually is the point? So, it's like... If I can't take this seriously, then how am I supposed to take anything in the video seriously if it's all could just be a bit? This may sound ineffective, but so deep is greed interwoven into the human condition that just seeing a number next to the word gold gets bigger and bigger.
All right, we got an urns guy. Show me on the doll where Todd Howard forced you to loot all the urns. Is all the motivation most players will need to keep searching through every container, to pick up every last piece of junk, to then repeat the laborious process of visiting different vendors to sell your various trash. This may sound rather tedious, but it's a tedium the player will feel is a result of their choice and clever money management, and so we'll avoid blaming the game for. Oh, what's that you've got there? Wow, that is a lot of gold. <laughs> Don't spend it all at once. Oh yeah, my face is covering it. Hang on. It's unfortunate, my face always covers the gold amount. But he's got 180,000 gold. I think most people reasonably would, would stop well before that point. Loot and killing is important, but we don't want to keep players in dungeons for too long. That's why through mass data analysis, our statisticians have calculated 32 minutes, 55 seconds, and 28 milliseconds to be the ideal dungeon length, so as to feel not so long as to become overwhelming, and yet not so short that the accomplishment of beating the dungeon feels insignificant. Uh, but guys, this is just a bit. I don't mean, actually mean to say that there's a statistician at Bethesda who's formulated like an ideal dungeon length. Guys, it's just a bit. I was joking. Everything I said was a joke. Significant. Of course, we couldn't make every dungeon 32 minutes, 55 seconds, and 28 milliseconds long. That would be ridiculous. And so we used a standard deviation of 1.875 to provide a level of variation that feels natural to the player without ever moving into the uncomfortable realms of too short or too long. Now, the more cynical of the human populace might argue that despite our previous efforts, dungeons themselves are still too repetitive, but the pièce de résistance is what awaits players at the end of the dungeon. You see, we know through our psychological analysis of the human mind that the cognitive biases of the peak end rule will ensure the final part of the experience will be the most memorable, and so not only do we allow the player to complete the quest objective that brought them here in the first place, we also throw in a... Okay, but here, okay, here's the thing. Here's the thing, and I made this before. <sighs> is it responsible, or is it good, to hold games accountable for shit that's on you? Example given. I have a tendency to want to walk out of every vendor transaction with the vendor having zero gold and me having all the money. That is something that I do every time. So I have potions that um, I'm always like ready to sell. I have like enchanted items with like that were enchanted with petty souls. You know, I just carry stuff around to sell on the off chance that I run into a merchant and uh, so I can clear out their gold. That's not Skyrim's fault. That is not Skyrim's fault. That's my fault. That's a me thing. That's something that I do. Because there's people who don't have that habit. Now, here's another thing. Uh, the tendency to want to save potions until the boss encounter. This is a common phenomenon in uh, role-playing games specifically. Uh, people feeling the desire to want to save their epic potions... And then they never actually use their epic potions... Because when they're doing the boss fights, they think... Well, maybe this boss isn't the one that I'll use my epic potion on. Then you have like tons and tons of potions, right? Right, right, That's a you thing. It's a me thing. I used to do that. But I don't do it anymore. I had to go to the effort of breaking that habit. But it's a me thing. It's not Skyrim's fault that you feel compelled to loot all the burial urns. It's not Skyrim's fault that you feel compelled to loot everything and feel so greedy and spend so much time in dungeons. I disagree. Tez is designed to enable that behavior. You can loot everything. It's a core feature. Um... Okay, so because it's possible, Elder Scrolls encourages it? Really? You know what's possible in Grand Theft Auto? You can hire a hooker, have sex with her, and then kill her and take your money back afterwards. It's possible. There's lots of people who do it. It's a popular meme. But... Does that mean that everybody does it or that everybody has that issue or that everybody's so stingy with the money, right? It's sort of the thing. Just because it's possible to pick up everything in Skyrim doesn't mean that the system is encouraging you to pick up everything in Skyrim. You know, picking things up is just something that we do in these games.
It's sort of like saying that like a first person shooter encourages you to kill all the enemies. No, that's a you thing. You decide to do that. If it's possible for you to get past a level without having to kill everybody, then, you know, just because there's everybody for you to kill doesn't mean that the game is forcing you to kill everybody. Remember the quote about optimizing the fun out of the game? It's the same thing. Yeah, well, that's sort of my thing is it's a you thing. This is your issue. You could, like, decide to sit down and go, you know what, I'm going to try to work through my issue of me ruining the games for myself. And so it's like, I, after reaching level 50, decided that I would just, like, loot a lot less stuff. Postal 2? Yeah. You sound like Dime Tree. Why do you got to cut so deep? Look, it's just... It's just, to me, a weird thing that... I don't think you can hold these games accountable for stuff that's your personality or your decision. It's like saying, there were all these unmurdered women in Skyrim. The game gave me a bunch of women and the option to murder them. Of course I went around murdering all the women in Skyrim. Why wouldn't I? The game encouraged it by having a bunch of murderable women. Would you say, oh, Skyrim is encouraging misogyny? No, you would say, you're a fucked up person who just murders women in video games for fun. That's your own thing. But that's sort of my point is that that was on you. You did that. You chose to do that. And it's your fucking hangups that made you do it. Oh, well, we know Kotaku would say that, and we give them shit for saying that because it's not true. I'd argue the men are more murderable, yet, yeah, well, eh. I would definitely say there's, a, of the NPCs that I feel like deserve to have some vigilante justice taken on them it seems to be disproportionately male but there are some women that like need some vigilante justice in skyrim <laughs> um i just got the ebony blade so i'm like looking into like um because you gotta like murder 10 npcs who trust you and there's some that are like parts of quests or like that you can do right but uh one of the people i did was uh I did Luca Valeris, or whatever his name is, the Riverwood Trader guy, because I'm currently testing that. So I killed Luca. I'm just going to see if, like, I've invested in his store. I'm going to see if he, and I also did his quest. So I'm going to see if, like, I get an inheritance or, like, if Camilla, like, sends an assassin or something. And then, um, and then I'm going to kill Cam Camilla. So I'm kind of, like, just testing it right now. This is killing strippers and hitman even though you're not supposed to and being like, look what they're making me do. Yeah. Well, that's exactly my point is the game didn't make you do anything. You brought your own issues to the game. And in a way, the game is an opportunity for you to work through those issues. So if one of your issues is that you're a kleptomaniac who loots absolutely everything out of the dungeon, you just feel the compulsive desire to pick it clean. Well, Skyrim seems like an opportunity for you to kind of try to work through that issue, right? Makes sense to me. Did anyone play the Tribunal DLC in Skyrim AE? Is it worth it? Oh, it's not very good. It is bad. Um, don't play it. The Oblivion one that does the kind of the same thing is way better, and even then, that's a very low bar. For reals, I'm surprised nobody said, but you don't have to complete all the, que all the quests as if they weren't constantly shoved in your face. Well, like, look, I take it with a grain of salt. There are there are quests that are shoved upon you, but he didn't show those quests. He, like, showed quests that you opt into. If 
If the avatar is an orc, where's the big teeth? They wouldn't let me make the teeth big enough. I think I can... Hang on. Oh yeah, where is the where is the teeth? Okay, when I made the model, it, it, I had options for teeth size, and so I had lower. There, there's like vampire fangs you can get, and you can do the upper row and the lower row. So I like did the lower row, and it looked kind of like I had fangs, but um, they like didn't protrude out of the mouth. But I can't prove it. Oh, wow, it's cool how that almost fits. Anyways. I think Saints and Seducers is the only good CC plugin, and the mini quest line plays well enough if you're type to not use markers. I've yet to do that one yet. I think it starts with you talking to the Khajiit Caravans, doesn't it? I've tried to focus on the CC content that, um, that I encounter. So if I don't encounter it yet, then I haven't done it, but I'm currently like, I'm about finishing up, um, like I'm doing all the side content first and then like the main content's going to be last. Oh, you guys want a break? Yeah, we can take a small, uh, turn of the hour. We'll be back for refreshments. So I'm going to finish this thought. So I'm like finishing up the like danger and side quests and what have you. And that includes like the CC content. So I'm sort of transitioning to the part where I like have to seek it out. Like for instance, I have yet to be confronted by the Periite guy. So I haven't done Periite's quest. And I'm trying like I'm like out in the world shaking my ass trying to ogle the grotesque to get this guy to fucking start the quest. I know I can just go to the shrine, but that's no that's no fun. I'm trying to do this stuff like somewhat organically. I'll be right back. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Welcome back. Argonian is going to be the hardest model to do. There is a... Um, in the software I use, there is a maid outfit. Because, of course, it was made by Weebs. Of course, there's a maid outfit. But, um... That kind of scaly skin, I think, is going to be really hard to do. Yeah, I, I think the next one's going to be the Bosmer for tomorrow. Because that's kind of the 
way I'm doing it is like every day or every stream I'm like making a new one. Because again, it doesn't take very long. Oh yeah, Dramora girl. We could do that. And we could do like a... We could do the saint and the seducer. You guys just don't like me because I'm dead. I'm stuck inside a giant robot, okay? No, I think I'll definitely... The Argonian one will be wearing the Meta outfit. <laughs> a boss fight encounter, a large shiny chest with better loot than any of the others, and often a unique word of power whose custom-made animation and sound effect really make the... Unless you do a fort or a Dwimmer Ruin or the Falmer Dungeon. Yeah, it's like only like a spe one specific kind of dungeon, really. Player feels special. As such, the player is showered in endorphin releasing stimulants to let them know what a good job they did and encourage them to immediately begin the process all over again as soon as they fast travel back and hand the quest in. Now, that's what I call a loop. With the Radiant Quest system that's able to create a never ending stream of new randomly generated quests and dungeons that repopulate after 10 to 30 in game days, the award winning Skyrim loop literally never ends, ensuring complete player satisfaction for the rest of their pathetic lives. This loop is so effective that even players who don't like this game still have an average of over 200 hours of in game time logged on Steam. So, just one second, let me just go over to Steam, Skyrim, store page, yes, yes, I'm 18, scroll down, review type, negative, oh my, oh no, that's positive, I was going to say, there's 180,000 negative reviews, this guy has 11 hours, this guy has 12 hours, this guy has 55 hours, which is a lot to me personally. 30 hours, 20 hours, 9 hours, 2 hours. So yeah, if you cherry pick your examples and provide literally only three, you uh, absolutely can find people who have hundreds of hours in the game who don't, who give it a negative review. Don't forget for Steam reviews, their playtime for Tez V is across Special Edition and Legendary Edition. I don't think that's true. Five hundred and seventy-eight hours, and then so I got five hundred and eighty hours in normal Skyrim, and three hundred and thirty hours in Special Edition, and fifty-seven minutes in VR. Um, so, yeah, I don't think that's true. Because they would have to add, a, like, a special thing to make it cumulative. Because they are listed as separate products on, on uh, Steam. Just imagine what happens to those who do like it. We know what happens to those who do like it. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Actually. Easily earns the badass seal of approval. I cannot wait to see all the DLC and expansions coming. Now, if you'll excuse me, I gotta play through it again as evil, doing all the thieves guild. What about Anniversary Edition? Anniversary Edition is an update for Special Edition. Hello. And then we have this guy. It's up to you if you think it's worth double dipping. However, if you've way to play a really phenomenal game and as such skyrim for switch gets an easy seven out of seven thanks for watching everyone now if you uh damn it his isn't as funny but um here's a guy who likes the gameplay loop of skyrim
Hey, I didn't ask to get ghosted, okay? That was Kagranak. Kagranak basically decided for all of us. It could also mean that they are um, giving the game a bad review because of Bethesda's business practices. Do you remember in the first episode of this analysis, when I spent 21 minutes? Why do we get the part 4 title card, but we aren't in part 4? Like, part 4 is here at 53 minutes. We're at 37 minutes, and you just hit me with part 4. What's going on here? It's explaining how the appeal of the Old Scrolls games is all about their worlds and death. Well, the Falmer are dirty fucking scum like that. ...to explore them. How this is the most important part of these games, the thing that makes them so special and draws people to them and makes people fall in love with them. Well, how exactly does that fit with Skyrim's gameplay loop? You see, I don't actually think there's anything insidious about Skyrim's gameplay loop. Video games are designed- That you spent... Eight minutes. All right, so give an example. Um, the total video runtime is ninety-five minutes, so that is eight percent of the video that you dedicated to uh, that you just undermined with one sentence. If you don't think it's insidious, why did you present it that way? It wasn't funny. It didn't seem like a joke to me. It seemed like you were genuinely criticizing the game for those elements. So, again, if you don't think it's insidious, why did you present it like there was a guy at Bethesda who was doing, like, who had, like, a statistician who dictated what the ideal dungeon length is and, like, that there was a radiant system that was designed to keep you doing quests? Like the dopamine farm. Insidious does not equal bad or antithetical to the core experience. No, Insidious refers to the designers. So the designers intentionally going out of their ways to make an addictive experience would be a, an Insidious implication. Well, yeah, so we we pointed that out the last stream that we were watching this, and that was what kind of ended things, was the take about gameplay being designed to be addicting. Um, you can reduce any game down to that section that he just did, and if you do, if you're disingenuous enough and you take enough things out of context, you can present literally any game as having... Uh, a similar gameplay loop. And we actually did it with Watch Dogs, I think was the example we gave. I gotta go across the city to get a mission, but along the way I found chess, motherfucking chess. So I'm, I'm gonna play chess and it's like, you can just kind of, um, why is it not true? It's not true. Okay, here's why it's not true. You ready? You ready? You ready? You ready? Your epic video man just said it. Gameplay loop. You see, I don't actually think there's anything insidious about Skyrim's gameplay loop. Video there you go. Video games are designed to keep players engaged. They do this through conscious decisions made by their developers, and there's nothing wrong with that, particularly if the game isn't trying to create this engagement for the end purpose of some kind of further monetization method. And I also don't think Skyrim's gameplay loop is especially bad. Skyrim is good at making your in-game actions feel rewarding, and it's clear Bethesda have picked up several clever tips and tricks through their past game experiences to help accomplish this. 
Like how they noticed players enjoyed following their compass to find new locations in oblivion. So, now you get a more noticeable pop-up message as well as a sound effect to make it seem like your discovery of this location means something. Skyrim's gameplay loop is full of these kinds of small tweaks and optimizations that result in- Or they just wanted to make it more obvious that you had discovered it. Because in oblivion, there was no sound to it. You just, there was just a minor message that would be in the top left and like the icon would change color. So, it was kind of difficult to tell when you had uh, discovered it. Like, just for the purposes of like, getting it on your map. An experience that is easy to pick up and sink many hours into, all while generally feeling pretty well entertained. But even if I don't think it's insidious or bad game design, I do think that Skyrim's gameplay loop, on some level, fundamentally misses the entire point of the Elder Scrolls series. These games are meant to be about virtual worlds and their exploration, but Bethesda have ended up ignoring this to instead focus on the refinement of an overly gamified loop of repetitive actions that seems designed to keep players trudging through dungeons as much as humanly possible instead of exploring the world. And the dungeons aren't even- I agree with the destination, but I really didn't like the journey. Like, I'm glad we made it to Vegas, but could you have not crashed the plane along the way? Good. So this was where we had stopped. Um, what had happened was, like, the gameplay loop thing, like, okay, so now I understand fully, kind of. Now I understand why I had to stop that stream and why I had to cancel the, the stream that was the day after. Um, so we go through this, okay, so we go through this section where he talks about how gameplay loops are reductionist and they're stupid and you shouldn't use them, right? And then he goes, now we're going to use gameplay loops as an example, and it's like, okay, um, I understand what you're trying to do, but that was really weird. So then he goes through, like, an eight-minute example of why, um, of like how Skyrim's gameplay loop works. So he spends three minutes setting up what gameplay loops are. He spends eight minutes describing what Skyrim's gameplay loop is. And then he finishes by saying, now I don't think anybody at Bethesda was actually being insidious with the way that they were doing things. And at that point, my brain just kind of short circuited and I had to stop. And like, I just kind of autopiloted the rest of the section, which is why I rewatched it because I wanted to like know what the fuck had happened. So uh, now I have an idea. Basically, that little bit where he basically says, yeah, but not really, kind of just killed everything because he does it twice. He does it with the gameplay loops are dumb and I'm about to do it anyways. And then he does it with the, but I don't actually think it's insidious. So it's like, uh, yeah, and then that was it. Why so many dislikes? Because we were talking about dislikes earlier. Um, it's a smoke them if you got them situation because there's no longer dislikes on this video. It's only a matter of time before the dislikes disappear on the streams as well. Which I think is dumb. And I don't know any YouTubers who don't think it's dumb. Anybody who has an issue with dislikes already knew that there was an option on YouTube to disable the like bar. Like, that was something we could do all along anyways. The only reason people wouldn't disable the like bar is because there's, like, connotations. Like, if you see that the like bar is missing, then you assume, oh, well, then that must mean that, like, something really bad's going on with it. I think there's pro there's legitimate circumstances where it makes sense to, to remove your dislike bar because... I I, I would say, like, uh, like, a, like, a corporate video or something, right? The main thing with dislikes, though, was, like, giving people the opportunity to, um... Didn't Jimquisition go on a rant on Twitter about how it's great? Well, I, I think that, um... Isn't he, like, basically in the middle of a sustained, long-term mental breakdown? I don't exactly think that he's in the best of places. Why do you think they're removing them? What I've been told is, um... The White House YouTube channel was getting lots of dislikes, unsurprisingly. 
I don't think the I don't think the White House has ever had much approval uh, before even before Joe Biden or Donald Trump. I just think that they like want to they want to have more of a YouTube presence, but they don't want to have to reconcile the fact that they only have like a forty percent approval rating. So, but like again. Trump was the same way. There was a lot of if, if Trump had been kind of pushing the YouTube thing, then his YouTube presence would have been getting a lot of dislikes as well. And hell, for all I know, he was and his videos were getting dislikes. In fairness, I didn't gender, uh, I didn't gender them. Um, I just referred to it as Jim Quisition. Also, I had a conversation with one of my English major family members about the, the, uh, gendered language. Um, the thing about they, them is that part of the language implies a plurality. And, um... That can cause an issue if you're using pronouns to refer to a single person. Um, the question I brought up that they hadn't thought of because they're on the older side. They don't get kind of this gender politics shit. The question I brought up is, well, what if there's like a plurality of genders? And like that gave them pause for thought. I don't think you can legally bully people in the UK. That sounds like that sounds like a lie to me. Thon Thon. This ain't Star Wars. <laughs> There's a lot of those like gender pronouns that make me think like are you using that in good faith? Because it seems like... That seems like a gender pronoun somebody who wanted to, like, accelerate hatred of trans people would use. Alright. Lay it on me. The dungeons aren't good. Who knew? Okay, credit where credit's due. Skyrim's dungeons do look the part. Do you remember dungeons in Oblivion? There were four types. Forts, caves, mines, and aided ruins. And Oblivion dungeons. All dungeons of a specific type looked near identical, meaning if you've seen one, you've seen them all. And while there were a few exceptions to this, when I say few, I mean it. Also, I'm pretty sure mines and caves are basically the same thing. Stop trying to pretend they're meaningfully different, Oblivion. The separate they are different because, um, it's really dumb. There are special tile sets that come with the mine... Uh, dungeon type and also I think the implication is that mines are lived in so they'll like as you can see they're lit up they have human enemies whereas caves are like monster dungeons so there is a difference but it, it seems pretty minor Tycons aren't fooling anyone in Skyrim there are five main types of dungeons forts caves mines Nordic tombs and Dwemer ruins So he just kind of left out the Oblivion Gates then. Like, they're, no, they're dungeons. Oblivion Gates are dungeons by, like, every metric of the term. My preference were unassuming caves that would turn into something else entirely. So, so far, my favorite Skyrim dungeon is the one where the Argonian Companion is being kept prisoner. And you go in there, it's like a Nordic burial crypt, but it's been taken over by Falmer. So, um, it's like super dark and there's like the blue glowing shit everywhere. It looks cool. Um, it's not very complex, but it, it's an interesting twist on sort of the Nordic burial ruins.
Only one more archetype, and the return of both caves and mines, may not make Skyrim dungeons seem like much of a step up, but the mines of Skyrim are no longer quite so similar to the caves. Also, there's now a much greater variety within each type of dungeon. Skyrim has many great looking dungeons. Right about now is where I would love to show a really nice dungeon montage, maybe something like a quick top 10 dungeon designs in Skyrim list that could communicate my point in a fun and effective way. However, I have over 100 hours of recorded footage for this game, and I did not make any kind of timestamp notes or sorting system to make finding specific dungeon footage easier, so there will not be a montage or a top 10 list. Weenie. No, I understand this. Um, I still think it's worth trying, though. No, I'm not a fucking orc. I'm a dwimmer. I'm a dwarf. But we're just as tall as the other races of elves. And also the, the, the true descendants of Aldmeris. For your Skyrim video, I'd be interested to hear you talk about on why everybody hates the Dwimmer ruins, because in most of my mates hate them, but I can't figure why. Okay, so if I had to guess... I like the Dwimmer ruins alright. The issue... Like... The issue is, um, if you are going for the Dwarven Metal, then you run into carry weight issues. And the other problem is... A lot of them are like massive time commitments and the enemies you fight are kind of trash. They, they, it's variety, but the, um, so like there's different rules for the automatons. Like for most of your playthrough, illusion magic won't work on them. So like the illusionist play style doesn't really work. Um, and it's not really clear like what their kind of resistances and weaknesses are. Um, and again, I, I think it's just, uh, they're really fucking long. Why are they called dwarves? Uh, they were called dwarves by the giants, I believe. Because creating such a thing out of my jumbled mess of footage would be an editing nightmare. I guess then I'll just have to settle for showing off. Uh, you seem to be doing fine now, so, you know. Also, this isn't a dungeon. What the fuck are you talking about? Some of the Dwemer Ruins are actually the best dungeons in the game. Well, the issue I have is when you decide to do a Dwemer Ruin, you're like taking a gamble on is this going to be really interesting or is this going to be some supremely boring shit? Or is this actually going to be a Falmer dungeon all along? a few random examples in the background and just saying my point which is these dungeons look pretty good they're a lot more distinctive than previous games in the series and that distinctiveness can contain moments of true visual spectacle i mean as lydia likes to put it and she isn't wrong even if the amount she repeats this phrase is very annoying i've seen trees and caves far more times than i'd care to count i think skyrim there should be like for how often they do the thing where it's like, oh, there's a cave, but there's a hole in the roof so sunlight can get through. I should be walking in the surface and just falling into fucking caves all the time and dying. Well, okay, I would rather the gender discussion not continue um, because it only gets brought up because somebody keeps bringing Jim Sterling up. Um, the way I see it is I don't have an issue with being misgendered because I don't see being a woman as a lesser thing. So shut the fuck up about it. Nobody cares. Well, people do care, but not here. Still, some dungeons go even further than just looking good by incorporating their visual design into the location's story. My favorite example of this is Broken Ore Grotto, which is a coastal cave containing a half-sunken pirate ship that became trapped within after part of the cave collapsed years earlier, and- Well, this is just a copy of that fucking pirate home from, um, Oblivion. has now been converted into the headquarters of a local bandit group. 
You can uncover this story by reading a journal you find here, but you don't even need to read that journal for the visuals of this location to communicate much of this story to you. The result is this location is so much more than just another cave, and in this particular way, nothing in Morrowind, Oblivion, or Daggerfall can ever really compete with Skyrim. Really? Not every dungeon. Okay, I like, there's a Morrowind dungeon you can do. Actually, I'm not going to get a picture of it, but there's a Morrowind dungeon you can do. Um, I think you can do it without getting the key, but like it starts, there's a guy in Vivek that you talk to and you kind of share a drink with him. And he tells you about like this Nordic burial crypt that's hidden in Skyrim. Um, and he like, give, he gives you the location and he gives you the key if like you're nice to him. And so you go to this place and you're doing like this uh, Daedric Ruin and there's like a maze and it's a whole big thing. And then you get to the bottom of it and there's a buried, buried at the bottom of this ruin is a little pool of water with a, with a small little uh, Nordic longboat in it and like the body of the guy and like a shit ton of treasure. It's just like this cool thing that you can find. And you're telling me that that is lamer than there being a ship inside a cave. Let's see. Morrowind's Nordic Burial. Let's see if I can find a picture of it. That's super low resolution. Like, if I put that on the stream, most of you would not even be able to tell what it is. It's gonna be a... Yep, it is. Fucking Reddit. Wait, did I get it? Okay. This one. And even this doesn't really do it justice to like how kind of cool this area is. We complain about removing features from previous test titles, but I, people don't bring up underwater combat very often. I will. Because, boy howdy, does that annoy me. It, it, and that's the thing is, it's not a big deal. Because there's not a lot of underwater enemies to fight. It's basically just slaughter fish after Morrowind. But not being able to fucking fight the slaughter fish very well is really fucking annoying. Dungeon in Skyrim feels unique. Not every dungeon is visually impressive. Not every dungeon has a story, but enough are. I would say less than ten percent. Not enough are to sell the idea. No, no, no. Less, like less than ten percent. Called the Sepulchre, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it's like in um. It's in uh, Zura's Coast, kind of that southern part near Tel, uh, the one with the crazy lady who has like the. The cat minion. Ah, but Skyrim can easily claim to set a new standard for the series when it comes to visual design alone. And yet, despite the vastly improved appearance, mechanically these dungeons remain superficial. Combat has never been a strength of the series, and yet combat is the main activity you do in dungeons. A lot of time is spent inside dungeons in Skyrim, which means a lot of time is spent in combat in Skyrim, and there is still little by way of challenge or strategy to the vast majority of these encounters, leaving this, the main activity of the game, feeling repetitive and shallow. Still, there are other ways to add depth to a dungeon. So uh, let me let me be clear here. Um, actually, no. We'll go we'll go for this one right now. He's back. Um, let me be clear here. This is kind of the forty three thirty three. Okay, Skyrim has interesting dungeons, 
but I can't be bothered to find examples or list any. You're just gonna have to trust me on this one. I mean, for fuck's sake, I tried to go out of my way to find the interesting dungeons in Oblivion. Like, I looked up multiple kind of lists of, like, what everybody's top favorites were. And the end result was pretty lame. No, no, no. The, the, the dwarven girl disappearing and being replaced by a Dunmer is a metaphor. So that was kind of the point is like Skyrim's dungeons look better and they're more interesting. I can't give you examples, but you, you, they are. And now here now here's why they aren't. And it's like, okay, I feel like I'm I feel like you're jerking me back and forth on, with this one. To be fair, his example was the pirate ship, it just happens you aren't you aren't impressed by it. I mean it happened in Oblivion, and I don't think it's particular. I don't think it like. I fail to see why, even among like Skyrim dungeons, that would be impressive. I think most people would go to Blackreach. Or, he has like weird definitions of dungeons. So I guess he doesn't consider like Blackreach, the Soul Care, and the Veil as like dungeons, and he doesn't consider Oblivion Gates as dungeons. He seems to like, just limit it to, a dungeon is an enclosed space in the earth. Whereas I kind of look at it like, uh, I'm, I'm, I guess he, he's a dungeon conservative and I'm a dungeon liberal. I look at it like dungeons are areas that you get to visit that are uh, centered around like combat and gameplay. Do I still believe never knows best transcends postmodernism? Yeah. He's like, well, that's what deconstructionism is, is, um, You know, they came up with a bunch of ways of, like, uh, academically quantifying things, and then, like, postmodernists were, like, really opposed to that because it's like, no, 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 it's about the subjective experience. You can't objectively quantify things. And then the deconstructionists were like, yeah, and those labels you used were really stupid, too. Oblivion Gates are dungeons, but I think that Blackreach and Soulcairn are the least intended to be alternate open-world locations. Why wouldn't you list the veil in that? A dungeon is a prison in a castle. So you're a dungeon literalist. Goodbye, Anne for Arky. Veil is far too linear. Have you ever done the um the Paragon quest in the Veil? Kinda cool. Other ways that Skyrim also fails at. Yeah, I know ES ESO has outdoor dungeons. ESO is really weird about dungeons because the majority of them are like, oh, they're just like extensions of the open world, but they're like, they're instanced, but they're instanced Elder Scrolls style. So it's like, it's not really like an exclusive area for you to visit. It's just like a different part of the map. And then like the actual number of real dungeons is a small minority. I was really disappointed by the dungeon content in Elder Scrolls Online. For example, depth could be added through in-game traps to make navigating a dungeon dangerous. One, Oblivion had traps, and two, uh, I wouldn't say Skyrim's traps are particularly robust. Except traps in Skyrim still do so little damage that they barely qualify as minor annoyances. Oh, okay, he brought it up. But, I mean... Wait a second, what was his point? In other ways that Skyrim also fails at. For example, depth could be added through in-game traps to make navigating a dungeon dangerous. Okay, so Skyrim fails at adding depth through in-game traps because they're not dangerous. Got it. Traps. Traps, traps, traps. Let him finish! Fuck! 
Listen, it happens, okay? Except traps in Skyrim still do so little damage that they barely qualify as minor annoyances. You could add puzzles to a dungeon. I mean, as anyone who has played Zelda knows, few things go as well together as dungeons and puzzles. I've never played Zelda. You hear that? You hear that, world? I'm loud and I'm proud. I've never played Zelda. I'm such a pleb that I think that the main character's name is Zelda. No, I actually know better because of the porn, but trust me on this one. And Skyrim has puzzles. Actually, I have played Zelda. It was the one with the boats on the DS. Except there's just one type. This may not have been quite so bad if that one puzzle was at least good, but all it asks you to do is match the symbols in the environment with the symbols on the movable pillars. There are some slight variations to this, but not many, and they are only slight. Now, I have completed entire games full of puzzles, and these puzzles can be quite hard. Even when I was an idiot child, I was able to almost complete Ocarina of Time, and I am many years away from being an idiot child. Not that I'm trying to brag or anything, but I do believe I could handle something a little harder than matching a set of images. I also believe birds could handle matching images. I mean, I'm no expert, but I've seen videos, and they seem like they're up for the challenge. So, maybe... But yeah, like, crows could definitely figure out Skyrim puzzles. If you found a way to... If you found a way to interface it with them, they could figure it out. Like, you would have to translate it to something that, like, a bird would understand. Because a bird... You, like, you can't just give the bird a controller. Phantom Hourglass? Jesus, sorry, that's the only one you've played. Yeah, it wasn't very impressive. But, I mean, like... I never had any mainline Nintendo systems, so it's like, I can't really have played it then. And I'm not even sure why I got, had that game. I think it was like some used shit we got from GameStop. It wasn't very good. Plus they could design their puzzles for an audience. Didn't he just bitch about how he was insecure about being hyper-intelligent? Yeah? Wait. Why? Somewhere above the level of intelligence of the average pigeon. Maybe I'm being a little overly harsh here, but then again, in the very final dungeon of Skyrim's main story, you still just match symbols with those in the environment. So, maybe I'm not. Still, puzzles are a mostly new addition to dungeons, so we can't hold their simplicity against the game too strongly. No, they're not. What the fuck are you talking about? As the leading expert on Oblivion dungeons, after having worked with so many of them, I can tell you for a fact that there are plenty of Oblivion dungeons which use some kind of, like, puzzle system. The one that comes to mind is there's one of the forts where, um, there's, like, three portcullises and you have to pull the levers in the right order to get them to all open. And if you do it wrong, you could get stuck in the middle and then, like, you just have to pull a lever and you get let back out to the uh, start of the puzzle. But it's, like... No, the puzzles are not new to Skyrim, and um, I can't forgive you for this because literally, oh, whoops. Game Studios, oh, and it. something similar. Let's be talking about Morrowind. Plenty of possibilities, then it's not hard to imagine why they might be fun to explore. Wait, why are you playing modded Morrowind but not modded Skyrim? Weird kind of metric. I know view distance mod. It's not really, uh, not really that kind of, uh, big of a deal. The issue isn't that the puzzles are simple, it's that they're all identical. I would say it's a bit of both. They are so repetitive with what they do with the puzzles, and then you add on the fact that they're also, like, super simple. That same puzzles in Skyrim too. Yeah, I know. I think the issue is they don't have any good mechanics that they can that they can add to puzzles. So I'm thinking like, um, what's the game like Talos Principle or something, where it's like you have the lasers and you got to redirect them with the things, and then like like there's a lot you can do. Like you just add one mechanic and you add a lot to a puzzle game. But the issue is. 
So they can't assume that the player has a fire spell, even though all players have a fire spell, because they don't want to like impose magic on like non-magical characters. Okay, that's that's fine. That's fine and all. But because you have that inherent limitation of like we can't use magic to affect puzzles, um the end result is that everything is just like matching or uh like picking the correct sequence kind of puzzles. Um I think okay, so Dongard added the, the the that ethereal crown quest where they use the um the thing that you shoot and it spins. And that's like the closest they get to like incorporating combat mechanics into the puzzle solving. They needed to add more puzzles involving dragon shots. Well that's the thing is the Horn of Jurgen Windcaller, that dungeon, has stuff that requires you have Whirlwind Sprint, which makes sense because the only reason to do that dungeon is the main quest, and after that point you'll have Whirlwind Sprint. But the issue is, the issue they run into is, they can't design a puzzle that would require them to assume that the, the player would have something that they don't. So you can't make a puzzle that relies on like the Become Ethereal Shout unless you have some way of ensuring that every player has the Become Ethereal Shout. And it's the same thing with Whirlwind Sprint. They do it like once, and then that's basically it. Could do some high IQ word puzzles, but even then, um... Hey Rod, I would appreciate it if you didn't try to sell things on my channel i don't know like what's your deal do you have like an affiliate link that you make money off of i'm not sure what your game is I had to leave the final ethereum crown dungeon because i ran out of arrows oh man i think they give you a bunch though Lock picking is a bad mechanic because it relies on the player having lock picks. Well, you'll notice, um, I think only optional stuff is locked. Unless it's part of the Thieves Guild. The same can't be said about the dungeon layouts, which are more linear than ever before, meaning all navigating them entails is proceeding forwards in a mostly straight line. I don't want to see the series return to daggerfall levels of labyrinthian layouts, but straight lines are... Why not? Why not have at least... Uh, here's my thing. is Why not have at least one? Um, I was thinking about this. So they add the Oblivion... They have the uh, Oblivion dungeon that they added in the Creation Club. It's not very good. But I was thinking, like, wouldn't it be cool if the Oblivion dungeon they added was as, like, labyrinthine as the dungeons from Oblivion so that you could, like, directly contrast the styles and dungeons? It seems to me like you could do that and then players might be more appreciative of, um, like, the way that Skyrim's dungeons are. Because, like, you can go, oh, yeah, you think Oblivion dungeons are better? Well, have an Oblivion dungeon. Did you like doing it? But they didn't do that. They did the kind of just the most boring thing they can do, which is um, they made a Skyrim dungeon, but it it looks like an Alia dungeon. People have made a lot of huge Daggerfall style dungeon mods for Morrowind. I'd be interested in seeing someone do something like that for Skyrim. Is the thing. Aren't exactly exciting either. And honestly, nor is any part of Skyrim's dungeons gameplay. Whether you're looting or shooting, it never feels all that interesting. This mechanical shallowness might have been easy to forgive if these dungeons were more thematically interesting, but most of them don't manage that either. Because, in many ways, every dungeon in Skyrim could be the same dungeon. For example, each dungeon is full of enemies. You may say, of course they are, they're dungeons, that's how dungeons are, but why does every dungeon need to be full of similarly sized groups of evenly spaced enemies? Why can't they sometimes be empty dungeons? 
If these locations were real, surely there'd be at least some that were uninhabited, and it's not like a short break from combat would be such a travesty. Or why not have some dungeons that seem mostly empty, and have maybe just one or two combat encounters? This way the dungeon can build suspense, and then when combat does happen, it would be unexpected, which could- Because it would be mostly you just running through an empty space? How would you build suspense to lead up to that? Suspense doesn't build just by itself. There's things you have to do to cr try and create it. But does a dungeon need a reward? Why can't a dungeon simply be a part of the history of the region? I agree with that sentiment. Um, but this is obviously afraid. They think that if you do content, you deserve to be rewarded for it. So they always want to have something at the end. Um, so yeah. You could make a pretty cool combatless dungeon. Okay, you want an example of a combatless quest? Sheagorath's quest. So yeah, there you go. That's why that's why this idea doesn't work. Um Bethesda doesn't really have the again, they don't have the tools that they need to do this kind of like combatless sort of approach to things. The combat is literally the mechanics. Better traps, better traps could go a long way, sure. But that doesn't build suspense, it just annoys people. You'd have to look at like a the way a horror game does it and kind of explain that if you wanted to do your let's build suspense idea. I mean, you could do a dungeon that was like, and I, actually no, there is a dungeon that's like this where you're like fighting a wizard and you, you keep having like repeat encounters with him, and then you get him low and it happens. But that is actually like a like a Hagraven area. Yes, I am aware that there is combatless mechanic, there combatless stuff in Elder Scrolls, but sort of my point is, um, that this doesn't really have the aptitude to do stuff that doesn't revolve around combat. Like Blood on the Ice is super simple. Paranoia is not combatless though, because you're asked to kill people. Well, I mean, you, there is a non-combat route, but you. Most of the routes involve some level of fighting. Add lots of exposition. No, you need more mechanics. You need some like basic thing like, um, imagine there was like a fire starting mechanic where it was like using fire spells or using a torch, you could light stuff on fire. And then you made a dungeon about like lighting fireplaces that did something like th that's kind of the start of the, uh, that's the start of the idea. Skyrim doesn't have a lot of, like, passive mechanics for you to do things. And so it's like, I don't know, I would look at, like, the way Half-Life does things. Half-Life relies a lot on its physics to do stuff, but it does do stuff that isn't combat, fo ju or just combat focused. Uh, a Boneworks example. There's that one room in Boneworks where there's, like, a like anti-gravity stuff is leaking and you so you put barrels in the anti-gravity stuff and then you like you throw them on under a platform and it raises the platform up there's nothing even remotely close to that in skyrim it's, they, they just don't have the mechanical robustness to do any of that lighting fires like in the thieves guild quest well that's mostly just you can just like you can you press e and then a torch disappears off the sconce and you press E and a torch comes back. I mean like um you have a system where if there's an unlit torch on the wall you could hit it with a fire spell and it catches on fire or if there's like an unlit fireplace you can catch it on fire. That's not a mechanic that's a hard scripted feature. No, unless you're saying the torch thing. The torch thing is a hard scripted feature, but you can make a mechanic around that if you create stuff that, if you create stuff that like consistently catches on fire. Cause you know that like, 
Like in the Harry Potter game, you can light stuff on fire. That's scripted in the same way. No, just lighting torches to do stuff is like kind of generic dungeon design. I was thinking like, okay, why isn't there a dungeon where like, you have to do it with a follower. Like there's a follower at the door that wants you to do the dungeon with them. And like... The dungeon revolves around like they're in different like you're on a platform and you're like telling them where to go and they have to so it's like go over there and do this kind of deal i i think that could be a, like a dungeon idea that would work could work great in a dungeon with a more foreboding atmosphere or why can't there be some dungeons filled with non-hostile inhabitants why does every bandit have to attack your site anyways if they're all blood crazed psychopaths surely sometimes a bandit might respond to an unknown adventurer by just telling them to go away then you have aspects like that. Well, they do. But at the point at which you're inside the, the bandit area is uh, the point at which they're just going to assume hostility. I mean, I agree. There needs to be more stuff. Um, there needs to be more options to, like, peacefully interact with bandits. But yeah, sort of my point is... There's not enough mechanics in Elder Scrolls that they can use to really make dungeon. And so the end result is that the only thing that every person can do is interact with objects. Making players rely on dumb companion AI is just going to annoy them. I mean, it would be basic stuff. It would be like... Um, so, like, you go through a teleporter and you end up... It's like the... Um, the Shivering Isles dungeon, which uh, where you press the buttons, so you go through a teleporter and you get you end up getting like teleported to an area and the follower can't follow you, but like they shout up to you like, "Hey, you can see everything up there. Tell me what I need to do." And then it's like really basic stuff because you can just hold E on the follower, and then you can press E on an object and they'll interact with that object. It's not as like, it's not as like complex as you're making it out to be. So, like, one thing I've been thinking about is, so they blatantly admit that Bioshock is an inspiration for the Elder Scrolls V magic, right? Well, the thing is, Bioshock has a lot of situations where um, you need a plasmid to do something, and it's because Bioshock can reliably say you're going to have the fire plasmid at this point. Or that you are going to use the fire plasmid. Well, that was why my, my fire idea, my fire idea is um, somewhat universal because of torches. So it's not just like you need magic to do this puzzle. You can maybe, but the AI can always go haywire and start doing random shit. Not really. Not uh, like go do the Vermina quest where you go with a reindeer. A reindeer is a, is a follower AI that's really focused. Um, as long as the AI doesn't have, like, extra shit that's tied to them where it's like, Oh, it's 9 o'clock. Time for me to go do my uh, weekly dick flattening. Um, and, like, they're just created for the dungeon and they're just a follower. You can just point at the follower and go. Like, let's say... Let's say... Okay. So you got two rooms and you're on a balcony and you can see both rooms, but the AI can't see both rooms, right? And they have to do... And the way that you open the door to get the AI to the next room is they have to do one of those turning puzzles. But the solution to the turning puzzle is in room two, and the prompt for the turning puzzle is in room one. So you look in room two, and then you go to room one, and you go, turn the first pillar, and they turn it, and they're like, okay, it's on Wolf. You know, it's not really that... Um, I mean, I say it's not really that difficult. I wouldn't want I wouldn't want to be the guy who makes the puzzle. But to me, it seems like something that Bethesda could do with the tools on hand, is my point. Without adding new mechanics. 
What about enemies being present at other parts of the dungeon? I mean, that's not really that big a deal. That seems like the place to use the essential flag. Or it's just like... I'm not sure how you would do it. Like, you could have a thing where it's like... Um, they You have to instruct them on how to do a puzzle from the balcony. But, like, if they do it wrong, it, like, lets enemies into the room. But then it's like... Who gives a shit? I guess if you're a ranged character, you could support them. Like, that would be an incentive for, like, being ranged. The loot. I know loot tables are a thing in games, and they're not unique to Skyrim, but over the course of an average playthrough, you become so intimately familiar with Skyrim's loot tables for certain containers that you tend to know exactly what you'll find inside many things before you even open them, resulting in a level of predictability that's not just boring, it's immersion-breaking. And why is loot so evenly spaced out? Why did Sounds like a you thing. Does every location even have loot? Surely it would make sense for some locations to have already been looted. And then there are those big chests you get at the end of dungeons. Why do so many dungeons have these exact same large chests in the exact same location? I.e. the final room of the dungeon. And why do they always contain the best loot? Mm -hmm. And what about the dungeon structure? Most dungeons are linear, even if they try to visually disguise this. And for locations like forts, tombs, or Dwemer ruins... And it makes no sense because it's like, how is this livable? Um, I like, again, the Vermina one. So as you do the dungeon, you kind of unlock gates. And so when you look at the full layout of the structure, at least the upper floors, it actually kind of makes sense. And like that there's alternate wings you can go to because there's like, there's two ways to reach those wings, but then you get to the lower parts and it all falls to shit. So Why is this video game designed like a video game? But the thing is, most of Elder Scrolls is focused on like the um is focused on like explaining the the how and why. Like there's a farmer there's a farmer NPC who runs a farm and so you can uh, abs extrapolate that that's like how food is getting to the city, right? So you see all the NPCs that perform tasks and function are named and have lives and all that shit. But then you get to the dungeons and it's like, yeah, everybody just lived in like a, a hallway. <laughs> like a really long hallway. Alright. A linear structure wouldn't necessarily make sense. And then what about the shortcuts? Almost every sizable dungeon in this game has a shortcut at the end of it so the player can exit quickly. This addresses a problem Oblivion had, but are players meant to actually believe that almost every single location in this game was designed to have some hidden mechanism or pathway so as to form an incredibly convenient loop after about. someone has wandered to the end of them? Most of the Oblivion dungeons had some fast exit route, especially the alien ones. Yeah, the um the stupid Dwimmer shortcuts are always dumb because they're like elevators to the surface and it's like there's no possible fucking way that those aren't already open. I cannot be the first person in thousands of years to open the goddamn elevators of of Dwimmer ruins. Yeah, so like Vilverin, the first dungeon in Oblivion, is a circular design. I, I like secret exits more than I like circular dungeons. Like, I don't really mind that Bleak Falls Barrow has like a secret exit. It makes sense for some of those places to have them. The elevators are like... I don't know... Dwemer metal, Dwarven metal is like not the strongest material on Nern, so it seems like they would have been at least broken into. If there was more variety to what constitutes a dungeon in Skyrim, dungeons would be more interesting. Would they? Why not? 90% of Skyrim are bandits, not explorers and archaeologists. But we're talking about areas that have existed for thousands of years. 
The dwarves are one of the most enigmatic, enigmatic peoples that have been wanted to be understood, and there are continent-spanning magical organizations that are interested in doing research on these on these things. And you're telling me that not a single person in millions or not millions in thousands of years. Oh, I was like mixing up thousands and millennia. And not a single person in millennia has figured out to just uh, like prop a stick in the doorway. That's like the first thing you learn at the job is, oh shit, I'm going out for a smoke. I'm going to pop a, a pop a stick in the doorway to keep it so that it doesn't lock. Bandits are too dumb to solve Nord puzzles. They're stupid, but they're not that stupid. I mean, like you said, I'm pretty sure birds could figure out how to do it. Think about finding Blackreach for the first time. Discovering this massive underground cavern is one of Skyrim's strongest moments, and a big part of why its discovery is so effective is because it's unexpected, and that this location is unlike any other due to its bigger size and interconnected structure. This is Skyrim's dungeonry at its best, and yet this is a one-off. For the rest of the game, Skyrim... Do you think it's canon that, um, oh hey, someone finally gave me some money, I can finally change to the orc again, how it works. Is it, do I think it's canon that the Dragonborn went to every dungeon? Yes, I, because I think it's funny. Wrong. Birds are small enough to fit through the gaps and would not need to learn how to use the lever. Well, I'm not sure how they could work the the um, the claw puzzles because that seems like more weight than you know, like a crow could lift. By the way, how come Thieves Guild never tries to steal from Dwimmer Ruins? Well, that's the thing is it's not illegal in Skyrim as far as I'm aware. So it's like the Thieves Guild wouldn't even need to steal from Dwimmer Ruins. They would just need to like go to them and take stuff. Nobody owns it. Not anymore. Skyrim's dungeons establish and then conform to many of the same tropes of what a dungeon should be, and these tropes get overly repetitive in a game that is overflowing with dungeons. Worse than this though is how these tropes are clearly the result of the player's needs and desires, not what makes sense for the world. Dungeons are designed around the player in this game. That's why they all have evenly spaced enemy encounters, with evenly spaced loot, with the best loot at the end, and linear structures with incredibly convenient hidden shortcuts. The result is- Is the implication that Morrowind dungeons weren't designed around the player? Well, I guess that's true. Morrowind dungeons were more like, um what would be realistic or uh, like an ancestral tomb as an example you know most people aren't going crazy with their burial crypt designs they're just kind of you know places where you dump bodies that would require the thieves guild to actually have someone working yeah that's sort of the thing is like the thieves guild apparently is just full of fucking freeloaders who do a job like once a year. Skyrim is covered with crypts, but still use Halls of the Dead. Well, that's the weird thing. You would think the implication is that over the years, the cities had been moving around. And so it's like Bleak Falls Barrow at one point was like the Hall of the Dead for a city. And then like it got full. So the city moved to Whiterun or something. You think that would be the implication. But the actual implication is that Solitude, Windhelm, Dawnstar, Winterhold, all these places have existed for thousands of years. And I guess they just don't have issues with, like, cemetery space. Of course, that's always been one of my, like, real-life questions is, like, how come we don't run out of, like, places to bury people? I 
I'm not a Shotokan. I'm just flat. The halls are so small and the crypts are larger than all the cities. Well, yeah, that that's kind of the weird thing is... Is Skyrim just having, like, an increasing... Like... I've always taken the implication as, um... I've always taken the implication as, like... All of the Draugr are worshippers of the Dragon Priest, so that they're old, right? But they're also, like, apparently Grandma or something, so it's like... Is Skyrim just continually adding new and new and more and more and more Draugr to the pile? Does this Falkreef have the biggest cemetery in Skyrim and it's smaller than the community cemetery at the local church? Yeah, but the number of graves there is pretty big when you remember that everything's supposed to be relativistic, so it's like... Um, you know, each of those graves, I guess, represents, like, a thousand or something. The bloodiest beef in the reach. <laughs> this should be enough to buy an Argonian with. Sadly, it's not. We're still limited in selection. So now then, we have to go up to the next girl. Oh, see, this is the issue. Dwemer girl is high maintenance. Um, like, she takes special setting up. Like, it's more than just switching the avatar. I also got to change the opacity. So it's like... More work. Maybe that's why there's a Draugr in Blood Moon. Well, there were dragon priests on Solstheim, apparently, so... Who, who you got 38 dislikes on this one? We were talking about dislikes earlier. So, um, because again, uh, the dislikes went away from me on this video. And um, so it's only like a matter of time before the dislikes go away on the streams. So I think that's why we're getting more dislikes. Plus, I think Never, no, Never might have worse fans than Salt Factory. <laughs> Because, like, uh, if I look at the streams. Oh, damn. I don't have the studio open. I just have the live stream prompt open. If I look at the stream list. So it's like the Salt Factory stream is at 92%. The first Never Knows stream was got down to, like, 88%. So... I think it's a situation where, like, once the dislike news came out, I started getting more than usual. But at the same time, that could just be, like, the Salt fans were, like, finding it. But they didn't dislike... they, Because there was a stream between Salt Factory and Ever Knows Best, and they left that alone. And that was the one where we watched G-Man. Uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that because we did have a lot of like. Salt Factory's fans were active in the chat. Never knows best fans are just kind of like hit and run. That seems to be the uh, what I'm taking away here. These dungeons don't feel very real. They don't seem like naturally occurring locations that the player just happens to stumble into. They seem. I agree with this. It's just um. What can you do? My what can you do is what would you do? If you can design a perk system in your sleep, then surely you have, like, at least one good idea in the back pocket for, like, an interesting dungeon that you could do, right? Or, like, you could just pick up the creation kit and, like, try to make something. I guess, I don't know, there's a chance that you might... Because when you make something with the creation kit, you're, like, burying your soul. You're putting something out there that, um... I'm sorry, there's only one male avatar. I'm gonna, I'm gonna... You're gonna see... Oh no, is, is, uh... Am I a ghost? No.
I need more avatars for this kind of gimmick to work. How are the IRL dungeons? Um, don't they have those in like Louisiana or something? All right, let's go. Seem like purposefully created levels that exist to cater to the requirements of a video game. These games are meant to be about creating a world players can believe in, but dungeons are the building blocks of this world and they don't seem very believable. And dungeons aren't just a part of this world like they once were in Morrowind, they're the focus of it. Almost every quest in Skyrim revolves around the basic structure of sending the player to a dungeon. This started to be true in Oblivion, which was a shift- Wait, wait, wait. Did I just like have a stroke? Almost every quest in Skyrim revolves around the basic structure of sending the player to a dungeon. So it's like, he's got this five second shot of this quest. But he's like, if you can see, he's zooming in on it. It's where in Morrowind, they're the focus of it. Almost every quest in Skyrim revolves around the basic structure of sending the player to a dungeon. This started to be true in Oblivion. Like, why? That's like a minor editing thing, but I'm just kind of curious. Like that, oh shit, that caught my attention more than, um... Than whatever he was saying. Seem very believable. And dungeons aren't just a part of this world like they once were in Morrowind, they're the focus of it. Almost every quest in Skyrim revolves around the basic structure of sending the player to a dungeon. This started to be. Eighty five percent. I'll say that. I guess it's just fancy. Well, it's like, okay, so there's this insecurity that, like, if you show a still audience, or, shit, that's embarrassing. If you show a still image to a bunch of people, and you don't, like, have it moving around, then it, like, it's boring to people. So it's like, there, some people, some content creators have this, like, urge where it's like, if we're seeing a still image, then there's got to be something going on. So it's like, it's like over like let's say it's just gradually zooming in or maybe like what they'll do is um they'll like center it like this and then like they'll have like a blurred background of like fireworks going off on the background so like that there's some movement in the image <laughs> yeah i figured you guys would like this one um So it's like there's insecurity about it being a boring shot so if we're gonna have five seconds of a still image then there needs to be a little bit of movement so that your audience doesn't get bored but it's like that's a really bad thing to kind of do when you're making a video about how cynical the dungeon design in skyrim is because that's like that's the video equivalent of that is Oh no, my audience might get bored, so I better like move the fucking frame around so that they they don't get bored. Are you guys not bored? in Oblivion, which was a shift I theorized was in response to the inclusion of quest markers that removed much of the core challenge of Morrowind's quests, and meant dungeons became the go-to substitute for giving players something to do. But Skyrim is even more dungeon-focused than Oblivion, with almost every major quest in this game sending you to one of these places. In Oblivion, there were multiple lengthy side quests that took place entirely in a city. Okay, you say paranoia, I say blood on the ice. Do we want to play this game? Every quest he shows that has nothing to do with combat in Oblivion, I'm going to say a quest that has nothing to do with combat in Skyrim. Such as Paranoia in Skingrad, or Canvas the Castle in Goral. Sheagorath Quest. Uh, let me try, let me think of one preemptively before we continue. Uh, the Ebony Blade Quest. Or, or Two Sides of a Coin. In yeah, the Ebony Blade Quest is one that has no combat. Um... There's the Narfi quest, where you figure out um, what happened to his sister. In Bruma, there were also multiple faction quest lines that had long stretches of- Oh, no, well, I got more than you, so. <laughs> the Thieves Guild first quest where you intimidate shopkeepers. I, well, one of the ways to do that is you fist fight them. 
but yeah, there's a way to do it without combat. And I guess if you count the Thieves Guild quests where you're not allowed to kill people, like Golden Glow, although apparently you are allowed to kill people, but like, bear with me here, because I always did Golden Glow non-lethally, um, that's a quest that doesn't involve really going to a dungeon. A new hand touches the beacon. That's a total... That's a dungeon. That's a dungeon quest. What about Sanguine's quest? Yeah. I mean, Sanguine's quest if you can pass all the persuasion checks. ...of dungeon-free questing, like the Dark Brotherhoods and the Thieves' Guild. And some of Oblivion's best quests feature no dungeons, which might actually have had a lot to do with why they were the best. Okay, so if we're counting Dark Brotherhood and Thieves' Guild quests in that, where you you can fight people, but it there's not a dungeon. Um, Vittoria Vici assassination. The Emperor assassination. The second Emperor assassination. Brynjolf's initiation. I wouldn't say, no, I wouldn't say, well, I guess there are a lot of ways to do Sanguine's quests, but I think it, it's not as interesting, like, a premise. You can't, like, like, it, like, it with paranoia, you can control, like, who he's paranoid against, or, like, if he's paranoid against you, you can indulge him or go against him. There's a lot of ways to do paranoia. Um, there's not a lot of, like, ways to really influence the outcome of the Sanguine quest. Even though there's options at each step. Yeah, in fairness, let's not let's not count the quests that are just you being a FedEx delivery driver for somebody that is. Because there's a decent number of take X to Y quests. But even then, we've listed more examples, which was kind of the goal. Doesn't the Sand Queen quest end in a dungeon with some mages? I guess, okay, yeah, that's true. You do have to do, like, the first two rooms of a dungeon. So I guess that one does involve combat. You know what? Never mind. Never mind that one, uh, but just count all the others anyways. Skilled. And some of Oblivion's best quests feature no dungeons, which might actually have had a lot to do with why they were the best. By contrast, I went through a list of every single side quest in Skyrim, and while there are several minor side quests that don't feature dungeons of the find 10 bear pelts or deliver a message to this person variety, for lengthy side quests, I could only find three that take place entirely outside a dungeon. Bloods on the Ice, the Forsworn Conspiracy, and the Book of Love. Forsworn Conspiracy has a dungeon, does it not? No one escapes Sidna mine literally sends you to the town dungeon. <laughs> and just like in Oblivion, these are some of the better side quests in the game, which surely isn't a coincidence. So Skyrim has improved its gameplay. What was the third one? The love one? I haven't done that side quest. Real dungeon literalist hours. It's true. Uh, we called that dungeon conservatism. And then I'm dungeon liberal. But okay, is Escape from Sydna Mine one of the best quests in the game if you don't count the second part? They loop in numerous small ways, such as providing more rewards and adding shortcuts, and it's also improved the visuals of its dungeons. But the actual gameplay of dungeons remains as shallow as ever. 
Moloch Ball's quest is done outside no dungeon. No, the guy's kept at the end of a dungeon. It's like the end of a random Forsworn dungeon. You'll find him. Isn't Escape from Sidna Mine, though, where you actually get to talk to the leader of the Forsworn? And the way dungeons dominate the quest design leaves quests feeling less interesting. Even worse though is how the vast quantity of dungeons leads to a diminished sense of immersion as the world is left seeming like it revolves around dungeons and the dungeons are left seeming like they revolve around the player's needs. This doesn't mean Skyrim is bad, it's gameplay- <laughs> Okay, that's a- that's a weird kind of clarification. Skyrim is too focused on its dungeons, its dungeons are too focused on its players, and we've spent the last, like, 15 minutes talking about this. But that doesn't mean Skyrim is bad. Play loop still works, its effectiveness has been proven by the game's critical reception, its sales, and its ability to keep players coming- Okay, so, the, like, okay, so we've listened to 52 minutes of you criticize Skyrim, and- um, you're just wrong, because they were successful. What the fuck? He literally will set up a point, and then immediately, like, kick the legs out from under it. He's done this multiple times in this video. He said, he, like, again, he sets it up, he's building the foundation of this house that is a Skyrim analysis, and then, like, he fires a rocket at it and blows it up. I'm a big kid now. Yeah, this is like, um, this is radical centrism. We are the anti-opinion party. Something can succeed despite being bad. Well, yeah, that's kind of the thing is, um... No, the Oblivion video, I think, was an hour and a half, too. No, um... I kind of touched on this, like... Yeah, it's successful. We all know this. But that doesn't mean it's good. Like, we're working from the baseline of, like... Yeah, Skyrim is one of the most successful games of all time. So obviously, they're doing something right. That said, it's still fair to criticize them. That's assumed when you walk in the door. I do have objectively right opinions. What are you talking about? You talk like somebody who's been ass blasted that uh, we're talking about never knows best now. It was fine when it was Dime Tree, and it was fine when it was Avarti, and it was fine when it was Arlo. But now, now it's your guy. Back to it years later. But this overwhelming focus on dungeons ignores the game's greatest asset, its world. And this gameplay loop ignores the series' most appealing factor, exploration. So, let's talk about those things. So now we're really in part four. It's true. Um, what's the what's the most popular song in the, in America right now? U.S. Top 100 Music. The Hot 100. Easy on Me by Adele. Oh, I'm sure that's a wonderful song. We got Stay by The Kid, Lay Roy, and Justin Bieber. That's number two. Number three, Industry Baby by Little Nas X and Jack Harlow. Number four, Ed Sheeran popping in with Bad Habits. Number five, Ed Sheeran again with Shivers. This is popular stuff. This is, it, it, this is successful. That means it's good music. All of that is good music. Let's go Brandon. I think was up there for a bit. <laughs> That was a song. 
I had no clue what was going on with that. I'm an out of touch boomer. I'm an old man now. I feel bad about it, but then I remember that I can like I can rent cars. My favorite location in Skyrim is Nightgate Inn. Nothing interesting happens here. You do have a reason to come here during one Dark Brotherhood quest, but otherwise this place is frankly unimportant. It's located in a remote section of the Pale. There are only a couple of inhabitants, which makes sense considering its remoteness. The interior is the same as most other inns in Skyrim, which has always seemed a shame to me as while this interior design looks good and captures the cultural and tonal feel of the region, inns and taverns seem like such important parts of this world that I've always thought they deserved a few more variants to their layouts. Yeah, they're like prefabricated. Still, none of this has anything to do with why I like this place. I remember when I first found this inn, back in 2011. I was still near the start of my playthrough, still a newcomer to the land of Skyrim. I'd just arrived at Windhelm for the first time, having went there for some forgotten quest-related business, but rather than head inside the city, I was struck with the urge to look around outside. So, I did. And I ended up following- Because I didn't want to associate with racist, criminal, Noah Caldwell Gervais. I mean, Ulfric Stormcloak. Yeah, you guys don't actually know this, but Noah Caldwell Gervais' playthrough of Skyrim was so infamous for the uh, the horrific things he would do to non-Nords that uh, they actually added him to the game as a character in the Dawnguard DLC. So Ulfric Stormcloak was like, he was a way different character before um, Dawnguard when they changed him. In the river running west out of a desire to see where it would take me. Nightgate Inn was what I eventually found. The surroundings are quite beautiful here. Really, a lot of Skyrim is. The visual design of their overworlds has for a long time been Bethesda's greatest strength, and Skyrim might be their crowning achievement. Almost everywhere you go in this game, you'll be greeted to stunning vistas that manage to have enough realism to seem believable, yet- I didn't really care for Noah's video, but a lot of people will claim that it was like one of the best that we saw. Although, again, that's a really, a really low bar. enough grandeur and style to be able to consistently impress. So maybe Nightgate Inn is nothing out of the ordinary in this regard, but to me there's still something about it. Maybe it's the remoteness. On almost That sounds like a skill issue. <laughs> I mean, I like this area, sure. Just all sides, you're surrounded by mountains here, almost like the place is being closed in or hidden away from the rest of the world. The closest settlement is not very close at all, and it's hard to imagine there are many travelers to pass through. The snow seems to fall heavy. I mean, it's the main road between... Windhelm and Dawnstar, so got that going for it. What's my favorite video so far? G-Man. Again, that's how um, that's how shocking it is, and I'm glad that we had private sessions on here to say that like he was surprised too by um, how things have been turning out. And you'd imagine life must be hard here, even if this world wasn't full of bandits and bears and trolls and such. And yet here, amidst the cold and the danger, is this inn, sitting here warm and inviting, defiant against its surroundings, offering shelter and safe harbor to the lost, the brave, and the foolish. Something about this place- I just like it because it's the only place you can stop when you have any kind of like survival mod on in the pale. Speaks to my imagination. It has done since I first stumbled into it. I can't help but wonder what stories this inn has to tell, what life would be- Okay, this is like- We've said this. A couple times already now. Yes, we get it. The inn is mysterious, and it's cool, and it's mystical, and it's wondrous, and it's amazing, and it's awe-inspiring, and it's awesome, and it's beautiful, and it's pretty, and it's cute, and it's kawaii, and it's sundary. <laughs> it's like, come on! What's your point here? Skyrim has beautiful stuff in its world. like here, and how hard would it really be to keep this inn going? This place seems rather sad to me. Its tranquility is almost idyllic, but it's hard not to imagine that in the long term it's likely doomed. I mean, the owner admits- I can read into this for literally anything. I can do this for literally anything. Let's look it up. Let's, let's go. Let's go. 
ESP. Oblivion. Um, places. And... Uh, let's see. All right, so we need a random number between 1 and 36. Random number generator gives me a 9. 9 is the Drunken Dragon Inn. All right, let me just get a look at where this is. And let me just pop up an image here. And okay. All right. This inn. This is the Drunken Dragon Inn. It's east of the Yellow Road, northeast of Leowin. It's run by the publican, Andreas Draconis, an Ibedes man who will buy potions and food, but will only sell the latter. No one knows what he buys potions for. The ground floor contains a reception area consisting of a counter and a dining room. On the lower level is a small room which serves as storage and contains large amounts of food and drink, while the rooms are upstairs. It's located near several interesting points, like Adatar, the Haunted Mine, the Magnus Stone, the Way Shrine of Dabella, and Nernrit. The room that you can rent is the last on the right. It's well lit and contains a writing desk, a chest of drawers, and a middle-class single bed. Both of the other two rooms are locked and contain a single bed, which you're free to sleep in, as entering does not count as trespassing. One has to wonder, then, how the publican makes money when he freely offers his beds for sale. Is it his illegal potion-running operation that he's selling secretly to the bandits who live nearby? One has to wonder why his inn had not been robbed. He's in a problematic part of Cyrodiil, living in the Blackwood, the border near Blackreach. One can imagine that most would stick to the road to the west of the river, as that one leads to Breville, rather than the road on the east, which leads the long route to Shadenhall. There you go. I did it for a random inn in Oblivion. You can literally read into anything and um, do that kind of stuff. What's next? I think it's Dunmer Girl. All right. What's your point? My point is that you can literally read into anything. We've literally spent three minutes or so. How long has he spent talking about this place? All right, so he's been talking about this place since 55 minutes. We're now 70 seconds into this bit where he said nothing about the Night Gate Inn other than it's peaceful, it's tranquil, and he's like reading into like the economic implications of this place. I'm just curious how much longer this goes. Like, he's still talking about it. it for, in 30 seconds from now, he's still going to be talking about this end. But that's sort of my point, is I used a random number generator to pick an end off a list and uh, did the exact same thing. So it's like, either he's wrong and it's actually true of most ends he's not allowed to. Jesus Christ, you're missing the point here. You can do it. For any inn in any of the games. Okay? Skyrim, UESP. Places, inns. Oh, these aren't numbered. How many inns are there? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Get a random number 1 and 18. I didn't know there was half as many inns. It gives us seven. Seventh inn is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's the night gate inn. Oh. <laughs> the random inn I got was the same fucking inn that he did. God damn it. Thirteen. Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. The wretching netch. The wretching netch. A sad place in Solstheim. A con an island long abandoned by the Empire and ravaged by the destruction of Vardenfell. It tells a somber story about... You, you see what I can do? 
I can literally, like, this is all technically true, but it's like, I can do that for the Retchy Netch. Let's, uh, let's, let's switch things up a bit. Let's go to Morrowind. Or, you know what? You know what? You know what? You know what? Well, I don't know of a good way to find it, but, like, I could pick a random place from a game and do it, too. From other games. But, okay, let's look. Morrowind places doesn't really have inns. Damn, there's no, like, itemized list of inns for Morrowind. All right. I'm just going to scroll random and stop. Okay, so I'm I'm on Moon Moth Legion Fort. Moon Moth Legion Fort is located to the east of Balmora. It sits in the shadow of a dwarven ruin, its mystery often attracting bandits, highwaymen, and the desperate of society. The Empire has sought to illegalize dwarven ruins to stop such foolish people from going in there. The Moon Moth Legion Fort represents the legion that is defending southwestern Morrowind, or southwestern Vardenfell. You know, it's like... My point is... That if you're disingenuous enough, you can do this about literally anything. Which means there's nothing really special about Nightgate Inn other than his subjective connection to it. And you might be thinking, well, isn't he allowed to include his subjective connection? Sure, he's even allowed to spend two minutes on it, but what's the point As I understand it, his point here is that this is something that's special to Skyrim. And I just demonstrated you can do it with Oblivion pretty easily. You can do it with Morrowind. You can do it with other inns in Skyrim. Prepare to Cry, the story of the Drunken Dragon. All right, let's uh, let's really sink in what he's what he's going for here, and I'm gonna give you the full experience. We were on 1.75 times speed. We're going down to normal speed. Okay, you're about to listen to a man talk about an inn for two minutes. This is what you want. This is what the Never Knows Best fans want. So I'm gonna sit back. I got some food here. I'm gonna eat it. We're gonna listen to him talk about this inn for a while. And uh, I'm going to show you. So maybe Nightgate Inn is nothing out of the ordinary. Oh, that's not regard, even the. But oh, that's not even the start. Hang on, where does it actually start? Oh, so it's even longer. There we go. So it's like it's long. It's not two minutes. It's like five minutes. My favorite location in Skyrim is Nightgate Inn. Nothing interesting happens here. You do have a reason to come here during one Dark Brotherhood quest, but otherwise this place is frankly unimportant. It's located in a remote section of the Pale. There are only a couple of inhabitants, which makes sense considering its remoteness. The interior is the same as most other inns in Skyrim, which has always seemed a shame to me as while this interior design looks good, and captures the cultural and tonal feel of the region, inns and taverns seem like such important parts of this world that I've always thought they deserved a few more variants to their layouts. Still, none of this has anything to do with why I like this place. I remember when I first found this inn, back in 2011. I was still near the start of my playthrough, still a newcomer to the land of Skyrim. I'd just arrived at Windhelm for the first time, having went there for some forgotten quest-related business, but rather than head inside the city, I was struck with the urge to look around outside, so I did, and I ended up following the river running west out of a desire to see where it would take me. Nightgate Inn was what I eventually found. The surroundings are quite beautiful here. Really, a lot of Skyrim is. The visual design of their overworlds has for a long time been Bethesda's greatest strength, and Skyrim might be their crowning achievement. Almost everywhere you go in this game, you'll be greeted to stunning vistas that manage to have enough realism to seem believable, yet enough grandeur and style to be able to consistently impress. So, maybe Nightgate Inn is nothing out of the ordinary in this regard, but to me there's still something about it. Maybe it's the remoteness. 
on almost all sides you're surrounded by mountains here, almost like the place is being closed in or hidden away from the rest of the world. The closest settlement is not very close at all, and it's hard to imagine there are many travellers that pass through. The snow seems to fall heavy, and you'd imagine life must be hard here even if this world wasn't full of bandits and bears and trolls and such. And yet, here, amidst the cold and the danger, is this inn, sitting here warm and inviting, defiant against its surroundings, offering shelter and safe harbour to the lost, the brave and the foolish. Something about this place speaks to my imagination. It has done since I first stumbled into it. I can't help but wonder what stories this inn has to tell, what life would be like here, and how hard would it really be to keep this inn going? This place seems rather sad to me. Its tranquility is almost idyllic, but it's hard not to imagine that in the long term it's likely doomed. I mean, the owner admits there's almost no traffic through here anymore, and in a dangerous world with conditions this harsh, it feels like one bad winter would be all it takes to bring about its end. But then again, it must have survived okay so far. I love Nightgate Inn. Really, it's not special in any way, but that makes it feel more real to me. It's just a part of this world, and it's okay that it doesn't have a story to tell the player, because not every place needs something for the player, and sometimes your imagination tells a more interesting tale anyway. Most of Skyrim... Alright. So, the full runtime there was about four minutes. There you go, that's the full context. You happy? Is that what you wanted? To hear him give the full context at normal speed? Do you see my point? You can do it about anything. You can read into literally anything. So the question is, why does it apply to Skyrim, but not Oblivion? And that was the whole point of us doing the Drunken Dragon bit, is... Why is Skyrim the special one? No, he's over dungeons. He's talking about the world now. So, yeah. I mean, you can... Look, I get it. Okay, you want to make the point, um, this place is special to me. Got it. You don't really have to elaborate on why it, why it's special to you, just... or I mean, you can, but you can do it in faster ways. You can just be like, you know, it's a somber place that makes me feel certain emotions every time I visit it, and I have a degree of nostalgic influence by it. That was like 30 seconds. And you, you can go the extra mile and say that it has all that, but then I would expect you to also kind of give that rope to Oblivion. Because Oblivion has a lot of the same stuff. I mean, like, literally the end of Ill Omen is similar in the sense that um, it has kind of that same context. And, like, it's a Dark Brotherhood place, you know, it's it's a quiet place, it's somber and all that. I apologize if I damage your speakers with Angry Joe. I don't want the last... I'm, I'm about to spook some people. I don't want the last thing that your speakers to play to be... Uh, I'm real. Um, old Angry Joe.
All right, we're gonna play Angry Joe, but it's gonna be like subdued Angry Joe. Is a full highest rating that I can issue, 10 out of 10, and it easily earns the badass seal of approval. I just like the energy he brings. I don't know. I've we've listened to it like a hundred times now. I'm starting to get Stockholm syndrome, and I think Angry Joe uh, is underrated. He's saying that that particular place has good environmental storytelling, whereas a lot of places don't. The Drunken Dragon Inn is an inn east of the Yellow Road, northeast of Leo Inn. The publican, Andreas Dracar Draconis, buys potions and food while only selling the latter. One can speculate about the uh, Come on. Room doesn't feel like this. Maybe your imagination is greater than mine, and everywhere you go, the act of just seeing places is enough to satisfy you. But for most, I imagine that. Really? Ah! Really? Come on. So, like, that's basically it. Like, again, you just spent four minutes setting this point up. And now he's kicked the legs out from under it again. Here, we're going to have to... We're going to have to mix it. I can't keep switching to Avatar so frequently. We're going to have to, like, do a... Um, do a mix of the images and uh, avatar switching. Eh, I, I don't have a good place for it. Now you can't, like, you can't tell. It'll just be, a, like, to everybody who joins, it'll be a Paul Harrell image. But you guys will know. You guys will know full well that um, it's a lot more than that. There you go. I think once once that fills up, we'll we'll start alternating, um, switching the VTuber and switching the images. That particular GIF bothers people. <laughs> It's really weird how, you know, she's just like, um, she's just doing a dance, you know? All right. That isn't all it takes. Seeing the world is nice and the first to have crafted a world's worth seeing, but even a good looking game needs something more to be fulfilling. There needs to be interaction or engagement, decisions to be made or danger to be faced, rewards to be found or secrets to uncover. There needs to be something. As it is currently, all exploration in Skyrim involves is seeing an icon on your compass and heading in its direction in order to gain a pop-up message and sound effect telling you that this place is discovered before you then head off to the next grayed-out icon to repeat the process until you feel it's time to get back on the track of following your quest marker. That's a you thing. Like, again, uh, who was it? Um... Who was the guy that had all the cringe in his video? I, I can just look it up. Cringe compilation... Can't find current compilation. But up. Can't find cringe. Did I not make a note for the cringe compilation? Alright. Um But it was the guy who um, went to join the Imperial Legion and uh, 
like kept getting stopped along the way by like because he was like doing dungeons and then he like he would play some cringy music while he did the dungeon so it's like the way he plays the game is oh i found this dungeon i'm gonna do it so it's just kind of a you thing Traveling in this world requires little by way of planning. Navigation poses no challenge, enemies you encounter soon become familiar, and there's little by way of reward for one who does wander off the beaten path or take the road less traveled. And that's assuming you don't just fast travel all game, which you could hardly blame players for doing as Skyrim doesn't provide any incentive not to do this. When it comes to exploration, the only thing Skyrim has going for it is visuals, but visuals should be there to support everything else, rather than being relied on as the main driving force. There are rare examples where Skyrim does live up to its explorative potential. Frostflow Lighthouse is located on Skyrim's northern coast. Most locations you find have a specific type, like camp, cave, standing stone, settlement, and so on, but there are only two lighthouses in the game, with the other belonging to Solitude. Yeah, but that the, that lighthouse is just a fort. That's called the lighthouse. Which means this lonely building just seems like it should be important. This will likely be enough to make- Well, remember, you have to- He has established, as a rule of the video, that you have to assume that everything he's saying is going to be- um, something that he will later subvert and say, but I don't actually think that, or I don't think that makes Skyrim a bad game, or I don't think it's as insidious as that, or I don't think gameplay loops are something you should never use, you know. Make the player want to check it out after seeing its unusual icon on their compass. When you do get inside though, you'll be greeted by a blood splattered corpse. On the deceased is a journal which gives some indication of what went wrong here, but it's only after you search for Lighthouse and find the other family members' journals that you start to get the full picture of a family that moved into their dream house, only to slowly discover that they might not be as alone in their new home as they once thought. Through this, you'll also be given clues to the location of a key hidden on the fireplace, which will unlock the door to the cellar, where you find a tunnel leading to a Chorus cave, which will allow you to take vengeance on the creatures responsible for the family's murder, and find the rest of the unlucky family's remains. This quest I mean, this is going to be the same criticism. You can do this with any dungeon. In any of the games. Quest is one of the best in the game because it's driven by exploration. You're not led to this location by a quest marker. It's your curiosity that leads you to check it out and gets you to step inside, which makes what you find within more meaningful. You can say that about literally any dungeon in the game. He's now he's just channeling his salt factory. Kind of, yeah. Then the next step is once more left up to the player, as it requires you to explore the inside of the lighthouse and read the journals to find the key, which feels more engaging than most quests, as the player is required to figure the objective out for themselves. Oh man, I've got a bundle of content that you will really enjoy. If you like if you like uh, quests that rely on journals to tell you the story, oh boy, do I have a bundle of content to sell you for $20. All you gotta do is load up Skyrim Anniversary Edition. Finally, the last part of the quest could just be another dungeon, but the context for why you're here makes it a lot more than that. Frostflow Lighthouse rewards player curiosity, with the prize being the story of what happened here, and as stories go, it's not a bad one. It's told mostly through the environment, but it's still effective. And Bethesda often seem more comfortable telling tales this way anyway. And so this location proves that exploration can- You would probably really like Fallout 4. <laughs> and work in Skyrim. No, he's reviewing special edition. I Anniversary edition hadn't been announced when this video came out. And that quests might sometimes be more effective when the designers are willing to take a step back from holding the player's hand to let them discover both the quest and its objectives by themselves. This example isn't typical, however. Generally, there's no reason to enter locations you discover if you don't have a quest telling you to do so. Early in my most recent play Wouldn't that extend to the lighthouse? I just kind of ignore it. I've never- well, I've done the lighthouse quest before, but that was be that was on a Frostfall playthrough where I needed someone to- That's sort of the way that, like, survival encourages exploration of random dungeons is you have to stop at dungeons a lot in order to kind of warm up, or, or otherwise you have to make a campfire and there's, like, extra work involved with that. So... Uh, the only reason I ever did the lighthouse quest was because 
of uh, Frostfall. The fuck is that? I learn about new features every day. I don't know what you did, but you have a bird that says cool. Also, through a survey I ran a few months ago, people want dungeons to tell their own self-contained story over them being connected to the overall world of the game. I can agree with that action, yeah. Play through. I found a cave called Lost. Okay, but if you pick a sticker, are you still allowed to send a message? Knife hideout. Outside were two charred and impaled corpses, which was enough to stir my curiosity. Uh, th that's outside like every necromancer dungeon in Skyrim and Oblivion. Like, really? This is enough to pique your curiosity? Well, then you should like, like, 25% of the dungeons in Skyrim. I hadn't even thought about that being a benefit of survival. Yeah, so, like, well, I wouldn't say the survival mode, but of um, Frostfall, which works a lot better than the survival mode. Yeah, um, there's a lot of, like, so, like, the only reason I stopped at Nightgate Inn because there's no reason to really use the services of inns, is that, well, I need to stay warm, and it's cheaper to stay at an inn than it is to, well, cheaper, it's free, but uh, it's less effort to spend the night at an inn for 10 gold than it is to, like, set up the tent and get the fire going. and um, So, you like, you're incentivized to stop at inns or, like, hang out at dungeons um, to sleep or what have you. It's a pretty neat... Um, it's an interesting way to play Skyrim. And uh, I think that was like Private Sessions was talking about, like that was his point with his Skyrim video was that when he added those elements, he found the game to be a lot more fun. Is it a positive or negative hue that dungeons telegraph the enemies inside based on the decorations outside the entrance? I would say probably a positive. Um, I never really like look at it and go, damn, that's a conjurer dungeon. I probably won't like it. Um, I, ju I just like, <sighs> it makes sense to me that you would decorate the outside of your dungeon. Because you don't want people like going into the cave, not knowing that like there's fucked up shit going on in there, right? Because part of it is you just want to like keep explorers out. I mean, surely you only need to burn or impale someone. Who does both? That's just extra work. I decided I had to meet the one responsible and find that answer myself, so I went inside, where I found... Bandits. There's no story to this location. There aren't any journals. The bandits don't speak. There isn't anything interesting to discover inside, and there's not even a connection to the corpses outside. It's just normal bandits in a normal cave, which is, unfortunately, a rather normal thing to find in Skyrim. What the fuck? Researching this location afterwards revealed that this is a possible setting for six different quest objectives that use random generation to determine their exact location, but as I hadn't generated a quest for this location yet, there was nothing for me to do here. The reward for being curious was 23 minutes of my time wasted, killing generic enemies in a generic placeholder location. This experience felt like the game was trying to teach me not to go to a location I don't have a reason to go to, and after enough repeat scenarios, even slow learn- I don't know, that's one of those things where it's like, you sought out the information that spoiled it for you. So, like, the experience is ruined for you because you found out that a bunch of radiant dungeons are set in that location. But you only found that out because you looked it up. I'm not saying you can't look stuff up, but, I mean, let's be honest. You wouldn't have seen the seams unless you specifically started looking for them. If it's not quest related, shouldn't the bad guys be generic? Well, yeah, that's sort of the philosophy is um, if you do a dungeon ahead of when you're supposed to, in quotes, um, for like a faction, then yeah, there will usually be generic enemies. I think like Elaine Dufont is the exception. Some bandits just want to do bandit shit. I do wish... I'd like the bandits to be... I want them to take inspiration from like... Um, Middle Earth, the Middle Earth games with like the dynamic sort of orc 
uh, social system. I think that would be cool for uh, them to do, for them to try and like put their spin on with bandits. We're still a VTuber because it bothers people. I thought about like, I always th like at least once a year, I always have like a big temptation to do a Middle Earth video. And then I, I like have to resist the urge. And I know that there's some people out there who are like, why are you resisting the urge? That would be a cool video. Um, it would just be a, like a lot of time investment to make that video. But it is something I want to do one day. Owners will likely pick that message up. In ways like this, Skyrim's quest design discourages exploration, leaving the only exploring you do in this game being walking to places, unlocking them as fast travel destinations, and briefly checking out what they look like from the outside. Oh, oh shit. Sounds like a skill issue to me. Until it gets to the point that bandits outnumber actual citizens to the one. There's interesting things you can do with that, though. Like, um, let's do a little bit of reading into it, shall we? So, if there's more bandits than common people, one, th one conclusion you could come to is that there simply isn't enough real estate for people to live in in the cities. There's not enough good jobs, like good honest labor for people to do. Um, and the, like, bounty system is just too punishing. Because if you think about it, okay, so, um, what's the bounty for assault in Skyrim? 40 gold, right? 40 gold seems like a lot of money. Um, typically when you loot the bandits, they don't have 40 gold. So, Skyrim's legal system seems to be contributing in a big, in a big way to there being such a rampant crime issue. So it's like, um, you could sell the idea of, like, there being so many bandits if you actually do stuff with the idea. Are you implying that the player character is genociding citizens? Yeah. It's still... That's the thing is... Uh, we've been joking about that, but like... It should still be fucked up to murder people. Because those guys talk about like their families and... They're like, yeah... My dad was like, I should go to college and use my sparts. But I wasn't smart enough to know which college to go to. Like... The sawmills have automated all the jobs out of Skyrim. Uh, well, yeah, it's those um, those foreign globalists that are coming in and putting honest Nords out of work. <laughs> what about guards basically outnumbering civilians? It would be necessary in a, in a country where you know, half or two-thirds of the population are criminals. Yeah, I know. I like the way this cat dances. It's like, um... You know, you don't typically expect a, can't, a cat to do, like, a like a two-legged dance. It's like, um... Like, she raises one leg up, and it's like a knee in the air, and then, like, she brings it down, pivots her hips, and then raises the other leg up in the opposite way, and that's, like, what she's doing on repeat. It's a pretty... It's like, uh, river dancing. Slides before moving on to the next icon on the compass. Sometimes, like with Nightgate Inn, that's enough. Skyrim's visual design can be so effective. Sometimes it's enough, but okay. But just witnessing some of its locations is all that's needed to make the player care about this world and to make them interested in traversing it. Most of the time, however, this isn't enough, and Skyrim's exploration is left feeling empty. How do you make a cave entrance look appealing? What What's your take on that? What is a what is a uh, attractive cave entrance look like? Another spin could be to reframe some bandits as independent clans that don't submit to the High King, kind of like the Forsworn. Well, yeah, occasionally you run into uh, bandit groups that are like all orcs. So, like the implication is they're another orc tribe, but they're like a lawless orc tribe. I like how the cat incorporates tail movement into the dance. Yeah, it's pretty, it's an impressive uh, display. 
This is a beautiful, well-realized, captivating world that's drowning in missed opportunities and wasted potential. Ironically, the only regular exceptions to this I found were the shacks. If you were to judge a location type by its name, this might be surprising, as compared to forts, dwarven ruins, or dragon lairs, shacks sound like they're at a disadvantage. However, due to their small size, these locations are almost guaranteed to not be dungeons, meaning if a designer gave them a purpose, it was likely a narrative one. Okay, dungeon conservative. The janitors who work for no compensation artificially suppress wages for honest work in Skyrim. It's true. If the if the janitors would just get together and demand a, a wage, so that they could be wages like the rest of us. Attractive cave entrance is tomboyish with wide, childbearing openings. Yeah. Well, you know, a lot of people go through those openings. Not every shack comes with a worthwhile story, and nor should they, but some shack-related highlights include a dog guarding its deceased owner that can be adopted, a slaughtered sect of warrior priests, and a front for a skooma den that's a front for something even more sinister. So if you're looking to find something I... interesting when wandering the wilderness, shacks might be your best bet. And if the best I think you just want a tiny home, dude. Wait, not every shack should have a story, but not every, not every shack should have a story, but every dungeon. I assume you're saying every dungeon should. Um, yeah, it's kind of a weird thing. Like, you know, some dungeons are just going to be full of criminals. So, like the uh, Morvinsker, the Sanguine Dungeon. Um, typically, what happens is people will. I'm. I know I'm speaking for you, but this is what happens to me usually. Um. You go in the dungeon, you clear out the open area, you kill the two people at the forge. I like the guy that is at the forge that's complaining like, dude, we're mages. Why is it, Why do I have to work the forge all the time? Um, you go downstairs, you fight like a high level enemy, and then like you go through the sanguine portal. And then like at the end of the quest, you're just teleported back to whatever inn you met um, Sam at, typically the bannered mare for me. And it's like, whoa, um, there's actually like a little bit more to that dungeon. So it's like you go to the next room and there's this area where there's this guy called like Forrest the Wicked or something. And he's like, he's got people in a, in a caged room and he's like burning them alive as to like torture them. It's just like a little bit of like cool kind of storytelling going on at that dungeon that is pretty easily missed. But it's like, he didn't need a quest to do that, which I mean was his point with the lighthouse thing, but it's like, why can't there also just be dungeons that are just places which may be his point but um yeah i know i i'm kind of confused on what he wants so he's he is fine with shacks not having stories he's not fine with dungeons that don't have stories if everything has a secret or story then then nothing does yeah that was my point in oblivion if everybody is a secret damned criminal then nobody is Yeah, I like the blind guard one. There's um, the Black Star Dungeon. You can overhear some pretty cool dialogue, too, about like how they're sacrificing people to keep the guy alive. Location type is the one least likely to be a dungeon, and the best side quests are the few lumpy ones with no dungeons in them. Maybe that's proof Skyrim has too many dungeons. Why are there so many dungeons in this game? Size matters. In the first episode of this- Whoa! 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 You can't just be coming out of the gate with shit like that. Come on. Not everybody can make a ha an hour and a half long video. He was complaining about the dopamine hit Skyrim loop and is now complaining about locations not arbitrarily rewarding him for visiting them.
I like them big. Or perhaps a dungeon within a dungeon. Isn't that like basically Falmer places? Is that they're like they are Falmer dungeons inside Dwarven dungeons? Also, I'm still salty. He doesn't count Oblivion gates as Oblivion dungeons. So that technically Oblivion has less dungeon types. This analysis, I explained how one of the draws of these games is their size, and that applies to both the game's world and the amount of content they contain. The various games in this series have had different methods of achieving this vastness, and Skyrim marks the return of one of Daggerfall's best-known tricks, procedurally generated content. Rebranded under the new name of Radiant Quests, these quests randomly select target locations for the player to be sent to to kill or retrieve a normally generic objective. The word randomly has connotations. Oh yeah, Lyd Lydia is definitely like, that's why Lydia is so popular is that she is an autistic person. So like she's the rare autistic girl that people for some reason fawn over. I don't know, it sounds like a lot of work to me. That might just be women though. Like if you want a low effort relationship, you gotta go with a man. These are usually handed out by inn keepers, stewards, or faction members, and through this system the game is able to generate an infinite number of quests that will continually be regenerated to send players to new dungeons, or old dungeons that the game will repopulate. A classic example of a radiant quest is Kill the Bandit Leader. That's the name of the quest, not the objective, although it's also the objective, which kind of speaks for itself really. There's no quest I'm uh, familiar with. He did the zoom in thing again. He got nervous that like people would get bored, so he started zooming in on it. Either that or I'm having a stroke. Is, is the men who go their own way just a, like a, a dog whistle for homosexuality? I never put that together. The objective, although it's also the objective, which kind of speaks for itself, really. Yeah, so he gets to this part where it's like kind of static and he's like, I gotta, I gotta zoom the frame in. It's, it could get boring here if we don't constantly just keep fucking zooming in. It's just a weird thing and it bothers... It's a weird editing thing and it bothers me that like you're so afraid of... Um, you're so afraid of, like, people getting bored an hour and five minutes into this video that, like, you went to the little bit of extra effort to, like, keyframe the... No to do keyframes on the scale. And it's, like, it's mi it's a minor thing, too. That's what pisses me off. It's, it's not like... It's not like he goes crazy and, like, zooms in a bunch. Although that would be kind of disjointed. But it's, like, he just zooms in, like, 2% over like three seconds and it's like stop MGTOW was like proto voluntary uh, celibacy kill the leader of knife point ridge is also the boethia quest I've got issues with the boethia quest quest dialogue for many of these quests just a note and a list of 28 different locations that the player might be sent to oh yeah if you ever say to me i don't know what i want for dinner that's license for me to make whatever the fuck i want so you better tell me what you want or you're getting fucking you're getting chicken and rice baby if there was an option before starting the game that explained what radiant quests are and gave players the option to turn them on or off i i want to ask this does anybody else have this issue with skyrim I know a lot of you are playing it because um, every time I play an Elder Scrolls game, other people do as well. Um, does anybody have this issue? Where, like, all the 3D models on the loading screen are red. And I don't know why. No, there's nothing wrong with chicken and rice, but, uh... Yeah, I have no clue what the deal with it is. 
It's just the loading screen models, so it's like it's not really that big a deal. But I was curious, like, was there some event or something? Like, why is it all red? Like, um, this one too. Is this an AE? I was having this issue in Special Edition. Uh, as far back as, like, July or something. I wouldn't be surprised if Todd was trying to pull that on me. Um, actually, <laughs> someone commissioned fan art of me and Todd. Well, not me and Todd, but this character and Todd. And um, I, I find it funny. I'm not, I'm not gonna lie. Um, hang on. I want to see. Should I share this? Probably not. Actually. Not 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 the not the porn. I'm not, I wasn't gonna share that. I'm uh, intent on keeping the stream up. Why did I keep minimizing it? Fuck's sake! It makes it like ten times harder if I minimize stuff. Yeah, that's sort of the downside of the VTuber bit is that um, there's some people who are really horny. How many people would choose to include them in the game? I'm sorry, what? And a list of 28 different locations that the player might be sent to. If there was an option before starting the game that explained what Radiant Quests are, and gave players the option to turn them on or off, how many people would choose to include them in the game? Am I alone in thinking that this is a really... really weird argument to make? Like I feel like you could twist this and go, if there was a if there was a dialogue option at the start of the game that told you what quest markers are, and prompted you to start to to whether or not you wanted them, how many people would start with quest markers? Uh, you could do it with fast travel. I feel like you could go so far as to like, if there was an option at the start of the game that offered you God mode, how many people would start with it? Like, that's such a weird thing. Like, yeah, if you confront players at the start of a playthrough about something. It's going to stand out to them, but that's kind of the point, is you only started seeing the seams of Radiant Quests when you were looking into it. Now, that's the thing, is it's fine if you want to look into it and research it. I don't give a shit, but my sort of point is the system was not designed, like, it's designed for it to work, for it to just work. You're not supposed to think about it. So it's like, yeah, if you... If you start off the game and go, would it bother you if there were a bunch of floating rocks in your atmosphere? It would be like, yeah, uh, why would you draw attention to there being floating objects? I'm doing this master's thesis thing as a step before PhD. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. And one of the other students is doing his research on VTubers, but not as an interested party, as someone who is obsessed with them. Oh, God, that's like the worst. Uh, somebody needs to break the news to that guy that he's not going to make it to the PhD program if um, passion is his only kind of driving factor for his thesis. Turbo version with 6,000 hours no longer finds joy from Skyrim, and so shouldn't you now that he knows everything there is to know about it? Well, the other weird thing is he made that argument. He was like, well, isn't it weird that there are people with hundreds of hours in Skyrim who give it a negative review? And it's like, okay, isn't it weird that there are people with hundreds of hours who start seeing the seams that complain about it? Passion's the only reason to get a PhD. I would say the fact that you can force people to call you a doctor would be a pretty good reason to get a PhD. Like, PhD is a pretty big deal. Even in, like, joke degrees, that's where, um, that's where people really start to kind of respect you. And that's why, um, there's higher stand- you, like, there's shit you don't get away with in 
PhD programs. Of course, there's a lot of doctors who are, like, uh, PhDs who are jokes. Like, don't get me wrong, trust me. I've read plenty of uh, people with PhDs who've written about games that uh, were total imbeciles. Doctor of Sexology. Are you sure about that? Isn't a moderate amount of passion necessary for a PhD? It's passion for your field, not passion for, like, a super specific thing. So, like, if I was to get a PhD in, like, game design or whatever the program would be called, my pa it's, my basis for it shouldn't be, I'm really passionate about Morrowind and I want to write a thesis about it. My, my, my thesis, or my, my basis for it should be that I'm passionate about the field. PhDs who demand you call them doctor are always a red flag. Oh, yeah. But see, that's the, that's the point. We created that as a society in order to make those to make it so that those people uh, have a massive red flag. Because now there's like a textual way to tell that they're probably crazy. I can imagine that guy who like justifies the half button press and like Super Mario Brothers would like get a PhD in it. My guess is almost everyone would choose to opt out, and those few who opt in would probably only do so because they were too lazy to check what they were actually opting into. I'm trying to think of a good example. I don't know, like uh, the Modern Warfare 2 thing. You get confronted at when you start up the game, you get confronted. Hey, there's a level that is kind of fucked up. Would you like to do it? And then it, it's sort of like that tier. What did he just say? So basically his idea is if the game confronted you at the start of at the start of it with the premise of Radiant Quest and asked you if you wanted to enable or disable it, most people his argument is most people would disable it. First of all, there's no possible fucking way without some way to travel to alternate dimensions for you to possibly know what people would actually do um, when confronted with this. You, we don't know if people would, and we don't know if people wouldn't say yes to it. And the reason we don't know is even if we were to do a poll right now of the people in chat and ask them for their opinions of what they would do, they'd probably fucking lie. And I got a basis for this. Um... A while ago, I asked a poll. I did a poll about what... Um, let me go to my community tab. About whether or not you picked uh, Rayloff or Hadvar at the start of the game. Okay. So, here's the poll. Right. I got 13,000 votes. And now here's the question verbatim. Who did you side with in your first playthrough of the Skyrim tutorial? Not the broader Civil War, just the tutorial. And I specify the first playthrough. And then let's see, what's what was the, what's the best answer from the top? Like, most of the top comments are Rayloff, which makes sense. But there's, like, people who will answer, like, Oh, yeah, I go with, uh, I go with Hadvar because you get better loot from Riverwood. And it's, like, you wouldn't know that in your first playthrough. But it's like, so, you can't really ask polls about this kind of stuff because um, people will answer them incorrectly. And also, there's kind of a, a, a cognitive bias because 
Uh, most people who would answer that poll are going to be anti-Skyrim people who probably think that Radiant Quest scene is a bad idea. So they would say, oh yeah, I would totally turn it off if I was presented. But you have no way of knowing what you would do. A, I would generally read and Google into a game before I play. Really? You would look up whether or not there's a choice in the tutorial, and then you would look up the consequences of the choice of that tutorial, and you would come to a consensus about whether or not you should pick Rayloff or Hadvar for gameplay benefits before you pick before you start playing a game. Really? That's the kind of stuff that you're reading about? Let's move on. This point is boring. You know what? No, we're not moving on. All right, let's break it down then. Everybody, I need your consensus. Red or blue? And the question is start. Bulls are always fun. And then I can't wait for the chat people that are like, what's the question? Well, and okay, so yeah, somebody brought up his thing about like, okay, if I'm presented with the choice at the beginning of the game, I'm not going to cut out the Radiant Quests. I don't think they're a bad, one, I don't think they're a bad idea, and two, I don't think that when Daggerfall did it, it was a bad idea. Plus, it's like, why would you deprive yourself of content? If I end up not wanting to do the Radiant Quests, I just won't do them. Good job keeping it even. I'm impressed with you guys. But I'm afraid red won. I'm sorry, there's just 1% of the, like we had some um we had some late mail in uh votes come in for red. You are a better VTuber than Gargura. You know, I don't watch any VTubers at all. I have a big ego, and I would say I'm definitely a really good streamer. <laughs> but I'm not going to ask you guys if I'm a good streamer, because you guys are biased. What's the past 1%? That those are people who wrote in green. That's why there's a missing 1% from the uh, from the blue side is there was a bunch of people who voted green at the last minute and uh because they really believe in the uh the Spriggan party. Well, yeah, that's sort of the thing is um there's a spectrum of streamers like you have uh you have like bad, or hang on, bad, you have like locale streamers, we'll, we'll call it, say LC, and then like they'll get a lot of views, and then you have like average, and then the, they get like a minimal amount of views, and then you have like actually good streamers, and they get like the same as the locales. So I'm definitely like a locale streamer. Radiant quests are just worse versions of normal quests. Their objectives are generic, their stories are non-existent, and instead of sending you to the more interesting, higher-effort dungeons... Yes, I agree with this, but I disagree with the journey that got us here. I want to keep saying that over and over again. I agree with the destination, but I didn't like the journey. I really didn't appreciate you crashing the plane to get us here. 
they instead send you to the least interesting, lower effort dungeons. They feel like a waste of time, but the problems they create go deeper than this because they dilute the real quest pool, as even for those who know of their existence, it's not always easy to determine what is and isn't a Radiant quest. They also alter the structure and feel of faction quest lines. Factions in Skyrim rely heavily on Radiant quests. If you ignore these quests, the faction quest lines will feel a lot shorter than other Elder Scrolls games. For example, without Radiant No, they are shorter even without the Radiant quests. Radiant quests, there are only six quests for the Companions, the Skyrim equivalent of the Fighters Guild, whereas Oblivion had 20 and Morrowind had 31. Ignoring Radiant quests also changes the feel of factions. Whereas in other games you started as a low rank member and had to slowly work your way up, in Skyrim every faction is quick to throw you into a main story that revolves heavily around the importance of the player, despite- th That's not Radiant Quest's fault though, that's just the way that they like pitch things. They really love you being the most important person by like the third quest. If not sooner. I cannot believe after three streaming sessions, you're still on the first third of the private sessions. Oh, that was a weird one. <laughs> there was that fucking guy who like, I just got back and you're still watching private sessions. And it's like, dude, we're on like our third video tonight. <laughs> Okay, so with the companions, I couldn't pick a radiant quest in between quests. They just tell me, you already have a job, fuck off. Oh, yeah? I heard that there's a way to fuck up the companions quest line. Um, there's like a specific place where the radiant quests uh, will break. With the, especially with, uh, specifically with the companions. But it's sort of the thing. He's saying the right things, but he's saying it for the wrong reasons. It's like the Companions is a bad faction, but the Radiant Quests is, a, in my opinion, a small part of the Companions being a bad faction. The fact you only just joined. For the Mages Guild, this means rather than getting to spend a decent amount of time immersing yourself into the College of Winterhold, where you get to live out your dreams of being a student of magic, getting into mischief, making friends, and learning ancient secrets, you instead... I don't want to do that, though. I really hate the Magical High School bullshit. Magical High School is, like, my least favorite fucking thing of the last 20 years. How would I make Skyrim Radiant Quests better? Um, honestly, I'm fine with the Radiant Quests. I know that might, that might sound controversial, but it's like, I really don't have an issue with the fact that you can go to an inn and get a bounty and it's just you go to a dungeon. What's the what's the issue? And I don't have an issue with you are in the companions and you talk to a companion leader, uh, even though they don't have leaders, and it's like um you get like just a generic job to fight somebody. Like the biggest issue is there's no they Pro I probably would have had, like, more dialogue for giving you more generalized directions. Like, instead of, there is somebody in Skyrim you need to beat the shit out of. It's like, there's a woman in Whiterun that you need to be. I don't know. That, that, the, the more specific the Radiant quests get, which is they are in the factions, the more of a bad idea they become. Instead, get sent straight into a much less interesting main quest, full of dungeons, and then before you even get to attend your second lesson, you've somehow become the new Archmage. So much for your magical education. Harry Potter ruined a generation of uh, young people. Harry Potter ruined a generation of women and also never knows best. <laughs> I think it's funny this stream is 15% the size of the entire Twitch viewers for Skyrim right now. Really? I don't look at Twitch, so I wouldn't know. Let me just mute this tab before some pity streamer starts screaming at me. Uh, browse, right? Games. Okay.
Wait, how do I see all the games on on Twitch? This is just like the top ones. I don't give a shit about these. I don't know. Skyrim's not on that list. Skyrim ruined a generation of men. You're actually probably not far off. Yeah, I don't know how to see all the games on Twitch. I only see like the top 10. So I'm just going to have to take your word for it. I once got into an argument with my ex about how people who base their political opinions off of Harry Potter are mentally deficient. Well, yeah, because like... The political conflict in Harry Potter is extremely minor. Because uh, the dark side is literally, you know, fucking evil. Like in pretty much every sense of the word. What the hell is a Ramona? Is that a type of noodle? Honestly, you can't really do anything in this game without ending up the leader of some useless faction, but for the College of Winterhold, it really hurts. This place should have been the best mage guild an Elder Scrolls game had ever seen. The setting is perfect. The Feast Guild and Tar- No elaboration? Okay. I don't want the magical faction to be a school. I think magical schools suck. They're bad. They're boring. I'm an adult. I got out of school. I don't want to go back. You can't make me go back. I didn't even get bullied in school and I don't want to go back. I much prefer life after high school. Ramona Flowers is a character in Scott, Scott Pilgrim. Okay. I have no clue what a Scott Pilgrim is. So, there you go. I Again, I didn't get bullied, so I don't know what it is. Uh... Six magical high school. Magical high school. Listen here, young man. You're going back to school whether or not, whether you like it or not. I was truant a lot of senior year. I had a really stressful like senior year. And I, I would miss school like once a week. And it was because I was not get I wasn't getting enough sleep. Like my senior year of high school was more stressful than any of the years of college. Like, it was fucking ridiculous. What were you, like, 6'7", Patty? Never got bullied? No, um... Nobody, like, seemed to feel the need to want to bully me. Like, I told the story before how I got called a... Oh, wait, I can't say it. I got called an F-slur by a guy that I think ended up being gay. He looked like a gay cowboy to me. Or, like, somebody who would end up being one. And that was, like, the extent of what happened to me in school. So I took two AP classes my senior year, and that was, like, the big issue. Because, for some reason, AP classes in high school is, like, more strenuous than actual college. And I think it's because they happen five days a week. Um, as opposed to, you know, you go, like... Uh, Tuesday, Thursday, or Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or what have you. Um, so, it was like five days a week. I had like a ridiculous... I had hours of homework every night. I was sleeping like two hours a night my senior year. I would like wake up in the morning and go, I'm not fucking going to school. At least once a week. Um, like the only thing that got me through that was... Um, I had a gym class, so I could like pick up heavy stuff and put it down and um I had a girlfriend that was like the two big things that got me through that why even do AP classes AP classes are a scam dude no matter how well you do you will not score high enough in an AP class to actually get any accredited school to recognize it you would be much better off in a dual credit class
Our brotherhoods have different but still radiant-induced problems, where it's radiant quests that feature the main activities that give these factions their identities. So, most of the thieving and assassinating comes at the hand of a radiant quest, but the quests themselves are entirely forgettable. I think you're leaving out the part where the... the reward of the Dark Brotherhood is that you get to do the radiant quests. <laughs> it's the dumbest thing. Dude, to get a shitty college to, like, recognize my AP Chem test, I had to score, like, a 4, um, which was just, like, absolutely ridiculous. It was, like, one of the hardest tests I've ever done in my life. And then I went to college chemistry, and it was way easier. The a like, okay, so the AP classes were nice, but I didn't like the homework regiment, and the tests were terrible. I didn't even bother with the test my senior year because I recognized that, like, um, it was just going to go poorly. I liked Kim, too. It, that was a cool... That was a really cool class was Chemistry, too. Because that was where we learned about, like, fluid dynamics, thermodynamics, um, like, electron spins... Uh, there was a lot of cool stuff that I liked about chemistry. Was it AP Chem and English by any chance? I took AP Chem, AP Bio, AP English, and AP American History. That was over my junior and senior years. In Oblivion, thievery and assassinating were the best parts of these factions, and yet now these types of quests are so basic they don't even seem worth doing. And so, Radiant Quests aren't just a form of uninteresting content, they're a form of uninteresting content that makes the rest of the game less interesting as well, which makes it hard to understand what the benefit of these quests was meant to be, because just how much content does one game actually need? To complete every infinite non-Radiant Quest in Skyrim would still take the average player at least 100 hours, and who expects more than 100 hours of content from a single player game? Weird position. I, are we going back to like that? If you have a lot of hours in Skyrim, why are you complaining? Argument. You um, you see it a lot with um, like people who are outside of gaming. And it's like, if a game gives you sixty hours of entertainment, then how can you complain about it? And I understand the basis of that position, but I mean, it's one of those things where it's like, there's always room for improvement, and so it's like, we'll go back and give it a second listen. The most valuable thing about AP classes is that they filter out students who give a shit from the general pop and let them learn at a rate that they enjoy. Yeah, that was the only reason I actually took AP the second time was because... Um, I ended up making friends with, like, a lot of kind of smart people in those classes. I had a lot of different friend groups in high school. That was, that, that was probably why I didn't get bullied, because, like, I was in with everybody. I was in with the jocks, because I would do, like, weightlifting. I was in with the, um, with all the computer people, because I played games with them. I was in with all the smart kids. I was in theater, so I was in with all, like, the, the gay people. And, like, the, the divas. Alright, so what did you just say? This was meant to be, because just how much content does one game actually need? To complete every non-radiant quest in Skyrim would still take the average player at least 100 hours, and who expects more than 100 hours of content from a single-player game? Okay, yeah, that's definitely a weird thing. Like, what do you want? Content? Oh, shit. 109.02. Like saying you shouldn't complain about Minecraft. Because it provides you a lot of content. Theater kids are the worst. The worst thing is, like trying to sleep on the bus on the way back from a show and them like singing whatever the fuck is popular at the time. Yeah, but here's the thing. 
Unlike Todd Howard, I was like not the leader of any of the high school factions. I was just sort of like a card carrying member of all the groups. Things like they exist just to create the illusion of more content in order to impress players who don't look too closely. A bit like the emetic behavior in animals, where they try to puff themselves up to keep away predators, which must work or these animals wouldn't bother, but that doesn't stop it looking ridiculous to anyone who knows better. This might also explain- Is that the reason? I have been tempted so many times to, um, where's, where's he at? Copy. Paste. To like go back to this presentation it still felt like they had purpose and intent and fit what was going on and this is an important issue for us also aliases hold data that is released when the quest completes like if you didn't see it this was one of the best um videos that we've watched on stream so far and it's bruce nesmith talking for about 45 minutes about the radiant quest system i feel like that's what's missing from this video is he doesn't understand not only does he not understand really the the how of the system he doesn't understand the why of the system so he's speculating why bethesda is putting it in he's not actually kind of pursuing information about about the actual reason why as far as what i've been able to gather so far and we're in the middle of doing this um Bethesda's why was that they wanted a more dynamic world. And so the the how the why of Radiant Story started with, like, where is that big... They had, like, a big panel where they listed, like, all the actions. Like, they, they listed out all the actions that a player could do. And then, like, they, they filtered it down to just, like, the important ones. And then, like, um would come up with like radiant responses and the whole goal of the system was you do something the game should react in some way that's cool in the world right so that was like the basis of radiant of of radiant quests was then um it was not like the cynical we want to create infinite content so that you do infinite dungeons you know like there was a there was a um there was a noble reason for them starting this process. Is this the guy with the weird black pilled gameplay loop thing? Yes. So it's just kind of weird. And that's the thing is, Never Knows Best was one of the best Oblivion videos that I think we watched. Um, I'm just pulling up a quick list of all the stream, the oblivion streams so never knows best was the first oblivion video that we watched and it was such a good video that we ended up doing like 14 more streams that's how good it was so then we did the e3 demo and it was awesome that was like a really funny stream we did the three will streams there was a lot of like conversation and dialogue that happened during those streams uh, and then I started, like, getting into reading interviews and stuff. So, like, Never Knows Best, in a way, is, like, the reason that I came up with this kind of format for doing for, for doing these streams. And um, it's just so weird, the contrast that we get when we come to Skyrim. Like, I'm tempted to, like, jump into the middle of the Oblivion video and see, like, am I remembering it wrong? For example, all eight of these smaller cities are exactly the same size and share a lot of the same features. In reality, cities vary greatly in size and shape, but in Oblivion, they each feel like they were made using the exact same template, where there's one church, one castle, a complete outer wall, and the same number of buildings and inhabitants in every one. See, like, okay, so it's bereft of context, so we don't know if he's been doing stupid stuff up until this point, but I mean, like, that's an accurate criticism. The cities in Oblivion are too formulaic. They seem to fit into a mold of there should be the same thing, the same sorts of things in like every city.
I still remember the Oblivion stream with the guy going into the real life religious references. Yeah, that was Alleyway Jack. Um, he had a, he had an interesting one because he took a very different kind of approach to making a video, and um, that's why I like I'm leaving it on the table that we might watch his Skyrim video, despite the fact that on average these streams get more views than than he gets. It sounds like a lot of reviewers are scared of criticizing Skyrim because of its popularity. I guess that could be a thing. Um, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't give a shit. I'm going to go as hard on Skyrim as I did on Oblivion and Morrowind. And why there's so many dungeons. Skyrim has 195 dungeons. Who is the person that wants to do 195 of these things? Well, I mean, that's sort of the thing is, your playthrough is defined by the dungeons that you do. You're not compelled to do all of the dungeons. I think Oblivion has a similar count, since I, as you all know, I worked on the, um, the Oblivion dungeon overhaul, which just ties a bunch of dungeons together. Um, I have a spreadsheet somewhere, hang on. So Oblivion has, from my count, 50 plus 84 plus 52 plus 25. So Oblivion has uh, 211 dungeons. So it's like, the thing is, Skyrim's dungeons on average are probably better than Oblivion's dungeons on average. I don't know. I'm not sure where I was going with that, but the point is... Um, it just seems like a weird thing to say. Like, nobody's compelled to do all of the dungeons. Salt is literally the example. His video doesn't actually say anything. It's just him shit-talking Skyrim for a long-ass time, and it's one of the most popular Skyrim videos. The thing is, I kind of expected that going into that one because we had watched Salt Factory for Oblivion as well, and it was a very similar experience. In fact, Salt Factory for Oblivion was so bad that the chat begged me to skip it, and we ended up watching different videos. But I don't want you guys thinking that you have rights or anything like that. To be fair, Skyrim is a completionist's nightmare. I mean, ask that guy who did a 100% Oblivion run. Ask anybody who has ever done all 60 Oblivion gates. You know what I mean? Like, and sure, it's not a defense to say, well, Oblivion did it, so it's okay in Skyrim. That's not a defense. But... It's kind of a... I'm not sure how I feel about this. It's like, yeah, there's a lot of dungeons. You don't have to do them all. Your play, th Like I said, your playthrough is defined by the dungeons that you do on that character. And so different people have different experiences because they do different content. It's like saying that Wildlands is a bad game because you have to do all the content. No, Wildlands is a bad game because it's like abysmally boring and um, it's too easy to do stuff. And... Um, so it's kind of like holding back. Oh, and it's got like a, a dreadful story. But so it's like holding back this like good looking world and lots of varied kind of content that you can do and progression and all that. But you don't have to do everything. Some people 100% just cause games. Yeah, that's definitely another situation where it's like there's a lot of content to do in the just cause games, but it's very repetitive. You know. I'm sure even like the designers are like we didn't act we don't actually intend for you to do all of the content we're just giving you a, a wide wide berth of um of potential content for you to do in my game there were oblivion gates that were connected fun shortcuts yeah I kind of that was one of those things that I wanted to mention, but I never really found a place. There's some of some of the Oblivion gates, uh, multiple gates will point at the same realm. 
which I always thought was cool because if you're not if you're doing a no fast travel playthrough, then you could actually take a shortcut through Oblivion. Oh yeah, it's like a it's like our guy Gary. Um, he's one of those. So to remind you guys who don't know who Gary is, um, which one is it? It's this one. So this guy, like one of his big positions for why he made this post was that like there's so much content that gets made every year that it's not possible for him to consume it all. And so it's like, okay, so the basis of you think that people should stop making long videos is that there's too much content. And it's like, you do realize that there's more content that comes out every year than you will ever be able to possibly consume, right? Like we live in an era where um, the whole world's just kind of your oyster for content. I hear Noah called Noah Caldwell Gervais cyberbullied this guy. Um, if you don't know, Gary is actually a lizard. Oh no, shit! I can't say that because he's part Jewish, so that might come off as racist. I was good, I was doing an Argonian thing, but um, but uh, <laughs> you might see it as like uh, like a lizard people joke and take it out of context. Damn. Alrighty, let's continue. 195 dungeons. Who is the person that wants to do 195 of these things? And if 195 weren't enough, they also repopulate after a certain number of days, so you get to do them all over again. Saying that out loud makes it sound like someone's own personalized version of ironic hell. I can imagine some unlucky fool in the afterlife told their soul shall remain in eternal damnation until they clear all 195 of Skyrim's dungeons. Oh no, what a horrifying and Sisyphean task. It truly is hell having to complete all these dun also your dungeon list includes all those fucking shacks. Um what is what a horrible and impossible task. Truly I will be stuck in hell forever completing Skyrim dungeons because there's just such a momentous list of giant 185 part checklist to get into heaven. Can someone explain the Noah Call of Dravay mean? Sure. Uh, to, so, there was a guy on Twitter who made this post, um, that said, fucking stop it. I'll tolerate a video being a little over an hour in length, maybe even half an hour, which is weird because it's like, I can tolerate being, it being 60 minutes, maybe even 30 minutes, but not this bullshit. This is in reference to Noah Caldwell Gervais Resident Evil video. It might be a great video, but I'm not going to watch it like how I'll never read a 12,000 page book or listen to a song that lasts for three days. And then, like, Noah Kawa Gervais saw this because it was such a ridiculous thing that was, like, getting passed around. So, like, he quote tweeted a, a, a quite little joke. And, um, this guy spent, like, eight hours that day just, like, uh, responding to people. Like, I actually made a video, um, of uh of his responses i just i don't have the i don't have his name censored in the video so i can't really show it but um yeah he spent like all day uh trying to like respond to every single person that ever commented on it and he was like to this day he harbors a grudge against noah caldwell gervais and like um yeah, I'd like a like a three day long concert. That sounds badass. But um, so he help he harbors a grudge against like one of the most innocuous people to this day. So we started telling the joke that like Noah Caldwell Gervais is like a racist and that like he goes around Seattle just kind of like picking on elves. Well, that was sort of the thing. Was like people. Gave him invite. He like he would say like, I want to watch the video, but it's too long. And so people were like, Well, you could like, um, you could use the timestamp section feature. And he's like, So he started coping, and he was like, Well, if it's seven and a half hours long, that implies that it's meant to be watched in one part. And it's like, Jesus fucking Christ. 
though, like, he had all kinds of, like, rationalizations for why he just couldn't do it. Because he didn't want to say that, like, look, I just don't want to watch it. Yeah, there's elves in Seattle. We ha Seattle has its own gray quarter. It's a, it's a, it's a secret they try to keep on the da down low. But yeah, they segregated the elves to like a, a really shitty part of town. I think it's like they call it like Tacoma or something. And um, yeah, there's like a lot of uh, racism, uh, anti-elf racism going on in Seattle. You mean I'm not supposed to read Moby Dick in one setting? Well, people brought that up to him. And so his profile picture during that was a Disco Elysium character, which is a game you can't complete in one sitting. So it's like, what the fuck are you talking about? And then every time they get close, the dungeons start repopulating, leaving them forever unable to escape. If someone did end up in the Skyrim dungeon version of hell, at least they'd be able to make use of the legendary skill system. Legendary skills were introduced in patch 1.9. That is one of the... Oddest transition. Uh, nobody seemed to get my fucking... <laughs> nobody seemed to get my Tacoma joke. Must not be a lot of people from, uh, from that area. Allow players to continue to level up and maxing out one of their skills by choosing to make that skill legendary. This resets the player's level in that skill from 100 to 15 and refunds their perks, making them weaker and allowing them to level the skill up all over again, which can then be done repeatedly. The best comparison to this system is prestige mode in Call of Duty, which resets your rank and unlockables while giving you a new modified shiny icon, but I always assumed the point of prestige mode was just to show off to other players, except Skyrim- Okay, hang on. I don't recall because I didn't play enough, um... I didn't play enough uh, Call of Duty to ever prestige. When you prestige in Call of Duty, does it reset your loadouts? So, like, do you do you have to unlock all the perks again and, like, all the guns and stuff? Interesting. So, it is similar, but... Interesting. It used to, not in recent games. Yeah, okay, so like, my frame of reference for Call of Duty games is um, Modern Warfare 1 and 2 and Black Ops. And I don't even remember that much from the multiplayer of those games. Skyrim is a single-player game, so there's no one to show off to. I suppose maybe you could ask your parents to come check out your leaked Skyrim legendary rank. They might be kind enough to humor you at least. God, are you? Depressing. Are you gonna like? Why did Bethesda feel the need to add this system? Why are there 195 dungeons? Why do dungeons repop? Okay, so he's doing the thing. The point has been raised, and now we're slowly starting to put it back down. Great. Why are there radiant quests? It's like all that matters. Why did you bring up legendary skills? Okay. Here's how I use legendary skills. A common issue with the magical skill playthroughs is that you just don't have enough perk points to get all the perks that you need. Um, compared compared to the other playstyles, right? So it's like I'm level 50 and there's a bunch of perks that I need, but I'm like leveling glacially. So I'm just not getting them. So what I did was um, I maxed out my smithing. I made everything that I would ever want for the remainder of the playthrough, which was heavy armor for Jazargo, um, some boots and gloves. Um, I improved it to the degree I wanted, and then I refunded all those points, and that was six perk points. And then I enchanted all that gear with my maxed out enchanting and refunded those points, and that got me 11 perk points, which then went a long way towards um, actually making my playthrough um, a lot better so i mean as 
like the thing is there's a way to approach this because the legendary system has its issues it's like if you ever legendarily if you ever do the legendary thing for your primary combat skill you're potentially fucking yourself over in a big way for a long time until you get it back up to snuff so it's like the skills that you're most likely to max out are typically skills that you don't want to reset So it's like, I have maxed out pickpocketing, but I don't know if I'm ever actually going to legendary it because I have the perks from pickpocket that I want and I kind of don't want to lose those. Like, I have the 100 carry weight points. I have the weapon and armor stealing, which is kind of cool to have for some quests. So it's like, I'm just kind of stuck with that. But yeah, it's like, it's definitely a, like a weird addition that I don't quite understand the point of. Um, but the thing is, he brought it up and then he thought that like it would add to this. It's like, oh yeah, and there's legendary skills. Why are there legendary skills? Who knows? And it's like, okay, what did that have to do with there being lots of dungeons or radiant content? The way you describe just removing all your stats for the extra perks after making the gear you want sounds like an awkward band-aid to poor balance. Oh no, it absolutely is. That's my point. Magic's fucked in Skyrim. Um, you don't get enough perk points. And so, like, that was something that I did to try and get enough perk points to actually kind of keep going. What can you do? It is what it is. To the Bethesda was making the biggest game possible, but it's not worth sacrificing quality in your mad quest for quantity, not to mention there's a better way to make an RPG with a near endless amount of content. Okay, so I... Here's how I picture it went in his head. I'm gonna bring up Legendary because it helps prove the point that Bethesda was trying to make an infinite game if there's infinite skill-ups. I'm guessing that's his point. But it, it kind of came off really bad in execution. Which is through replayability. This is something Bethesda have seemingly turned their back on, with Skyrim moving to a classless system where one character is meant to feel like they can do everything and there's no more birth signs, specialization, or major skills to set one character apart from another. To go alongside this, you can join every faction, become their leader almost overnight, be named Thane of every city, even those at war with each other, and then become the champion of every Daedric Prince. I'm guessing no one in Skyrim has ever heard the term conflict of interest before. The only exception is the Civil War, which lets you choose which side to support, eh. and, as a result, ends up feeling like the most defining part of your entire playthrough. I, I always took the Daedra Quest thing as, like, you have to come up with your own definition of a conflict of interest. If you're playing somebody, like, okay, this is an issue I have. I was praising Verminus Quest, now I'm going to shit on it. Um, you can't play Verminus Quest if you're role-playing as somebody who is a... Uh, worshiper of the nine or eight divines because it is stated in the quest that the player is unaffiliated the player has to be unaffiliated to make use of the dream stride so not well i guess not only can you not be part of the divines you also can't be committed to any of the daedric princes or something it's just like um it, it's like when it comes to the like religious content of the games, you have to decide what gods your character worships and do the quests accordingly. So it's like if it doesn't make sense for your character to do Boethius quests because like they would never earn someone's trust and then betray them at the sacrificial pyre, then you don't do the fucking quest. It's like sort of the same thing like Mayrin's Razor is a cool reward, but if you're playing a good character, you probably should just side with Silas. I know you lose out on the cool dagger, but you know, if you're if you're role-playing a character, then that's just the that's the price of things. Like the Daedric content is for characters who are morally gray or evil, typically. There's some there's some that aren't, but
You mean Mephala, not Boethia? No, I mean Boethia. Boethia is the one where you, to, to um, get her to manifest, you have to befriend a companion and then take them to her shrine and, uh, and uh, murder them. I think when it comes to working for a Daedric Prince, you're more of an outside contractor than an actual employee. That's true of, like, um, that's true of, like, say, Clavic is vile. But you get pretty committed to the Boethia lifestyle in, in that particular quest. And it's, again, it's up to you to decide uh, what content is, like, exclusive to you. You could slaughter everyone at Boethia's shrine and get the quest. I think you still have to you still have to do the betrayal, don't you? I mean, I don't care. I I am not playing a good character, so the betrayal was no issue for me. I saw when I was looking it up, um, what a novelty looking up quests that you can kill the people. Yeah, I think you still have to do the sacrifices. I think what you're confusing is um, if you kill everybody, if you kill all the followers at the shrine ahead of the big blood, bo the bloodbath, and then do the sacrifice, she'll resurrect one of the followers. Is Namir the only one with two artifact quests? You, no, you're thinking of Vermina. Vermina has the Skull of Corruption. Namir has her range. Namir is the cannibal quest. Which, like, that's another one. It's like, um, if you don't, if you're not down with the cannibals, you could just, like, not do the quest. The ring's not that good. I mean, the 50 health points from eating corpses is nice, but if you have a, if your character has a hang-up about eating corpses, then... You know, it's it's up to you whether or not your character would go through with it. I'm playing Skyrim right now. Do you want me to test anything? Um, give me time to think about it. A lot of the testing comes after the playthrough finishes, and I start kind of wondering, like, um, like if I te if I want to test anything as I play, I'll typically just do a save and test it. It's usually like after the fact that it starts to become kind of a pain in the ass. It's great for Wood Elf and the Meat Pact. I think that's who it's for. Because it's kind of out of place, in my opinion. The Civil War, which lets you choose which side to support, and as a result, ends up feeling like the most defining part of your entire playthrough. The Civil War itself isn't very good. Many of its quests are repetitive fort attacks, the narrative is regularly forced to take a back seat, the big battles feel pathetically small scale, and the land itself never really manages to successfully feel like a country at war. But despite all these problems, the Civil War still ends up being a great addition to the game, just on the strength of that one single meaningful choice. Stormcloaks or Imperials. Yeah, the glorious empire and the racist Stormcloaks. Molag is a good character. You choose to help the guy, but then you're trapped in the house. Yeah, but I mean... That's okay. So the Molag Ball thing um, doesn't it doesn't really force you any, into anything because Tyrannus attacks you, so it's pretty easy to write it off as a self defense situation. And even even if you go down and talk to Molag Ball, there's still nothing that really conflicts with you. The only time the only part where it becomes active is if you follow what Molag Ball tells you what to do, or if you do what Molag tells you to do. Because that's sort of the thing is, morally good characters can defend themselves. They're not pacifist pussies that go, Well, it's wrong to 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 kill people. And it's like, okay, I'm going to stop you right there. <laughs> You're not going to like Skyrim. That is a decision that matters to players, and even 10 years later, people still argue about it. Hell, there are probably people arguing about it right now in the comment section of this video. And to those people I say, you do you. I'll take arguments over fictional video game politics in my comment section over arguments over non-fictional real-life politics any day. Lame-o. 
Lame o loser. You help Werewolf Boy get the ring, then leave, come back, kill him, and you can skin him for the armor. Yeah, you can play both sides. That is kind of an exploit, though, because I don't think you're intended to be able to play both sides of that quest. Plus, you're kind of misreading that quest. The point of the quest wasn't to get him the ring of piercing. You just took it off him because it was taking away his ability to control his transformations. Still, I wish there were more meaningful choices in Skyrim. That is, at this Here it comes. The Parthenax Dilemma. So, uh, I'm probably going to kill Parthenax on this character. What do you guys think of that? Here, here. Well, I, I can do you, be do you one better. There you go. <laughs> All right, so I should clarify. I'm playing a, I'm playing a kind of evil person. Um I'm playing a character who in my headcanon was uh like exiled from Morrowind by the New Tribunal Temple and so like is going out and like collecting power so that she can go back and like conquer Morrowind. That's kind of the character that I'm building. And so I'm like getting a bunch of Daedric tools and like building myself up as the Dragonborn. And um, the way I see it is like Parthenax is like Parthenax is enough of a threat. Plus, I want the service of the blades. Plus, I actually just want to kind of do it on a character for once. But yeah, I typically like part part. OK, so I described the Civil War as like a 60 40 conflict. Um, the Parthenax Dilemma is a 90-10 conflict. It's basically not a choice. Why do people misunderstand the blades and assume they basically should they should basically be your slaves? No no, I understand I understand and that aspect of the blades. I think the issue is um, Delphine builds it as like they are servants of the Dragonborn and then immediately like tries to pull a power play on you. And that's I, that's I think people's issues with it. Now I'm not saying that the blades should be my servants. I'm saying that I want my character would want the order of warriors more than she would want a, a chill dragon to chat with. Plus she's got Dernavir, so... I can switch to the orc real quick. Yeah. There you go. I I agree if if you're one of the people in the chat who thinks that the orc is better looking than the Dunmer. I actually kind of agree. I like the way her face looks. The blades are like two guys. Um so I can tell some people have never done the blades faction. Now the blades are five guys. Plus, I, I I assume that like the implication is that it's gonna go farther. But uh, okay, so here's how. Okay, even if you don't want to kill Parthenax, here's how you do the blades content. Don't rush the main quest. As soon as you get to Cloud Ruler Temple, start building up the blades. And then you can do everything. Greybeards won't talk to you. Greybeards suck. Greybeards would be literally no use to the character that I'm playing. Now, I want to I say this. 
Uh, Shoring Hardheart uh, was a man who spared Parthenax and sided with the Greybeards. So, it's not like I'm not seeing that side of the content. It's just, I'm playing a mildly evil person. I am going to do mildly evil things. I think it's a novelty that you can, like... I like the I, I like the idea that like the Dragonborn is basically bending people to his will and forcing them to do shit. So it's like the fact that you can force people to join the blades is funny to me. Decision regarding the fate of Parthenax as part of the main questline, as well as Cicero in the Dark Brotherhoods, and a major decision in the first DLC, Dawn Guards, and a few branching paths in some of the better side quests and Daedric quests, but it still doesn't feel like enough. This game would have benefited greatly from more choices with tangible consequences on the world around you, and it's not. I agree. <laughs> but I don't agree with the with the journey you took us on to get this far. Like there wasn't ample opportunity. For example, the companion quest line revolves around the werewolf companions feuding with the werewolf hunters, the Silver Hands, and yet instead of depicting the Silver Hands with nuance and giving the player a choice over which group to side with, the Silver Hands are instead depicted as two-dimensional villains that the player has no choice but to slaughter. I mean, yeah, it's the same thing as, like, the Blackwood Company. I haven't done the vampires part of Dawnguard in a long time. I don't actually recall what that side of the faction's like. So I typically go Dawn Guard because I think they're I think they're pretty cool. Uh, the three people I get to do the the blades. Um, Uthgird in White Run because I think it fits her. She's like really pouty that she got kicked out of the companions. Is so like you know what you should join my warrior order then. Um, the guy that you, um, the guy that, like, asks you to help clear his tomb out from a necro, like, a Dunmer necromancer, I always get him to join the blades. I forget who the third person I get to join is. Whoever casted the guy who voiced Isran deserves a raise. Oh, absolutely. Isran is, um, Isran is a pretty good voice. Gold Deer. Yes, his name's Gold Deer. I sacrificed uh, Benor, or whatever the fuck his name is, to Boethia. The Dongar path just doesn't make sense. Why did they have you escort her home either way? It's just so dumb. So, okay. I actually asked a lot of those questions while I was doing the Dongard. So, for one thing... Serana won't go with you to Fort Dawnguard. So it's not like you you can't trick her to uh to come back to the vampire hunting organization to get murdered. Um she's pretty savvy about this kind of stuff. Like she even knows like if you're a vampire, she'll call out that you like are not going to enjoy your time with the Dawnguard. They're eventually going to figure it out. So she's pretty smart. Um if you bring a, if you go to Isran after you rescue Serana but before you take her to Harkin, he will actually tell you to take Serana to Harkin because he's really like he I think he says something to the effect of like they don't have enough information about what's going on and so this is like an intelligence gathering operation I think the, the dumbest part of the quest to me is like both sides do something really stupid Isran lets the Elder Scroll go back to the vampires that's one stupid thing. The other stupid thing is that Harkon lets the player leave. Like, I don't know why... They don't really characterize Harkon as having the sense of honor, so I don't understand why, if the player rejects him, they just let him go. Now, of course, you can say they have to. They have to let the player go. I, there's there's uh, ways I would fix that that involve like teleportation magic, like the Dawnguard go. You know what? Um, take this crystal with you. It'll teleport you back to the Fort Dawnguard. If you get in trouble at the castle, uh, use it. And then like the second you decline Harkon, he's like, fine. 
then uh, you're fucked, time to die. And then you're like, oh shit, I'm gonna use this illegal teleportation crystal and then you leave. Or something. Harkon's supposed to be honorable, but it's bullshit tier logic. That's the thing, is like, Harkon is more obsessed about completing his goals than he is about any, like, he doesn't care about his family. He doesn't, he definitely doesn't care about honor. He doesn't really have a good motivation for letting the player go. If this type of choice requires a sacrifice of quantity to achieve, I'd still consider that worth it just to get a couple more Stormcloaks or Imperials in the game. Likewise, a progression system that allows for unique character builds, which cater to different playstyles, isn't a bad thing. Skyrim has a tendency for player characters to all end up being the same, but a powerful warrior well versed in magic that knows how to shoot a bow from stealth and pick a difficult lock might be a useful character, but it isn't an interesting one. You got conned into being a stealth archer. Yeah, that's not what he says. It's a paraphrase. Whoops, not that line. But it's like... How true is it that every character becomes a stealth archer? I know it's a popular meme to say, but it's like... I'm not really going to ascribe to people that they're going to end up becoming... Um, that they're going to end up always becoming stealth archers. You're playing a game, and all of a sudden, you're a stealth archer. You didn't ask for this. I don't think it's as much a situ- like, I don't think, like, it's not the end point of every character. Wait, so it's the Dragonborn's destiny to max out all the perk trees? Yeah, because any of these can be theoretically true. They must all be true. I guess. The Dragonborn is a quantum stealth archer. Can we talk about your beautiful black-coated VTuber avatar? I just understood what you said. <laughs> Didn't you hear? They decided to make the, the... The orcs are no longer based on black people. And then the black guy's like, Wait, you thought we were orcs? Like, it's such a racist thing to say, like, um... Yeah, you know those violent, uh, criminals that are in video games? Well, we're finally not basing them on you anymore. And it's like, wait, you think I'm a violent criminal? That's the point. It's casual racism propagated by the very people claiming to be against it. Well, yeah, that's the thing is like. I have never in my life um, looked at orcs and said, wow, what an amazing analog for African-American people. I mean, if anything, they're closer to Islam than they are um, African-Americans. But the thing is, Islam's a religion, not a race. There's a wide variety of racial groups that believe in Islam. Tolkien, the Tolkien orc language is called the black speech, but that's probably because it's evil, not because it's black. You gotta remember, most black people aren't actually black. They're just brown. I mean, there's a couple that are, like, midnight black. Or, like, you you put on the black and white filter and their skin color doesn't change. But most black, most African people are not actually black. 
But did you ever see a black grandmother and be like, yo, nice orc you got here? Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Like, um... There's such, like, a diverse group of people to just, like, write into the corner of, like... Oh, yeah, the orcs definitely... They're definitely a metaphor for them. I always thought orcs were more like gypsies with how insular they are as an ethnicity. Well, okay, so... I have a theory... Um that like all of the orcs represent like different aspects of the Jewish people. It's it's like a it's it's a uh, citation my crack pipe kind of theory. But uh, if you read into like the the all of the elvish cultures, you can see like um, various aspects of the Hebrews and uh, modern Judaism um, in the way that they're characterized. So like the orcs would be like the diaspora kind of we're banished from our homeland and eternally working towards restoring Israel kind of aspect. You gotta remember, this is like Michael Kirkbride stuff, and Michael Kirkbride does think about this kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, see, this is why I don't bring it up, because it, everybody takes it the exact wrong way. That's why it's a crack pipe theory, because it's dumb. I just thought orcs were green people. Yeah, I mean, that's sort of the thing is you can draw parallels, but at the end of the day, they're just green people who believe in Malakath, who's a fake person. So why people think orcs are black people? Uh, because they're racists who think that uh, because orcs are violent and black people are violent, that orcs must be black people. And it's like, wait, hold up. You just said that you think black people are violent. What the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> there really isn't a human equivalent to a pure war warrior culture like that. Not a, not a transient warrior culture, I would think. Is this about extra credits? Oh yeah, it's about, it's always about extra credits. Alrighty. Listen, I love green skin orc content. Skyrim's chronic lack of indoor replayability might be one of the major factors that drives the player base's fascination with mods. To be clear, mods are a difficult aspect to address in any analysis, especially for... Uh, sure, but... From what I've seen, most people just turn them on. Don't why do why give a shit? Wait, Extra Credits said that shit? Okay, so what happened was Extra Credits had a video about how, like, orcs were racist or something. Uh, Extra Credits. Orcs. Evil races are bad game design. And where, where was the funny part? I actually Thanks put so it, much. I actually put it in the Oblivion video. So like when this happened, they immediately threw the guy that actually wrote the episode like under the bus. And as much of the recent conversation on orcs points out that characterizing a whole species in your game as ugly, warlike, and malevolent might be harmful to real-world groups regularly mischaracterized as ugly, warlike, and malevolent. However, this video isn't that. Though if you want more on that discussion, Mendez breaks it down wonderfully over on his website. <laughs> so you can kind of see how um, this is a bit of a delicate topic. Now bioessentialism is a tempting idea in fantasy for some of the same reasons as it is in the real world. Because to our human minds, broad generalizations are comforting. They reduce the world to simple cut and dry categories. All orcs bad, all elves good. Root for these folks, not for these folks. But just like in the real So yeah, he they had like this big fuck up. Um which seems to be just like a common thing with extra credits. But it's like I 
How do I, yeah, it's one of those things that's like, how do I even respond? Winter elves always good. Well, yeah, like, so we're in the Elder Scrolls community where elves are uh, extremely morally gray, just like men. You got some elves that are really good, and you have some elves that committed genocide. And it seems to be a common thing that, like, elves want to keep slaves. So it's like, you know, this sort of position of, like, you're writing about, like, the most generic of fantasy without taking into consideration that, like, you know, there's orcs in fantasy that aren't fucking 40k orcs. And hell, 40k are orcs aren't even anybody. Yeah, there was the Nazi video. I, I love the Nazi quote. You're, you're an inwa. You didn't choose this. You didn't play this. Or whatever, however the quote goes. Well, aren't the Tolkien elves, the ones you see in Lord of the Rings, like, super mellow, but they used to be, like, an extremely fucked up people that, like, went to war and had, like, massive, devastating conflicts all the time? A game whose selection of user-created content is so vast and rich. Bethesda do deserve a huge amount of credit for their long-standing tradition of both allowing modification of their games and of trying to make the act of modification user-friendly. There have, of course, been some hiccups along the way, but if more game developers were as mod-friendly... So you know what the creation kit is... But you don't want to take a stab at making an interesting dungeon. Interesting. And you can say, well, what? Would you do that? Um... Fifty is. Yes. <laughs> yes, I I would do that. I've already I already have done that. I, extra credits issue is that I think they are a weekly they do a video once every week um, which creates like inherent issues is a full highest rating that I can issue 10 out of 10 you'll excuse me I'm off to go delete Damn. Which gets to me this is the ultimate way to play a really phenomenal game and as such Skyrim for switch gets an easy 7 out of 7 way to play a really phenomenal game and okay Got that queued up. Got that queued up. Now we'll be ready in the future. I think that's sort of the thing is, um, when you get into the grind of weekly or daily content, you're gonna have, you're gonna statistically have fuck ups. Is the whole deal. But uh, that's sort of the thing is like, yeah, the nostalgia critic makes a lot of videos, but the wall video was so infamously bad that it really doesn't matter how much like good content he makes. To have such a just historically bad take when so many people were involved in the project is like just like a phenomenal thing. And I think it's that's the same thing with like um with extra credits is like there's multiple people who were involved in that video and none of them apparently asked the que uh, like asked the questions like hey maybe this is not a good idea he still stands by the wall video right i think he does zero punctuation has been surprisingly okay for a weekly show i know he can be a bit hit or miss for a lot of people though yeah, well, that's the thing, is he's done his stuff. He's done his stuff for a long time. Um, and sort of, he's changed over the years. I think where he lives is, like, a big influence on his, like, style. I think Australia was way better for him. But I can tell... I, I can understand why you would want to leave Australia, especially if you weren't native. Because Australia seems like a... How do I phrase this in as kind a way as possible? And uh, what we would call an authoritarian shithole. I would show you the wall video, but I don't want to fail anybody's no Nostalgia Critic November. Well, the best part of the wall video was like the um, the response videos. Or, like, the stuff that was made as a result of it. Me as Bethesda, the world would be a better place. 
I've always disliked the narrative that developers allow mods to get away with creating unfinished games, or that develop. Oh wait, hang on. You say that again? Would be a better place. I've always disliked the narrative that developers allow mods to get away with creating unfinished games, or that. Like the narrative that developers allow mods to get away with creating unfinished games. Make sure, make sure. This would be a better place. I've always disliked the narrative that developers allow mods to get away with creating unfinished games. So I think he fucked that sentence up. I think he means to say, um, the world would be a better place. I've always disliked the narrative that developers allow mods to get away. Okay, so he doesn't have a manual caption. So, I assume the sentence is supposed to be that mods allow developers to get away with making unfinished games. Not the, not the other way around. So I think it's a mix-up of the order, but that said... I'm really curious what his answer is to why he thinks he dislikes this narrative. Way with creating unfinished games, or that developers create un It sounds different in regular speed. No shit, it sounds different. Whoa, it sounds different. I've always disliked the narrative that developers allow mods to get away with creating unfinished games, or that developers create unfinished games because they know modders will pick up the slack. Okay, so there was a part two to that sentence. Or that mods will, or what the fuck, what? But developers create unfinished games because they know modders will pick up the slack. Because they know modders will pick up the slack. Or that developers make unfinished games because they know modders will pick up the slack. He, this is a narrative that he dislikes. Oh yeah, you guys didn't realize? Yeah, this is what he, this is how fast he talks and one in normal speed. I didn't slow him down. This is him slowed down. Such ideas are unpalatably cynical, even for me, and my capacity for cynicism is not easily reached. Let me get this straight. Let me get this straight. Let me get this straight. Okay, so, you went on an eight-minute tear about how the dungeon design of Skyrim is super cynical, that there's a preset limit of time, that there's, that, like, an optimal dungeon length, that there's a quest for every dungeon, that there's loot at the end, that it's all cynical, that it's all designed to create this addictive experience. And that didn't set off your limit for cynicism. And you might say, well, that was ironic, okay? He was saying that he, he admitted that he doesn't actually think that. But it's like, pick a fucking lane, dude. Arbeth, like... What do I say? How do you, re how do you respond to this? You dislike the narrative that mods allow developers to create unfinished games because it sounds too cynical for you. I can be the Dunmer again. No problem. I think that the, um, I think they're both cute. Is he kicking his legs out again? It, well, it's like... This now he's not even bothering to like put the stool back up. He's just like kicking the stool around the room. Lanes are gay. I drive on the sidewalk. <laughs> Why is your stream perpetually quiet? Um, that's just the way it is. That's just the way it is. As long as it's consistent, it shouldn't be an issue. 
I've had a lot of people, like, I occasionally get some guy who's like, the stream's really quiet, and then, like, everybody will be like, no, please, for the love of God, do not turn the stream up. be a better place. I've always disliked the narrative that developers allow mods to get away with creating unfinished games, or that developers create unfinished- Okay, so, I've always liked may imply that after the sentence ends, he's gonna go, but Bethesda actually, but this, but this sentiment does actually apply to Bethesda or something. Finished Please. games because I know- Please. Modders will pick up the slack. Such ideas are unpalatably cynical, even for me, and my capacity for cynicism is not easily reached. Also, if it were true, we'd see a lot more big budget games with thriving modding communities. When you make a mod for Warcraft 3, Blizzard has a thing in their end user license agreement that says that they own the mod. I agree with that take. No, that take is stupid. Here's why it's stupid. Okay. Developers don't want you modding Anthem or whatever fucking microtransaction riddled nightmare you're playing. Because if you mod in the microtransaction content, then you're going to give them less money. That's why most developers and publishers are hostile to mods. Bethesda's innovating in the industry by figuring out how to monetize other people's mods. ...reached. Also, if it were true, we'd see a lot more big budget games with thriving modding communities. What? NFTs aren't a scam, otherwise we would see more scammers doing it. That, that's the kind of sentiment that I'm getting. That, that, which is like, that was unironically where the NFT conversation was like six months ago, and now look where we are six months later. Well, I do, I do wish you luck. I hope you meet some measure of justice, but I hope you don't live in America. But yeah, it, it's like, um, this is an abusive mindset that the companies have. But since other companies have different abusive mindsets, then it's probably just isn't true. Today I learned if you go to Amand Mortier after being told about him by the Night Mother and ignore Astrid, he just won't spawn. Very cool and logical gameplay. Thanks, Bethesda. I thought you... Um... I... Well, let's see. Okay, so I went... I talked to Astrid first. I went before Astrid approved me going and got the contract anyways. So are you saying if you get the if you get the message to go to Amon Motier and then somehow like dodge Astrid and leave the sanctuary that he doesn't show up? Because like that's a really weird kind of thing to do. Well, I thought about selling my um my Elder Scrolls video thumbnails as NFTs. I think that would be an interesting way to make a little bit extra money. But, I mean, that would come with the caveat that um, you're not... Here's the thing. I Unless it's, like, baked into the NFT, I don't think you're buying the copyright on the image. You don't own the image. You just own a transaction receipt that refers to the image. easily reached. Also, if it were true, we'd see a lot more big budget games with thriving modding communities. That said, I also dislike the idea that the existence of mods, which may fix a game's flaws, serve as a get-out-of-jail-free card when it comes to discussions of those flaws. Okay, so... <laughs> as he was kicking the stool around the room, 
uh, miraculously, it like banked off the wall, landed on its feet, like hobbled a bit, but then got like completely set up. And he immediately like leapt up on top of the stool and grabbed the noose, and then immediately like kicked the kicked the fucking stool out under from under him again, like. <laughs> Oh my god. I don't like the narrative that Bethesda's using mods to get away with being lazy because it's cynical, but I also don't like that people use mods to defend Bethesda. Like, oh my god, pick a lane. Mods, which may fix a game's flaws, serve as a get-out-of-jail-free card when it comes to discussions of those flaws. This is for several reasons. Firstly, most people don't even use mods. Secondly, mods can come with um, their own- Um, uh, uh, what? Most people don't use mods. Are you actually, unironically, actually of, like, the unironic belief that most people don't use mods? They have mods on the fucking Xbox. Most people who play on PC mod it. Most people who play on PC can access mods. I'm going to say that there's a fair chance most people who aren't playing fucking modded Skyrim use mods. Hell, I'm pretty sure most of the fucking videos I've watched have been playing modded Skyrim. What? When was this video released? April of this year. So it was already... Modding was already well and thriving on the consoles. This is not like the best takes of 2014. This is current year positions. Pre-anniversary edition, sure, but... It's like... <laughs> Come on. Really? Have you watched the I Never Forgot You White Run Guard Skyrim Anniversary video? It'll make you happy. I don't know. This sounds cringe. It's not like a meme video, is it? What the fuck? One second. There's a situation going on.
All right, so we had a minor situation. Yeah, the yeah, the software will freak out as I like get repositioned. <laughs> sometimes sometimes she gets possessed. This is the deal. Yeah, there was a what the fuck was that situation over the uh, station intercom. Can we have the model freak out for a bit longer? How do I fake? Do you, why do all these VTubers have the bored, droopy-eyed expression? My, this one's more, this one's more open-eyed than the others. I don't know what you're talking about. Whoops, that's me. Uh, I got pictures of all of them. So we got the Dunmer girl. We got the Orc girl. Where's the Dwimmer girl? And we got the Dwimmer girl. I'm sorry, but the Dunmer girl does not have the same eyes. Alrighty, let's, um... Let's get back to it, then. problems and I don't just mean in regards Can we go back to the most people don't use mods part communities that said I also dislike the idea that the existence of mods which may fix a game's flaws serve as a get out of jail free cards when it comes to discussions of those flaws this is for several reasons firstly most people don't even use mods secondly mods can yeah uh, you said that with a uh, with, with such confidence Yeah, okay, I think that guy actually, like, nailed the basis of, like, Sundari characters. Because what you can't have is definitely something most people are attracted to. Like, chicks like that don't really exist. Or the ones that do, you don't want. Come with their own problems. Would that be verifiable? Uh, it would be tricky, but I mean, you know, let's, let's implement some basic logic here. I think like half of the pl Skyrim active Skyrim player base is on PC and then like the other half is split between the Xbox and the console. Somebody did the numbers on this before. It was like 25k on average on PC and then like as much on consoles. It's harder to tell cuz I think I don't know if there are clear like numbers for number of people playing games on consoles, but that was the estimation. Um one can figure that most people who play on PC are probably at least going to be running the unofficial patch. Now, the thing is, if you're running the unofficial patch, congratulations, you're playing modded Skyrim. Um, it's like the most innocuous of mods, but the unofficial patch does change a few things that I disagree with. Um, the other thing is that the console versions now have access to mods. It's not 2012 anymore. Um, they special The big thing about Special Edition was giving them that access. So it's like, and, and the unofficial mods at patches, I believe, are on console as well. So the reality is that chances are pretty good most people are using mods. I mean, from the simple fact that I would say the bulk of people who play without mods are typically either playing like the cutting edge new like anniversary edition right now or are people who make YouTube videos about Skyrim. 
Too bad we can't have naughty mods on consoles. Yeah, that's the that's the lame part is like if I'm not playing for a video, I typically put like a uh, breast mod on. Not like I don't go for like uh, the chonky breasts. I just want like free nipples. What is it about unofficial patch I disagree with? Unofficial patch fixes a lot of things that I don't consider to be broken with Skyrim. And that's a pretty common sentiment. It's sort of, um, they've sort of transitioned into, because it's like, how much can you fix Skyrim over time? So over, uh, the longer that you spend fixing Skyrim, the more you're going to start getting into stuff that might not be broken. Longs of Skyrim for immersion. Sometimes I go that route. The issue is, um, I don't know if there's a penis mod that actually has like physics, which I would consider a pretty essential part. If I'm going to see someone running around naked, I better see it flopping around. Otherwise, because if it's just like static and stuck in place, it takes the immersion away. So I'd rather have people have like their bottom kind of underwear. But yeah, like I like breasts. Oh yeah, I was supposed to put an image up. Bucket. Does this make you a coomer? No, I just like, um, you know, I'm like the Romans. I don't mind artwork that has nudity. It's just like, you know, nudity is part of the human experience. I typically don't play with, like, a sex mod, if that's what you're asking. And I don't just mean in regards to a game's stability, which certainly can be a factor for the over enthusiastic mod user, but also in regards to the content of the mod itself. Just because you claim to fix something, doesn't mean you fix it well. Just... Sure, but I feel like this is at odds with prior statements. Ask the guy who did my roof. Thirdly, mods are separate entities from the game itself, and both the game... I got the joke, trust me. Don't typically, huh? Well, I would imagine if you're going to get into modding Skyrim, you're going to try it at least once just to see how it is. But no, I haven't done it in years, uh, pretty much since I stopped being a horny teenager, basically. Ask the guy who did my roof. Thirdly, mods are separate entities from the game itself, and both the game and the mod deserve to be judged as such. And lastly, mods aren't retroactive. Oblivion's level scaling is poorly implemented, and no mod in the world will ever change my mind because that mod is not strictly a part of Oblivion, and that mod will not allow me to go back in time and replay that game with the mod in place. It sounds like a lot of cope to just say, look, it's a different game. If someone has reached the point where they're complaining about something, there's a good chance the damage has already been done. So mods are a difficult aspect to discuss when analyzing a game, which is why, despite their monumental importance to the Elder Scrolls series, I've relegated their discussion to a truncated off-topic tangent to be carefully taken before quickly course correcting back to my original point, which- Before to quickly kick the legs out from under the stool once again. You're gonna break the stool if you keep kicking it. And then how are you going to hang yourself? I feel like he's just mentioning the mod issue because it's expected of him, but he's got nothing to say of any value about it. Yeah, that's the weird thing is like... Okay, so you have nothing to say about mods. One sentence, if that. Which is that mods are one of the best ways to add replayability to a game, and the Elder Scrolls games repeatedly show this. 
The idea of heavily modding a game is almost as enjoyable as the end result, because through change, mods are able to reintroduce excitement back into some- Jesus, what Christ. What did you do to Skyrim? Good lord. Thing that's excitement may previously have been sucked dry. Oh, and remember, in case anybody forgot. And the fact that the Elder Scrolls fanbase are so in love with mods might partly be because mods act as a very effective supplement to one of Skyrim's major deficiencies. Quantity does matter in these games. The size of these worlds is part of what makes them so believable, and it's part of what makes the prospect of exploring them so enticing. But the pursuit of quantity doesn't matter so much that it should be allowed to justify a decrease in quality. With Radiant Quests, the vast number of dungeons, dungeon repopulation, and legendary skills, it feels like Bethesda are creating their game for a type of player that doesn't even exist. Skyrim doesn't need to be never-ending, and it doesn't benefit from this approach, but if Bethesda did want to achieve the degree of quantity that they seem to- Sometimes I just like being a bounty hunter. What, the Skyrim fans are so in love with mods, but we don't play with any? Yeah, that's a weird bit. Elder Scrolls fans love mods, but most people don't use them. Like, what the fuck? I genuinely dislike any mod discussions and analysis it completely nulls the integrity as you're changing the foundation that you're analyzing. Yeah, that that's sort of my perspective. I, the way I see it is, as long as you're like transparently clear about what you changed and the fact that you understand the basis of the original, I don't see too big an issue. Like, if you were to say, I am reviewing a modded copy of Skyrim, here's my mod list, I wouldn't have that big an issue with it as much as I'm talking about like the white light style of I'm talking about Skyrim perks, but I'm showing modded Skyrim perks. Maybe he's talking about console players. Console players have mods now, so again. The want their games to include, focusing on increasing replayability is probably the best solution. At this point, it seems we've reached the stage where I'm struggling to talk about these games without veering off into what I would do differently territory, which I guess means it's about time to wrap this month-long, life-consuming project up. Wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. So, what's wrong with uh, what I would do? What, what's wrong with that approach? Because, yeah, you're kind of making me realize that in the past 80 minutes, you haven't really... I don't think he's at once proposed his his fix, his alternative. He said, I could propose um, a better perk system for lock picking in my sleep, and then he moved on. There are certain things every game can improve at. For example, it's always possible that a game could have better graphics, better writing, better gameplay, more content, and so on. When one game noticeably drops the ball in a certain one of these areas, we might say that this game should have been better in this regard, but most of the time we don't need to say these things, because while it would of course be nice if a game was better in these areas, everyone knows this already. Okay, but I'm sure the people who are making it, or the people who make other games, might want to know how it could be better. Like, let's think about it like this. You're making a game and you're inspired by Skyrim, but you want to understand the, the faults and the iniquities so that you don't make those same mistakes. Wow, wouldn't it be nice if there were people on YouTube who did that? I mean, that's like a minority of the people who watch these videos. Um, 
the I would say the majority of people who watch analysis videos are like looking for a therapy group. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's like so you're basically saying that you can't criticize things because we already know that things deserve like that everything could be better. Like okay, one, no shit, but two what? <laughs> Bethesda says 8% of players use mods in Skyrim, but with only 14% of retail sales being on PC, that puts like 50 to 60% of PC players using mods. How do they know that? Are they basing it on... Are they basing it... Uh, the only way I think they would know that is if they were using mods through the Bethesda client. Most PC players would probably be using mods through the Nexus or the Steam Workshop. Oh, fuck, the, yeah, the Steam Workshop. Oh yeah, I forgot the, the most cynical of answers. We make, we make analysis videos so that people have noise to listen to while they work. Sorry, if he has criticism, he's expected to qualify that criticism with reasoned alternative approaches, which isn't hard conceptually which is isn't hard conceptually if you have robust criticism. Skyrim's an ex girlfriend, just admit it. Well, I have been wanting to make a Skyrim video for the better part of the last decade, so. I mean, yeah. But it's like, um. I don't know, what is the sentiment? First, you stab us in the back by saying that we shouldn't use gameplay loops as lenses, and now you're saying, you're like, I can't have glasses, and now I just can't have eyes. Like, what? Well, okay, so the thing I haven't brought up with the most people not using mods thing is you have to factor in the number of people who have started Skyrim, played a couple hours, and then, like, moved on with their lives. Like, maybe they didn't see the appeal, or maybe something came up, or it's just, like, it's not their kind of game. Like, there's a lot of people who've started Skyrim who would be, like, contributing to that um, most people don't use mods kind of narrative. I'm assuming that, like my perspective is if we're talking about the people who play Skyrim we're talking about people who make it past like the 10 hour mark and I would imagine most of those people are going to like they're going to have an issue at some point and they're going to look it up and then they're going to be like oh there's this unofficial patch and then install that and bam say these things because while it would of course be nice if a game was better in these areas everyone knows this already and the people who actually made the game will know it better than most. After all, a creator has an intimacy with their creation's flaws that other people will never understand. But there is a different type of criticism that can be made, one that's arguably more important. So, um, do you have a comment section? Do you allow people to criticize your videos even though you intimately know your own creation's issues more than most people? I can say that's true. I know my own issues more than uh, most of the people in my comment section. Oh, but look at this! Oh, weird. Hmm. Rather than focusing on the end result, you can instead be critical of the thought process taken to get there, the reasons behind the game, the design philosophy. Skyrim isn't what they could do better an element of that? <sighs> What's with the angry Joe memes? Full highest rating that I can issue, 10 out of 10, and it easily earns the badass seal of approval. And as such, Skyrim for Switch gets an easy 7 out of 7. That's the, uh, that's the Angry Joe memes. 
I would say the badass seal of approval is more like the broken condom of the relationship. I didn't know anyone out there still used a day theme for their YouTube client. I do on my second browser. What got it started? Uh, one of the first videos we watched was the Angry Joe video. Unlike stream two or something. Might have even been like stream one. But um, yeah, it's just kind of stuck with us after that. Stream would benefit from better combat. But that goes without saying. And even That goes without saying, so why bother? Even if we know nothing of the Elder Scrolls 6, we can still be confident that efforts will be taken to improve combat. Really? Really? You can say that with certainty. Because the only direction Bethesda goes is up, right? That's what they've done so far, is go up. What do I say? What do I say? It is what it is. What can you do? That doesn't guarantee those efforts will be a success, but an attempt will be made. Are you sure? Yeah, oh yeah. Creators always, artists always endeavor to improve. Really? Uh, is there... Do you listen to music? There's never been a band that fell off for you? There's never been a series that got worse over time? Oh no, it's it's clearly a me thing. It's clearly my subjective interpretations that are the issue. It's that... It's not that the Bethesda games are getting worse. It's that we invented gameplay loops. Bethesda games were better when there was no way to analyze them because they were just better. We made them worse. It was us. This guy's like a, I don't want to, okay, that would be mean. But I was going to say, this guy's like a, like a child with his optimism. Like, Bethesda always has to get better. Like, as a creator, you have to know full well that there is a point in your life where you may consider phoning it in with your videos. You know that, right? You have to know that. So you're saying the same thing can't happen to Bethesda? Bethesda's always going to endeavor to improve their games? Why? Why bother? Why bother? Clearly they found the formula for success. Why would they change it? Improve combat. That doesn't guarantee those efforts will be a success, but an attempt will be made. However, there are other areas that I believe to be just as, if not more important, to any future game success that won't necessarily receive any attention and that might not even be considered problems by the ones making the game, and three of these in particular seem worthy of greater consideration. In the first video in the series, I tried to explain why people like these games so much and how Morrowind got many things right. In the second video, I looked at the changes made by Oblivion and argued that the results brought by these were mixed. In this video, I tried to do something a little- In this video, I didn't really do anything and argued that the results brought by these were mixed. In this video... I am cranky. We are literally 81 minutes into this video and he's basically admitting that he just wasted all our time. I tried to do something a little different, however. The first two parts were meant to examine the changes Skyrim made and what the actual game is like to play, but the final three parts of this video were each meant to lead into one of these three larger problems that I believe have come to define Bethesda's approach to game design. These are... How the worlds have come to be designed as video games first. How exploration is no longer a part of the core gameplay. Why isn't it? Most people would argue the opposite. That exploration is, like, more focused on in Skyrim. Because there's more open world stuff to find. Like, I was not convinced with your exploration point. It's a metaphor for Bethesda. There you go. You figured it out. And lastly, how meaningful choice and replayability have been made too low a priority. The first of these is still the most important in my eyes. 
Skyrim is a world of dungeons, and dungeons are artificial constructs centered around the player. Dungeons shouldn't feel like the main focus of these worlds. These games have always featured dungeons, there are advantages of dungeons, dungeons don't need to be removed, but the world shouldn't revolve around them. This is in part because the dungeons just aren't good enough to carry so much of the game's weight, but more importantly, it's because dungeons aren't the reason people are drawn to these games. They aren't the highlights of the time players spend in these worlds. Why are you speaking for me? Why are you speaking for me? I have a, I have a Oblivion mod that is literally nothing but one long dungeon. And there are people who leave unironic comments that say it's fun. You can't speak for everybody. There are absolutely people out there who play these games for the dungeons. V is one person. Old, they aren't the reason the series became a success, and they aren't worthy of so much of the game's focus. Dungeons have improved with each game in this series, but the rest of the world almost seems to have been forgotten. Skyrim cities are tiny. The capital, Solitude, has 17 buildings. There are 195 dungeons in this game, but the capital city of this entire province only gets 17 buildings. The entire population of Skyrim is 1,016. This is every single named character in the game. Meanwhile, in an 80 hour playthrough, the number of people I've killed is 1,221. So, just the bandit population that has died by my hands is greater than the entire population of Skyrim. And don't even get me started on the quest design again. People are right when they say Oblivion has- No, I don't think you ever started on the quest design. <laughs> you, I, oh yeah, there was somebody who got really bothered. Um, let me pull it up. They got really bothered by the lamp shading comment, um, which was funny. Let's see. I just look up. And it'll either crash the file explorer or... This one. This was on the Salt Factory stream. Lampshading? Did you really say he was lampshading the Frost Spell acquisition as if, it ma as if that mattered? Which it does. I'm starting to see why Salt said it might seem like you wanted to hate his last video. You have a knack for making a big, a bit deal out of minuscule details. Frankly, I don't care for either you personally, but that seems a bit much. Lamp shading. Wow. So then I like, um, I actually pulled up the definition of lamp shading. So. Now here's the definition of what lamp shading means. And I didn't. I wasn't 100% clear on what it meant, but it actually applied a lot more than um, than I thought it would. Lampshade hanging, or more informally, lampshading, is the writer's trick of dealing with any element of the story that threatens the audience's willing suspension of disbelief, whether a very implausible plot development or a blatant use of a trope, by calling attention to it and simply moving on. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I posit the idea that all Salt Factory did for two hours was call attention to things and simply move on. So in other words, Salt Factory's video was lampshading. Thanks for attending my TED talk. But uh, yeah, this was a funny thing that I kind of wanted to share with the stream. Skyrim. And don't even get me started on the quest design again. People are right when they say Oblivion has better quests than Skyrim, but it's not because of the writing. It's because Oblivion has more variety in quest objectives, and overall, less dungeon-related tunnel vision. Mixed bag. I talked about most of the good quests in my Oblivion video, and that took like 20 minutes, so I don't know if there's actually that many good kind of side quests. The Elder Scrolls games set themselves apart from so many others by creating worlds that were bigger, more immersive, and more interactive. 
these traits still make these games stand out, but they're all for nothing if the design of these worlds doesn't place enough importance on its believability. For these games to live up to their full potential, the world design has to be allowed to take priority over the way their worlds function as games. Why? What if people want the main focus of the game to be the mechanics or the dungeons? This seems like your philosophy. It doesn't seem like a... Um, like you're not providing it... Like it's okay if this is your way of looking at things, but why? What's your argument? What's your position? Are you going to make it? Or are you going to do what you've done this entire video and say that like it was a joke or that you didn't actually mean it? To that end, exploration should be embraced. For this to be achieved, exploration needs to have more to it than Oblivion or Skyrim provide it. Maybe the easiest way to accomplish this would be to introduce more limited quest markers, as discussed in the previous video. This could be particularly effective when it comes to traveling around the overworld, as with the graphical fidelity... Uh, I'd hate to be the one to say this, but uh, have you tried not tracking the quest? Or have you tried just uh, not doing the quest? Because White Light had made that point. Um... I think there was white light, right? Because he said something to the effect of, like, maybe the best way to play Skyrim is to not do the main content in order. Maybe the best way to play Skyrim is to just go out in the world and explore. And that's sort of my thing is, like, if you want Skyrim to be about exploration, you could just go out into the world and see what you find. It's like saying No Man's Sky is not about exploration because there's a main quest to it. of a modern game, there's no reason mountains or ruins or other features can't serve as easily visible landmarks for the player to find through visuals alone. What about this isn't like that already? You can see a watchtower, you could go to it. If you go to the top of that watchtower, you would then see a bandit camp over in this direction. Or not a bandit camp, a giant camp. Again, this is a you thing. If you want to treat these games like you would just want to explore and see what's out there, there's nothing that stops you. There's also more radical solutions to the exploration problem. One thing I would love to see attempted is to remove the player from the map, so that the player must learn to take an active role in navigation. I think- I don't think Skyrim's map is good enough to do that. You can't have that stupid 3D map and expect the player to be able to navigate without the, without the player marker. allowing quest markers on a map with no player icons actually has greater potential for connecting exploration to gameplay in a fourth wouldn't you still just follow the compass if you didn't have a mark like what the fuck are you talking about your issue is that you can just follow the waypoint so how would there not being a player marker actually affect that okay so his radical solution way than the other way around, although there are reasons a major title might be hesitant to attempt such a thing. It would require a serious commitment to going against the norm, but that wouldn't be a first for the series. A norm that it set? Still, there are ways exploration could be improved just through learning from what works in Skyrim itself. Frostflow Lighthouse stands out as one such example. The point is, something needs to be done to incorporate exploration into the main activity players do in the game. Oh, something People always... Something always needs to be done. Somebody could fix this. But, you know, it's not me. I don't have any ideas. <laughs> Won't somebody do something? That This would result in players not looking at the map for easier routes, just directly running to the quest marker. Yeah, I don't see how that stops people from just following the compass which i thought was the whole fucking problem that he had in the first place was that there were quest markers on the compass that you're just incentivized to follow
something needs to be done to incorporate that. Oh my. What can you do? What can you do? <laughs> I mean, it's either this or someone armchair devving. Uh, but honestly, like, like, wouldn't you prefer to watch somebody's proposal for how they would fix Skyrim? As opposed to just, here are the problems. All right, I'll be here all week. Goodbye. exploration into the main activity players do in the game. People want to explore these worlds, so give them a reason to. Don't take players' desire to explore for granted. Armchair development is only bad if the person has like zero experience with development. Even like just taking a stab at making an indie game makes it a lot more valuable. But it's like there's no way, there's no way that you would rather watch this than to watch him actually try to, like, have ideas. In defense of this, I saw a guy make a perfect Fallout game that had a vault as a space station and made you ODST drop to the planet to build... S <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? Really? <laughs> that's the perfect Fallout game? I mean, that sounds like, uh, that sounds cool. But I don't think that's a good Fallout game. I don't know what the what can you do part is. Hang on. Man lives. We live in the opening salt factory. There we go. Mods fix it, so who cares, I guess, what can you do? Okay, so 917. Let's see if we can pull it up. All right. I don't know, throwing your weapon for lots of damage. Of course, all of this is answered with mods, so that kind of blows, but, you know, what can you do? <laughs> All right, so we got that queued up. Oh my god. How are we six and a half hours into this? And we didn't even start at the beginning. Do you understand? We didn't start at the beginning today. What can you do? Finally, if the Elder Scrolls is meant to be an easily accessible RPG, then that's okay. It's... Okay, that's, this is just like take after take. easy to understand why the series went in that direction from a commercial perspective. That's what many games have done to try to reach the widest audience possible, and with such a large audience, should come a budget that can do the scale and immersiveness of these worlds justice. Dark Souls should become accessible so that a large number of people can play it. That's basically what you're saying. Why the fuck would you ever appeal to any kind of niche? Accessibility, being able to people, be, people being able to play the game and uh, have their hand held the entire time? That trumps all else. And it's proven because Bethesda's successful. Like, this is his logic, okay? His logic in life is, if something makes a lot of money, then it must be right. NFTs, A-OK. -okay. People make a lot of money from NFTs. Offshore crypto casinos, A-OK. -okay. People make a lot of money from offshore crypto casinos. They're clearly designed very well. There's still eight minutes left, too. This. Also, have you seen Shirley Curry, aka Skyrim Grandma? That's pretty wholesome, and I don't want to be against that. 
but I don't see why. It was all worth it for the Skyrim grandpa or grandma. What the fuck is an offshore crypto casino? Okay, so uh, if there's any investors out there listening right now, I have an idea for a uh, a uh, a Caribbean development project that we could be working on that involves um, involuntary cessation of wealth. No, 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 wait, not invol voluntary cessation of wealth. Um, all you have to do is contact, get in contact with me. Um, I have a plan to get us uh, licensed and registered and as well as a marketing strategy in order to sell my um, offshore crypto casino idea. Minimum required investment, probably like $200,000. I mean, I'm willing to put my own money in, but I don't have very much money. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I, I can pull it off, but I need sort of seed investment money. Increasing the number of meaningful choices in either character building or the narrative has to mean inaccessibility. If you want to make a game that has pretty wholesome, and I don't want to be against that, but I don't see why increasing the number of meaningful choices in either character building or the narrative has to mean inaccessibility. Really? You you don't get it. Okay, fine. You know what? Fuck it. I get it. I get why you don't get it. It's because you didn't look into it. Why does more character creation or content exclusivity mean accessibility? I'm not an ideas man. I'm willing to be like the, um, you know, the main mover for this operation. I just need a lot of money in order to actually get the casino off the ground. If you want to make a game that has lots of content, which Bethesda clearly do, replayability is the best way. If you want to make a game that has a lot of content, then you need to make that content replayable. Hmm. Huh, weird. If only there was some kind of fucking system that somebody came up with in order to make it so that there were repeating quests. Yeah, it's really weird. And then the most important thing, which we've already talked about uh, quite a bit, is events in the story manager. The story manager was a system that processes the events. So when an event is created, the story manager finds that event, or the event finds the story manager. You have to ask the programmers which order that goes in and it filters through a whole list of possibilities and says this event fits these criteria so I can kick off this responsive quest. Huh, weird. I think he means replayable as opposed to one infinitely long playthrough. Okay, but here's the thing. You want replayable quests you just where you just do the same quest over and over oh weird what the, there sounds familiar it sounds like someone came up with a system where you, you would do like an archetype of a quest repeatedly if you want to make a game that has lots of content which Bethesda clearly do replayability is the best way I feel like this is something that should be possible to prove mathematically. Like, replayability is by nature multiplicative rather than additive, therefore the amount of content can be increased exponentially. Bethesda wants to make replayability. Or no, Bethesda wants to make a lot of content based solely on the idea that Radiant Quests value quantity over quantity, so they should focus on replayability, because replaying the same static quests over and over is preferable to a system that generates new, I'll well, put new in quotes, quests.
that theory may need some additional work, but regardless, choice matters beyond replayability, and this is something that shouldn't be neglected. These are, of course, just what I believe to be the most important problems facing the city. It's just my subjective that there he goes, kicks that stool out. It's just my opinion. I'm not basing this on anything except my subjective interpretation. Like, well, thanks, I guess. Um. Series. These issues are connected to what I feel has been lost with time in more recent iterations, but they're also closely related to what I believe to be the most important aspects of these games, as identified in the first episode of this analysis. Bethesda's idea of the most important problems facing the series are probably not very similar to mine. The Elder Scrolls 6 may be a way off, but Fallout 4 is already a way in. And if it serves as any indication of Bethesda's design philosophy, it suggests that the role of dungeons as the center of their design universe remains as true as ever. Sure, but you have to take... Okay. When... Um, when evoking the name of our Lord and Savior Fallout, you always have to take things with the giant grain of salt that is the fact that it has a different design philosophy. Fallout 4 is... had the Okay, Bruce Nesmith was the lead designer on Skyrim. Emil Pagliarulo was the lead designer on Fallout 4. Okay? They're not both games that were designed by Bethesda Game Studios. Bethesda Game Studios does not exist. It's a group of people. It's not a mimetic egregore that designs games. Todd Howard, even as much, is a not really the designer. He's the executive producer. He tells the ship where to go, and then the lead designers come up with a way of getting the ship there. Pagliarulo and Nesmith have different philosophies when it comes to designing games, and that means that they have different sort of strategies. So while you can use Fallout as a litmus test of like where Elder Scrolls is going to go because they are tied together, you still have to again clarify things with a big grain of salt. In fact, Fallout 4 goes several steps further in this regard, with the introduction of a scavenging system designed to more closely connect the looting aspect of the gameplay loop with the character progression systems, as well as the introduction of randomly generated legendary enemies. It's not that different from Skyrim's. These and legendary weapons to add some of the addictive chance-based itemization of popular action RPGs. These additions may have positive ramifications on the core gameplay, but they also act as a stark reaffirmation of Bethesda's overall direction, and I wouldn't really expect any change from this. The reality is the changes made by Skyrim worked. This is a multi-award winning title. It's the best selling RP- Here we go again with this this logic. Um, Skyrim is one of the most, the most popular and best selling games of all time. So what can you do? Why bother? Let's just kill ourselves. PG of all time, and maybe this isn't in spite of the changes I've highlighted, it's because of them. Skyrim excels at its simple dungeon crawling formula. Players are drawn in by the visuals and scope of its world, and its gameplay loop is effortless to fall into and satisfying enough to keep many players engaged, so it's hard not to admit that in most ways, Skyrim should be considered a huge success. And Skyrim is a good game. And yet, after successfully coercing players to sink in enough time to put most other single player video games to shame, I don't think Skyrim leaves players with much to show for it. My guy, have you considered the possibility that those three people who left negative Steam reviews that had hundreds of hours were playing the modded versions of the game that you say are different? So they're not really playing Skyrim as much as they're playing their flavor of Skyrim, which could be a lot closer to classic Elder Scrolls game, hence why they're frustrated with default Skyrim. Oh, what, what a weird idea. I feel like this is like, um, like Groundhog, a Groundhog Day video where we're just like, we're just going back to the same points over and over, but it's like, we're not making progress with each iteration. And it's funny how much he hates loops considering this video is basically just like a series. It's like the Gordian knot of logic. Spending large amounts of time in this world doesn't make that world seem more believable, it does the opposite. You don't walk away with a plethora of interesting stories. 
and the destination doesn't seem to make up for many of the journey's shortcomings. Skyrim is a good game, and yet it could have been so much more than that, and years later its legacy doesn't look as bright as it once did. Many people have accused this game of being shallow and overly casual. There's a bitterness that permeates its discussions, an underlying sense of wasted potential from a once great company that lost its way, and I think this is mostly because Skyrim was good enough to make people want it to be better. The seed of the entire Elder Scrolls series is a promise of stepping into another world, of exploring, adventuring and losing yourself within its virtual confines. That seed is as apparent in Skyrim as it is any other game in this series, maybe even more so. There are many positive qualities this game has, and the advances in gameplay and graphics make that promise even more desirable than it's ever been before. But Skyrim... So I kind of zoned out there for a second. Um, yeah, I did ping everybody. So does it? I might have to do add everybody, add announcements, or something like that. Because I've been doing just add everyone for this series. Because uh, I don't know, seems like the thing to do. Oh yeah, this was gonna be a thing. If you're part of the Discord, um, I gotta turn it on. But if you're part of the Discord and you use a command, um, you'll be able to get a role that's supposed to be kind of semi-exclusive to uh, the people who come to the streams. Let's see. Alright, so if you're on the Discord and you use the command... I know it's it's white, so it's hard to see. Go back to Tunner <laughs> Waifu, please. Uh that should work. I'll test it real quick. Yeah, it works. So yeah, you can use that command and you will get a, a, a stream rank. Now there's no guarantee that it's actually exclusive and it, maybe not just like people who are on the Discord at that moment, but um, people want, I, I wanted to give a rank to, because there's no, like there hasn't been a way to get a rank on the, on the Discord server for a while and there's a lot of like new people. So I set that up for you guys to make people want it to be better. The seed of the entire Elder Scrolls series is a promise of stepping into another world, of exploring, adventuring, and losing yourself within its virtual confines. That seed is as apparent in Skyrim as it is any other game in this series, maybe even more so. There are many positive qualities this game has, and the advances in gameplay and graphics make that promise even more desirable than it's ever been before. But Skyrim failed to deliver on that promise to many who played it. Okay, so Skyrim had a promise, but it didn't kind of deliver. I'm going to... Yeah, I'm going to change the role priority so that the patricians are above it. Uh, that only makes sense to me, like, the longer you've been in the server. Oh yeah, and please do it in the announcements channel. <laughs> so, hang on. That should ease up the, um, the spam. All right. Its world invites you to look closely, but then fails to live up to that higher degree of scrutiny. Exploration seems like it should be exciting, but soon reveals itself to be shallow. And to achieve its vast quantity of content, the believability of the world itself ended up being undermined. At 13 minutes and 37 seconds into the first video in this series, I referred to the fanbase of these games as being like jaded ex-lovers. I postulated that this might explain the flavor of criticism. Oh, weird. There was somebody in the chat who described it that way as well. Hmm. I wonder why they did that. I can see that there's already a, a shit show going on in the Discord server. That's pretty funny.
Oh yeah, didn't somebody ask for the waifu? Yeah, I, I forgot to do that. I can switch it. I think she's a she's a more wholesome girl than um She's a more wholesome girl than the uh orc girl, but I, I find the orc girl more desirable. But yeah, like okay, here's this logic again. You have hundreds, if not thousands, of hours in Skyrim. That means you can't actually not like it. And it's like, dude, my, my guy, in this very video, you said that people play with mods that make it not Skyrim anymore. So, like, what the fuck's your point? Like, I have a lot of hours in Skyrim, but how many of those hours were actually Skyrim? And how many of those hours were my mod list that changed Skyrim into, like, a hardcore kind of survival game? I'm into the mean and green. Yeah, I, the Dwemer waifu is definitely the odd one out. And well, you'll have to wait until the uh, Bosmer uh, Femboy model comes along. Oh, yeah. Keep to the VTuber gimmick. Way higher engagement. I think it's fun. Um, because not only are, is there a way for you to, like, see... You can see when I'm looking at chat. So I'm looking at chat, and now I'm looking at the screen. And you can also see kind of my expressions when I do stuff. So I think it's a it's a positive kind of addition. Waifu Dagoth Ur? Oh god, you reminded me of a picture. Never mind. Never mind. Criticism these games receive. With the implication being not just that this criticism comes from a place of emotion, but also that this criticism is in some ways, a kind of backhanded compliment. But if these games were good enough to make people fall in love with them in the first place, then that still says something in their favor. There are... Sure. Can we get back to the part where you don't think it's valid to, like, propose alternatives for the game? There are a lot of open world games these days, but I don't think any have done what the Elder Scrolls games do and done it better. For all their flaws, that childlike dream of stepping into another world is still more alive in these games than any others in my eyes. Which is why I have a disregard of that. I don't know. I'm fucking ready to move on. I'm about done with this shit. Dream shown in Skyrim's own design is disappointing to me. And the fact that Skyrim is a good game despite this and became the best selling RPG of all time just makes it seem like that dream is closer and closer to being lost. I suppose now that you wait a second it being the most successful game does it mean it's good oh weird how odd was this the stream that has the guy constantly saying people love skyrim because it's skyrim or some shit Kind of. This is the this is definitely the guy who like undermines all of his own arguments. I don't think we actually need your video now. Never's got it unlocked. Well, he figured it out. Um, if you're a deconstructionist and you say that uh, acad academics is for the gays, then um, yeah, I, I pick own. You've stuck with me for five hours. I should admit that the basis of my ex-lover theory comes from personal experience. I love this series. The Elder Scrolls I've got bad news for you, guy. We've we, well, okay. To be fair, we have been streaming this video for you know, almost seven hours, but um, mm -mm -mm, I did not watch the Morrowind part, and I watched the Oblivion part when it came out months ago. So uh, I'm not your ex-lover, pal. First serious long-term relationship of my gaming dating life. Oh please. Skyrim's jealous f for fucking Minecraft. <laughs> Come on. Really? What's my most played game on Steam? Let's look. Uh, Where is it that I look? Is it 
games. Sort by playtime. My most played game on Steam is GTA 5. And that's because of GTA Online. I played a bunch of cringe GTA Online. Yeah, it is cringe. Um, my second most played game is Rainbow Six Siege. Oh, wow. My third most played game is Sid Meier's Civilization V. My fourth most played game is Skyrim, the standard edition. So if you add the two editions together, then Skyrim's my second most played game on Steam. But I mean, then there's like, there's Arma, uh, Warframe, because I, I, I played Warframe a long time ago. Terraria, I have a bunch of hours in Metal Gear Solid V, Total Warhammer 2, Mordhau. So it's like, come on. Really? This is the argument you're going to make? I'm the 8-hour Skyrim guy, and Skyrim's not my most played game. Who do I main on Siege? Um, Attack? Uh, but when it was good, I would say my main on Attack was... Usually Buck. Now it's... I don't know. I haven't. I haven't played it in a couple weeks. Uh, my on defense before, before the shitting, the shittening. I played a lot of Caviara, um, and I also played a lot of Mute. And then post shittening, I would say Cade is pretty good. Rifleman, four hundred meters west. Yeah, I did that a lot. I never played Roblox. If time spent with a game denotes that I'm in a relationship with it, Dota 2 is my abusive one. <laughs> yeah. What's my opinion on ESO? I don't care for it. I thought it was the one that it understood me that of all the games that I made, it was the one that was designed just for me. Of all the movies, I thought that Avengers Endgame was the one for me. But after five hours of analysis, I've realized that it's not. I guess I was young and naive. I didn't understand that things would change for both of us. A lot has happened since those early days, but I'll always cherish those. I'm sorry, but this is a cringy framing device. Memories. I've never felt as connected to any virtual world as I did With you back then and now I'm getting older I wonder if I'll ever feel that way about the virtual world again I know you've got an older too I guess you've moved on but I still wonder sometimes nope you... nope 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 it's still the same fucking game come on come on really if if it's changed if Skyrim has changed for you over time it's because you were dumb and now you finally figured out you're less dumb now I, I view that with a lot of like, oh, these games are getting older. No, you were dumb. You didn't know better. Now you know better. But guess what? It didn't take us. It didn't take me five fucking years to figure out that Skyrim had these issues. It didn't take me until Fallout 76 to realize that Bethesda was on the downhill. miss it and i know you've achieved a lot it's incredible really looking at how far you've come but you had a passion back then there was a spark you understood what it meant to dream and i just hope you still understand that do you think it's a hot take now to say morrowind actually has the best combat of the three primary tez installments i think that that's become something that is more acceptable to say as time has gone on and it's gotten easier to kind of understands Morrowind's combat in a way. And it's not that, like, people's perspective on the combat's changing. It's that... For a long time... 
I don't know how to I don't know really how to explain it. Morrowind's combat accomplishes something. And for a long time the mistake was people assuming that it was trying to be like a um it was trying to be like an action system. The you know, it was like it, it's a realistic night fighting game. And I think it took the advent of good kind of melee combat games like Mortal or Kingdom Come Deliverance to kind of realize what Morrowind was actually going for. It's because of Morrowind fans gatekeeping the shit out of the fandom. The only thing I've noticed is that the gatekeeping increases the further I come along. If anyone's being gatekept, it's the fucking Morrowind fans from their preferred games. Like, honest to God, some of the proposals I made in the Oblivion video were like, wouldn't it be nice if we made a system that was both accept like we you had an option in the menu that could be accessible but it could also appeal to hardcore gamers and then people would come along and just be like um you're gatekeeping people who want easy games and it's like no i'm opening the gate to people who want the games to be more hardcore i'm making the community for everybody that's not gatekeeping that's opening the fucking door But I agree the gatekeeping is not inherently bad. You do need some level of... Uh, you need somebody at the gate to keep all the shitters out. I will play... I promise I'll play Kingdom Come Deliverance again sometime. Um, that... Okay. The, the thing about that video was it was like the wrong place, wrong time for me. Um, but even at the time, I could tell, like, this is something I'll like. I'm just not at the right place to do it yet. Because when I was trying to do it, was, like, uh, after the Dishonored 2 video, which was, you know, post-Morrowind, after Dishonored 2, I'm starting to enter into the slump. Um, and I made the right call, which was to put my priority on the Oblivion video and on, like, the side projects that people would actually want to see. So, like, and after... After King the Kingdom Come video failed, you know, I, the next video I made was Battlefront 2 that got 700k. And then the video after that was the Harry Potter video that got 300k. And then I made Metal Gear Survive. It isn't a popular video, but I also consider it one of my successes because it exposed a lot of people to Tetramore. Um, which was more so the goal for me. Like, the whole reason I picked that game, honestly, was because it was something that I could collaborate uh, with Met Tetramore on. Um, so even if that video is, like, only at, like, 30,000 views, the fact that he went from, like, 70, or, like, 70 subscribers or something to, like, he's at, like, 1.1 thousand now, um, I widely consider to be a success. And if you haven't, and you're looking for something to kind of listen to, um, this channel's pretty good. I like this video. I like this video. I like this video. I'm biased, so I can't tell you about this video, about whether I like it or not. But I like his part in it. So, uh... Yeah, that's, that's my that's my shill for the day. But yeah, I think if the Kingdom Come Deliverance had happened at a different time, I would have been more likely to actually finish it. Yeah, I know, that that's why I went to his main channel page. I'm kind of... I'm keeping it up so that everybody's aware. Um, that it exists. I hear you're with a new guy now. One with more money than me. Oh my fucking god. You're a cuck. You're a cuck in your own metaphor. You're a fucking cuck. Really? Why would you... I hope it works out for you. I moved on too, you know. Actually, I ended up starting a YouTube channel. You never guess what it's about. And it's been going pretty well. Although sometimes the videos do get a little weird. <clears throat> well, this isn't exactly how I expected I'd end this series. But here we are. Hey, Elder Scrolls, if you're listening... You, you literally... Me... Not only are you a cuck, you're like fat bastard cuck. Yep, sometime. We should... Go for a coffee. You know, 
catch up on old times. All right, fuck it. I'm going to put this video out of its misery. Oh my god. Yeah, there was no possible way I could have finished this last week. Someone was like, oh, you just got to get over the hump of that part. It gets better. It did not get better. All right, hang on. I'm going to... We're going to take a small break, if not stop entirely. But I want to get some opinions out there. Not what you expect. Not how you expected. You did use the script, right? Well, I mean... Even with a script, occasionally things don't, like, turn out differently. So, um... I'm going to ask a few questions, and um, I want you guys' opinions, okay? Okay. What score did it get? Uh, I, that, that's actually what we're about to do. I want to score all the videos we watch. So, I, the place to start. Uh, what did we think of Never Knows Best video? 1 to 10. Take the whole thing into consideration. Don't let the the don't let the cringy ending fully influence your uh, opinions here. Hmm. Four seems kind of. I guess we'll start with this. Is it above or below average? Remember, we're working on the, um, we are working on the, yeah, see, we got a mix of above and below. We're working off of the fucking, um, the metric that is Skyrim videos. Alright, so I'm gonna, here's what I'll do. I'm gonna give it a four now. But we're gonna do the other videos and then we're gonna we're gonna loop back to this one and see if that score still applies. So uh now of course this question requires that you actually have seen the video or that you were participated in that stream. Angry Joe. How would we rate the Angry Joe video? Ten out of ten with the badass seal of approval. Ten out of ten. Come on, we're not giving it a ten. I rate the Angry Joe video uh, four hours out of ten. Four hours out of seven bucks in my pocket. It's got to be on the higher ends. We'll say a six. Remember, everything's relative to the Skyrim video, okay? Play the clip. Uh, okay, one second. Skyrim is a full, highest rating that I can issue. 10 out of 10. Now, I don't want to influence anybody's opinion on this, but this was the video that included this part. Online classes! Oh, that's a big one! And the OES cap cap! What, what the hell? Your day has finally come, corporate commander! So, uh, if anybody wants to amend their scores, you're free to, uh, speak up now. <laughs> Alrighty, next up, we're gonna say the zero punctuation video. Still 10 out of 10, 15 out of 10, 11 now. 5.5 .5 out of 10. What's the 5.5 .5 thing? All right, so where's zero punctuation at? We've just been cucked by Skyrim Allegory. We've already peaked by the, on the cringe meters. Yeah. Zero punctuation, 9 out of 10. Interesting choice. Sevens. 
Zero punctuation is about the same as Joe. I would say zero punctuation is was better than Angry Joe. I, I, I'll take action on a seven. All right. Salt Factory. Be sure to specify who you're talking about uh, when you get the score, because it can it'll get they'll get like mushed together. Where do we place the Salt Factory video? We got one, we got three, we got four, four, zero, one, three, four, three. I'll take action on a three. How about that? I can't even remember which one is which at this point. I guess that's a that's a fair point. We can um we can do a thing to jog your memory. So this was the essentially of the video. same importance. I mean, I get that I'm doing leftover contracts supposedly, but you're really going to play me like that? It's just laughable when the very last contract mission is supposedly something of the utmost importance and danger. All right, so how are we feeling about our scores? That's the that's the guy we're talking about. Yeah, it's the what can you do guy. It's the we did 10 hours of stream on him guy. I think it's a solid three. So next up is white light. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Now, let's see. We're... We're it's good. We'll jump to the middle. This was White Light. Well, it's hard to find something completely innocent and innocuous. There's always a secret. There's always something interesting to uncover. I entered a crack den once, only to find out it was a front for a vampiric drug operation. What about Yazolda, who's secretly been running a meth business the whole time? Or Rorik's dead, who are theorized to be entirely populated by Daedra worshippers? A lot to take in, huh? But they have fertile lands despite the tundra. There are no adult women in town despite two recent newborns, which means- I'm seeing like an average four. All right, next one is Mr. Arlo. White light five. We might, we might, hmm, hmm. I'll meet you in the middle, 4.5. All right, here's our boy Arlo. Wait, there's a good part. I want to include this was it's this guy get down the door and get down to business type do you want to fight or talk your way out of a situation whether by persuading or threatening there are just so many things to do and so many ways to play that you can basically play it forever and while adventuring is all well and good it's the skills you learn and the stuff you do between adventures that make it all the who chill out of 10 uh, we'll say two. All right, next up was Dime Tree. The year is 2011. Oh, no, the please. I'm going to get busted for copyright. Barely even notice. How are the dungeons? Well, they're pretty dungeony if you're into that sort of thing. Which I know you are. That's why you're trapped here, like the rest of us. And since you are- So that's Dime Tree. I see a two for Dime Tree. Two, two, wow. One, no, <laughs> two, one. All right, so he seems to be, Dime Tree seems to definitely be a solid two. So the highest score we've given so far is seven to zero punctuation. All right, Noah Caldwell, known racist and Ulfric Stormcloak collaborator, Noah Caldwell Gervais. Is this guy? Writing leaves you with the impression that you do. It's a game where costume, accent, and pre existing player expectations shape the kind of person you're interacting with. Unlike Dragon Age, your character will never have friends in Skyrim, just a limitless sea of vague acquaintances. They make sense and function well. Blacksmiths come across as blacksmiths, shopkeeps like shopkeeps, royalty like royalty. 
But if you're going to really enjoy Skyrim, oh, that see? has to be a satisfactory stopping point for how- Noah's all over the place. Okay, so we'll say seven. That seems to be a good medium of what everybody's giving. Don't let the zero punctuation score influence you. Kind of take things as they go. All right, now the big one. The big one. G-Man. Just even more frightening. These things still make me break oh, not out. This part, not this Always part. just walking in a mostly single direction. Sometimes flipping a switch or solving a fun game, but that doesn't excuse the base problems it has. Well, you may have a point. Anyway, I doubt there's going to be a mod out there that fixes this animation. I mean, just look at it. And on that note, Skyrim. All right, so we're G Man here. In my opinion, not to taint it. G-Man is currently the crowning king of um, of the Skyrim videos. So I'll definitely take action on an 8. What do you mean G-Man had nothing to say? G-Man had tons to say. Good lord. G-Man was the, was the stream that really turned this stuff around for me, honestly. He's like that little bit of hope that I could grab onto. Like, look at this. Okay, these are all the notes in 20 minutes that he said. And then... These are all the notes that Salt Factory said in two hours. So I'm sorry, but G-Man is like one of the best. Alrighty, next up, uh, DJ Peach Cobbler. Disclaimer. Skyrim? Yeah, it's this the, the disclaimer guy. He looking ghost right there. What's he doing here? Is he friendly? Stay away! I'm sorry. This isn't what I want. I'm sorry. This isn't what I want. Uh... What's going on? Somebody oh fuck, I forgot this part. Surprise, motherfucker. I wandered into a mysterious alchemist's cabin. Then I got trapped by a crazy necromancer after fighting through his army of ghost slaves. Alright, so two, three, two, one, two. You can't give him zeros, come on now. Copyright strike out of ten? Yeah. I've gotten more copyright strikes from YouTubers than I have media companies, so I'm I'm gonna take action on it too. Uh, Avarti is next. Nostalgia is a powerful thing. Yes, yeah, this guy. For freedom fighters or terrorists, depending on how you interpret them, to the often wacky Daedric Prince missions. The axe isn't the only item the old clavicus has. But a map packed with quests isn't all that it takes to have a compelling world. What ties the whole game together is its lore and story. Skyrim's tale might not be the most nuanced. Dragon Age Inquisition last summer, the first hurdle I encountered was the jargon and heaps of information that was thrown at me in the first few hours of the game. It can be intimidating to say the least. But I'll, I'll, okay, I'll take action on a four. I think that's pretty accurate. And then the last one is our homeboy. Private sessions. I know, I know. Poisoning the well and all that. Because I was still following the well-worn path I'd always tread these past nine years. But this was where the mods did a good job carrying my experience by making it feel fresh. The graphic mods alone made wandering this nine-year-old game an absolute visual feast that really brought the original work of Bethesda to life in a way 2011 console hardware could never have achieved. This really helps enhance something you'll get sick of hearing me mention. Immersion. This game is the definition of immersive video game experiences. So he's a complicated one because um, he was here for it. Um, he admits that it wasn't that good and we only we skip uh, the issue with this one is we skipped a lot of stuff with it. Some powerful artifacts of her own. Time resume once more and begins playing dumb with the Thalmor lackey who isn't able to get anything remotely useful out of the monk who just excuses himself and starts walking away. So that's kind of the issue. That That's definitely a score that's going to have to come with an asterisk because 
um, we skipped around to like all the analysis parts. All right, and now finally, I'll get your opinion again. What did we think? Now that now that you remember everything we've watched, what did you think of Never Knows Best? Now we're all over the board. So he's got a four so far. Never three, never a three, never takes a, never really takes a stance on controversial statements. I guess, but he also had the, he had the weird like deconstruction stuff. It was like, yeah, I'm not really going to propose any alternatives because I don't think that's like a thing we should do. You really need these to be done after the videos conclude. Well, yeah, but I can't, I don't have a time machine is the issue. So I'm going to try to do a better job of getting these um, in a more timely fashion. Never knows best video made money, so it's beyond criticism. Uh, well, when we first did the second one, um, we actually got ambushed by a sponsorship just randomly. Someone just posted this. All right, so let me um, let me get you guys the results of our little survey. Here we are. Here are the results. So the highest score is an eight. The lowest score is a two. Um, This is sort of the weird thing. Metatron isn't at the top. Well, Metatron's in like a... I have a tangential category for like all these videos that aren't directly reviews or analysis. They're just like... So Metatron's just focused on the Civil War aspect. Or I like I have one down there that's like... Uh, the music of Skyrim analysis. Um, that's where like strategy and Super Bunny Hop are. Um... Missing Will. I'm not sure. Will, again, is like a tangential. I wouldn't really say that... Um, that uh, Will kind of fits with what we're doing here. Jesus, I stopped watching two hours ago and you're still going. And your name's Will. So you think I'm talking about you. <laughs> Um, yeah, so. Longer video today, but, um, well worth the effort, in my opinion. There's a lot of stuff in this video. Here's the stream schedule. No guarantee of keeping anything. Um, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, 1 p.m. on Saturday. This Saturday, we'll be watching Mr. Caption's video. If you want to watch Mr. Caption's video ahead of the stream, uh, I encourage you all to check out these videos before they pop up. But the Mr. Caption one, uh, if you have trouble finding it, it's on my second channel in 720p. Um, I would recommend you watch a good Skyrim video if we have seen if we had seen more than like two. Uh, which is like G-Man and Noah Caldwell.
Guys are brutal, by the way. This is like 1,000 hours of work we're just shitting on. I mean, that's sort of the thing, though, is that we haven't really seen a whole lot of good stuff. Like, and I'm basing this on, like, the Oblivion videos, where there was good stuff. Like, Never Knows Best made a good Oblivion video. I liked Will's Oblivion video, and we talked a lot about that. Um, I didn't care for GameSpot. I liked Alleyway Jax. I didn't mind LGR. I did not like G-Man's Oblivion video. Is there anybody else we watched? Oh, yeah. They're sort of, like, mixed in. Like, I like Salt... Not Salt. I like Strategy's video. We skipped Salt Factory's video. Um, anything else? I think that was all the videos we watched. We didn't watch very many Oblivion videos because... There just wasn't as many. What What is the worst video in general? Do you mean Skyrim videos or any videos? Because that's a whole other thing. You said you're saving the main quest for after you do the side content. You'll be missing out on some important shouts and it'll affect your gameplay experience. What are you talking about? I'll be missing out on shouts. I would be missing out on shouts if I did the main quest first. And anyways, there's three playthroughs. So I'm hoping that in the average of the three playthroughs is uh, fairly reflective. So, yeah, as we're going to wind things down here, we have the Discord server. On the Discord server, I add everybody, and I also add the announcements role. I guess I have to do both. Um, that should get you pretty accurate... Uh, that should get you pretty accurate times for when we stream if you can't follow, you know, a schedule. Um, you can follow me on Twitter. You can use the command that's on screen now on the Discord server, and you get a yellow name. If you don't have a role already. I wonder how many content creators watch the stream. I know a couple of the content creators who are in this stream. And we've had some uh, bigger names pop in every now and then. It, the, the, the thing with these streams is that... There are some people that might watch them. But would never publicly associate with them. Because what I'm doing is fairly controversial. Which is... Um, generally speaking, uh, content creators aren't supposed to like criticize other content creators so anytime it happens it's seen as like really taboo um but i mean it's just sort of the thing is like look i'm shining my light on a lot of people and i don't shine i don't shine you know the the warm kind of daylight glow i shine fucking like full bright office lights that expose kind of how ugly everything is um you might dislike that but I will go back to this, and we'll just, um... Actually, I'll hide the YouTube, because that makes it bigger. Okay. Mm-hmm. 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 Getting a lot out of this. Getting a real lot out of this. Yeah, it's still, it's still going. Yeah. So let me just copy this. Word counter. Here's the thing, though. Um, so we're at 4,600 words in the notes. So here's the thing. I didn't make these videos to, like, criticize these people. I'm not going out of my way. I, like, I, I'm not one of these people that's like, I'm going to epic own these people because they're wrong. Or I'm going to epic own these people because they're bad and I want them to make better content. Um, I am consuming this content like a black hole. And then I'm going to write my Skyrim video. 
and uh, it's going to be fairly comprehensive. So there's a lot that I'd like to know. Are you satisfied with the notes of the videos? Um, it was hard at first. Uh, we finally have found like good sources, good videos. We're really starting to get things, especially like with the conversations that we have. Um, there's like a lot of perspectives that are shared, um, ideas that are had. I think that overall these streams will be really constructive to the video because they were last time and now it's bigger and we have more to work with. So I feel like either it's going to be way more constructive or it's going to destroy the video. But, you know, it, it won't be worth it until, like, somebody makes an exposed video on me for, like, harassing small creators. Oh, wait, I think everybody except Private Sessions was bigger than me. So, how do we think, what do we think of today's stream? I'll ask that before we wind things down here. Have you seen Elder either Dynamic Skyrim AI videos? Yes. Okay. I need to remember actually before while we're talking about the stream. Um the videos that people want me to watch. Uh Lazar's Skyrim. Uh Kretosis Skyrim, LGR Skyrim, either Dynamics Skyrim, Sorcerer Dave Skyrim. Uh Skyrim is dumbing down, just calling it that because I don't recall what the name of the video is. Protein pill, that's one that people ask a lot. All right, Lazarus, why Sky is it why Skyrim will never die? Yeah, it is. Okay, so lasers or Lazarus? Weird. Okay, uh, that one's down. Kretosis, Skyrim. The issue with that one is that someone needs to tell me sometimes he's in here if he's in here he can he can tell me but someone needs to tell me what's the deal with how that video is coming out is there going to be more soon or are we looking at like a long-term kind of project thing i'd like to know like um how much of how much more of that might be out before we're done streaming we got kretosis we got lgr Either Dynamics. I'm just going to grab his channel because he's got like a bunch of videos. This increases the chance that I'll remember everything because I think I need to have a big night where I just rework this rework the schedule so it's more kind of accurate. All right. Sorcerer Dave. Actually, the Skyrim's dumbing down is the easier easier one first, I would think. All right, Skyrim, the dumbing down. That's like a whole drama that happened. So then we have Skyrim is not dumbing down. Elder Scrolls is not dumbing down. And then... Um, Bro Team Pill. Skyrim. Alright, that should be most everybody. We did Razor Fist. I kind of vetoed that one. I don't think that it's gonna be you're gonna uh, the the people who want the razor fist video you guys are gonna have to actually kind of give me a timestamp. and you might be thinking well it's a very short video yes but i don't want i don't really don't want to watch it uh, not an offense to the guy it's more that like 
It's vintage 2011 and videos on YouTube have come a long way in terms of like um, presentation. People always recommend, okay, here's the thing. Uh, Zarek, Fudge Muppet, Camel Works, all these Elder Scrolls channels. I don't know if Zarek's an Elder Scrolls channel, but all these channels that have lots of videos on Elder Scrolls, that's another one where you guys have to, um, you guys have to guide me through those because I'm not going to watch 27 Fudge Muppet videos. The Cantina, why Skyrim is not an RPG. I'll look it up. It's a short one, so... I'll, I'll take it into consideration. Do I like Attack on Titan? I liked Attack on Titan. I can't wait until the anime comes out and uh, I get to make a video explaining why the ending of Attack on Titan went to shit. I, I look forward to it. It'll be fun. Fudge Muppet videos are just the thing you did with the end earlier. Well, we'll see, that's the thing. I don't need that. I need... With the Fudge Muppet videos, you either have to be able to point to a specific one, or you need to be able to point to a timestamp of something that you want me to check out. Um, and I know that's kind of unfair, because everybody else just gets to say a name and I'll find the video, but that's just kind of how it's going to work with these Elder Scrolls channels. We talked a lot about Attack on Titan in the Oblivion streams. Yeah, that was when it was that was when the uh, manga was ending and good lord what it what it what a terrible way to go. Do you think they'll keep it the same? Yes, I think the fuck I forget his name. Uh the guy that wrote Attack on Titan um has a lot of like creative control over where the anime goes. I don't think he'll let them change things cuz he seemed pretty salty about the reception. So has the server fallen apart? All right. Those weird shippers were in the fandom. Uh, yes. So, uh, I'm gonna kind of end things here. Uh, last call to get your, um, to get your rank. I'm gonna shut that down in a minute. Um, it's something that's for live people, or I guess people who are on the Discord, but we, we don't talk about that. Uh, I'll be back tomorrow, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Not sure what I'm watching. I'm watching the Skyrim part of the Elder Scrolls Promise video. And the, like, stories of old video. Don't know how much of that I'm going to watch. That's kind of a mystery. What rank? The... The, the one up there. That's for the Discord. So, uh, peace out, cowboys. All right. And that's why the final verdict for the Elder Scrolls.